Section Zero of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rositer Johnson, and John Rudd. An Outline Narrative. Tracing briefly the causes, connections, and consequences of the great events, from the fall of Rome to the empire of Charlemagne. Charles F. Horn. Our modern civilization is built up on three great cornerstones, three inestimably valuable heritages from the past. The Greco-Roman civilization gave us our arts and our philosophies, the basis of intellectual power. The Hebrews bequeathed to us the religious idea, which has saved man from despair, has been the potent stimulus to 2,000 years of endurance and hope. The Teutons gave us a healthy, sturdy, uncontaminated physique, honest bodies, and clean minds, the lack of which had made further progress impossible to the ancient world. The last is what made necessary the barbarian overthrow of Rome if the world was still to advance. The slowly progressing knowledge of the arts and handicrafts which we have seen passed down from Egypt to Babylonia, to Persia, Greece, and Rome, had not been acquired without heavy loss. The system of slavery which allowed the few to think, while the many were constrained to toil as beasts, had eaten like a canker into the heart of society. The Roman world was repeating the oft-told tale of the past and sinking into the lifeless formalism of which Egypt was the type. Man had become wise, but worthless. As though on purpose, to prove to future generations how utterly worthless, the Roman civilization was allowed to continue uninterrupted in one unneeded corner of its former domains. For over a thousand years, the successors of Theodosius and of Constantine held unbroken sway in the capital which the latter had founded. They only succeeded in emphasizing how futile their culture had become. The entire ten centuries that followed the overthrow of Rome had long been spoken of as the Dark Ages. But considering how infinitely darker those same ages must have become without the intervention of the Teutons, present criticism begins to protest against the term. All that was lost with the ancient world was something of intellectual keenness, something of artistic culture, quickly regained when man was once more ripe for them. What the Teutons had to offer of infinitely greater worth what they had developed in their cold northern forests was their sense of liberty and equality, their love of honesty, their respect for womankind. It is not too much to say that without these, any higher progress was and always will be impossible. In short, the Roman and Grecian races had become impotent and decrepit. The high density of man lay not with them but with the younger race, for whom all earlier civilizations had but prepared the way. Who were these Teutons? Rome knew them only vaguely as wild tribes dwelling in the gloom of the great forest wilderness. In reality, they were but the vanguard of vast races of human beings who through ages had been slowly populating all Eastern Europe and Northern Asia. Beyond the Teutons were other Aryans, the Slavs. Beyond these were vague, non-Aryan races like the Huns, content to direct their careers of slaughter against one another, and only occasionally, for a moment, flaring with red fire beacons of ruin along the edge of the Aryan world. Some, at least, of the Teutonic tribes had grown partly civilized. The Germans along the Rhine and the Goths along the Danube had been from the time of Augustus in more or less close contact with Rome. Germanicus had once subdued almost the whole of Germany. Later emperors had held temporarily the broad province of Dacia beyond the Danube. 
the barbarians were eagerly enlisted in the Roman army. During the closing centuries of decadence, they became its main support. They rose to high commands. There were even barbarian emperors at last. The intermingling of the two worlds thus became extensive, and the Teutons learned much of Rome. The Goths, whom Theodosius permitted to settle within its dominions, were already partly Christian. The Period of Invasion It was these same Goths who became the immediate cause of Rome's downfall. Theodosius had kept them in restraint. His feeble sons scarce even attempted it. The intruders found a famous leader in Alaric, and after plundering most of the Grecian peninsula, they ravaged Italy, ending in 410 with the sack of Rome itself. This seems to us perhaps a greater event than it did to its own generation. The emperor of the West, the degenerate son of Theodosius, was not within the city when it fell. And the story is told that on hearing the news, he expressed relief because he had, at first, understood that the evil tidings refer to the death of a favorite hen named Rome. The tale emphasizes the disgrace of the famous capital. It had sunk to be but one city among many. Alaric's Goths had been nominally an army belonging to the Emperor of the East. Their invasion was regarded as only one more civil war. Besides, the Roman world might yet have proved itself big enough to assimilate and engulf the entire mass of this already half-civilized people. Its name was still a spell on them. Atolf, the successor of Alaric, was proud to accept a Roman title and become a defender of the empire. He marched his followers into Gaul under a commission to chastise the barbarians who were desolating it. These later corners were the instruments of that more overwhelming destruction for which the Goths had but prepared the way. To resist Alaric, the Roman legions had been withdrawn from all the western frontiers, and thus more distant and far more savage tribes of the Teutons beheld the glittering empire unprotected, its pathways most alluringly left open. They began streaming across the undefended Rhine and Danube. Their bands were often small and feeble, such as earlier emperors would have turned back with ease, but now all this fascinating world of wealth, so dimly known and doubtless fiercely coveted, lay helpless, open to their plundering. The Vandals ravaged Gaul and Spain, and being defeated by the Goths, passed on into Africa. The Saxon and Angles penetrated England and fought there for centuries against the desperate Britons, whom the Roman legions had perforce abandoned to their fate. The Franks and Burgundians plundered Gaul. Fortunately, the invading tribes were on the whole a kindly race. When they joyously whirled their huge battle axes against iron helmets, smashing down through bone and brain beneath, their delight was not in the scream of the unlucky wretch within, but in their own vigorous sweep of muscle, the conscious power of the blow. Fierce they were, but not coldly cruel like the ancients. The conditions of the lower classes certainly became no worse for their invasion, but probably improved. Much the newcomers undoubtedly destroyed in pure wantonness, but there was much more that they admired, half understood, and sought to save. Beyond them, however, came a conqueror of far more terrible mood. We have seen that when the Goths first entered Roman territory, they were driven on by a vast migration of the Asiatic Huns. These wild and hideous tribes then spent half a century roaming through Central Europe, ere they were gathered into one huge body by their great chief Attila, and in their turn approached the shattered region of the Mediterranean. Their invasion, if we are to trust the tales of their enemies, from whom alone we know of them, was incalculably more destructive than all those of the Teutons combined. The Huns delighted in suffering. They slew for the sake of slaughter. Where they passed, they left naught but an empty desert burned and blackened and devoid of life.
Crossing the Danube, they ravaged the Roman Empire of the East almost without opposition. Only the impregnable walls of Constantinople resisted the destruction. A few years later, the savage horde appeared upon the Rhine, and an enormous number penetrated Gaul. No people had yet understood them. None had even checked their career. The white races seemed helpless against this yellow peril, this scourge of God, as Attila was called. Goths and Romans, and all the varied tribes which were ranging in perturbed world through unhappy Gaul, laid aside their lesser enmities and met in common cause against the terrible invader. The Battle of Shalon, 451, was the most tremendous struggle in which Turanian was ever matched against Aryan. The one huge bid of the stagnant, unprogressive races for Earth's mastery. Old chronicles rise into poetry at thought of that immeasurable battle. They figure the slain by hundred thousands. They describe the souls of the dead as rising above the bodies and continuing their furious struggle in the air. Attila was checked and drew back. Defeated, we can scarce call him, for only a year or so later we find him ravaging Italy. Fugitives fleeing before him to the marshes lay the first stones of Venice. Leo, the great pope, pleads with him for Rome. His forces, however, are obviously weaker than they were. He retreats. And after his death, his irresponsible followers disappear forever in the wilderness. The Period of Settlement Toward the close of this tumultuous 5th century, the various Teutonic tribes show distinct tendencies toward settling down and forming kingdoms amid the various lands they have overrun. The Vandals built a state in Africa, and from the old site of Carthage, send their ships to the second sack of Rome. The Visigoths form a Spanish kingdom, which lasts over 200 years. The Ostrogoths construct an empire in Italy from 493 to 554, and under the wise rule of the chieftain Theodoric, Men joyfully proclaim that peace and happiness and prosperity have returned to Earth. Most important of all, in its bearing upon later history, the Franks under Clovis begin the building of France. Encouraged by these milder days, the Roman emperors of Constantinople attempt to reclaim their old domain. The reign of Justinian begins, 527 to 565 and his great general Belisarius temporarily wins back for him both Africa and Italy. This was a comparatively unimportant detail, a mere momentary reversal of the historic tide. Justinian did for the future a far more noted service. If there was one subject which Roman officials had learned thoroughly through their many generations of rule, it was the set of principles by which judges must be guided in their endeavor to do justice. Long practical experience of administration made the Romans the great lawgivers of antiquity. And now Justinian set his lawyers to work to gather into a single code or digest all the scattered and elaborate rules and decisions which had place in their gigantic system. It is this code of Justinian, which handed down through the ages, stands as the basis of much of our law today. It shapes our social world. It governs the fundamental relations between man and man. There are not wanting those who believe its principles are wrong. Whoever that man's true attitude toward his fellows should be, wholly different from its present artificial pose. But whether for better or for worse, we live today by Roman law. This law, the Teutons were slowly absorbing they accepted the general structure of the world into which they had thrust themselves. They continued its style of building and many of its rougher arts. They even adopted its language, though in such confused and awkward fashion that Italy, France, and Spain grew each to have a dialect of its own. And most important of all, they accepted the religion, the Christian religion of Rome. Missionaries venture forth again, Augustine preaches in England. Boniface penetrates the German wilds. 
not be supposed that the moment the Teuton accepted baptism, he became filled with a pure Christian spirit of meekness and of love. On the contrary, he probably remained much the same drunken, roistering heathen as before. But he was brought in contact with noble examples in the lives of some of the Christian bishops around him. Great truths began to touch his noble nature. He was impressed, softened, he began to think and feel. Given a couple of centuries of this, we really begin to see some very encouraging results. We realize that for once we are being allowed to study a civilization in its earlier stages, to be present almost at its birth, to watch the methods of the master builder in the making of a race. Gazing at similar developments in the days of Egypt and Babylon, we guessed vaguely that they must have been of slowest growth. Here at last one takes place under our eyes, and it does not need so many ages after all. There is no study more fascinating than to trace the slow changes stamping themselves ineradicably upon the Teutonic mind and soul during these misty, far-off centuries of turmoil. On the whole, of course, the 6th, 7th, and even the 8th centuries form a period of strife. The Teutons had spent too many ages warring against one another in petty strife to abandon the pleasure in a single generation. Men fought because they liked fighting, much as they play football today. Then, too, there came another great outburst of semi-religious enthusiasm. Muhammad started the Arabs on their remarkable career of conquest. The Mohammedan Outburst Muhammad himself died, 632, before he had fully established his influence even over Arabia. His successors had practically to reconquer it. Yet within five years of his death, the Arabs had mastered Syria. They spread like some sudden, unexpected, immeasurable whirlwind. Ancient Persia went down before them. By 640, they had trampled Egypt underfoot and destroyed the celebrated Alexandrian library. They swept all over Africa, completely obliterating every trace of Vandal or of Roman. Their dominion reached further east than that of Alexander. They wrested most of its Asiatic possessions from the pretentious empire at Constantinople and reduced that exhausted state to a condition of weakness from which it never arose. Then, passing on through their African possessions, they entered Spain and overthrew the kingdom of the Visigoths. It was a storm whose end no man could measure, whose coming none could have foreseen. And then, just a century after Muhammad's death, the Arabs, pressing on through Spain, encountered the Franks on the plains of France. A thousand years had passed since Semitic Carthage had fallen before Arian Rome. Now, once again, the Semites, far more dangerous because in the full tide of their religious frenzy of their race, threatened to engulf the Aryan world. They were repulsed by the still sturdy Franks under their great leader, Charles Martel, at Tours. The Battle of Tours was only less monumentous to the human race than that of Chalons. What the Arab domination of Europe would have meant we can partly guess by looking at the lax and lawless states of northern Africa today. These fair lands, under both Roman and Vandal, had long been sharing the lot of Aryan Europe. They seemed destined to follow in its growth and fortune. But the Arab conquest restored them to Semitism, made Asia the seat from which they were to have their training, attached them to the chariot of sloth instead of that of effort what they are today, all Europe might have been. Yet with the picture of these 5th and 6th and 7th centuries of battle full before us, we are not tempted to glory over much, even in such victories as Tours and Shalons. We see war for what it has ever been, the curse of man, the hugest hindrance to our civilization. While men fight, they have small time for thought, or art, or any soft or kindly sentiment. The survivors may, with good luck, develop into a stronger breed. They are, inevitably, more brutal. We thus begin to recognize just how necessary for human progress was the work 
Rome had been engaged in. By holding the world at peace, she had given humankind at least the opportunity to grow. The moment her restraining hand was shaken off, war sprang up everywhere. Not only do we find the inheritors of her territory fighting amongst themselves, they are exposed to the savagery of Attila, the fury of the Arabs. New bands of more distant Teutons come, ever pushing in amid their half-settled brethren, overthrowing them in turn. The Lombards capture northern Italy, only Venice remaining safe amid her marshes. The East Franks, that is, the semi-barbarians still remaining in the wilderness, master the more cultured West Franks, who hold Gaul. No sooner does civilization start up than it is trodden on. The Empire of Charlemagne. At length, there arose among the Franks a series of stalwart rulers, keen-eyed, penetrating somewhat, at least, into the meaning of their world, determined to have peace if they must fight for it. Charles Martel was one of these. Then came his son, Pepin, who held out his hand to the Bishop of Rome, acknowledged that their vast civilizing influence saved them from the Lombards, and joined church and state once more in harmony. After Pepin came his son Charlemagne, whose reign marks an epic of the world. The peace his fathers had striven for, he won at last, though only as they had done by constant fighting. He attacked the Arabs and reduced them to permanent feebleness in Spain. He turned backward the Teutonic movement, marching his Franks into the German forests and in campaign after campaign, defeating the wild tribes that still remained there. The strongest of them, the Saxons, accepted and enforced Christianity. Even the vague races beyond the German borders were so harried, so weakened, that they ceased to be a serious menace. Charlemagne had thus, in very truth, created a new empire. He had established at least one central spot, so hedged round by border dependencies that no later wave of barbarians ever quite succeeded in submerging it. The bones of the great emperor in their cathedral sepulchre at Aix have never been disturbed by an unfriendly hand. Paris submitted to no new conquest until over a thousand years later, when the 19th century had stolen the barbarity from war. It was no more than a just acknowledgement of Charlemagne's work when, on Christmas Day of the year 800, as he rose from kneeling at the cathedral altar in Rome, he was crowned by the Pope, whom he had defended, and hailed by an enthusiastic people as lord of a recreated Holy Roman Empire. In England also, the centuries of warfare among the Britons and the various antagonistic Teutonic tribes seemed drawing to an end. Egbert established the Heptarchy, that is, became overlord of all the lesser kings. Truly, for a moment, civilization seemed re-established. The arts returned to prominence. England could send so noteworthy a scholar as Alcuin to the aid of the great emperor. Charlemagne encouraged learning. Alcuin established schools. Once more, men sowed and reaped in security. The Roman peace seemed come again. End of section zero. Section one of The Great Events by Famous Historians, volume four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Great Events by Famous Historians, volume four. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Visigoths Pillage Rome, A.D. 410, by Edward Gibbon, Part 1. Of the two great historical divisions of the Gothic race, the Visigoths, or West Goths, were admitted into the Roman Empire in A.D. 376, when they sought protection from the pursuing Huns and were transported across the Danube to the Moesian shore. The story of their gradual progress in civilization and growth in military power 
which at last enabled them to descend with overwhelming force upon Rome itself, forms one of the romances of history. From their first reception into Lower Moesia, the Visigoths were subjected to the most contemptuous and oppressive treatment by the Romans who had admitted them into their domains. At last, the outraged colonists were provoked to revolt, and a stubborn war ensued, which was ended at Adrianople, August 9th, A.D. 378, with the defeat of the Emperor Valens and the destruction of his army, two-thirds of his soldiers perishing with Valens himself, whose body was never found. In 382, a treaty was made, which restored peace to the Eastern Empire, the Visigoths nominally owning the sovereignty of Rome, but living in virtual independence. They continued to increase in numbers and in power, and in A.D. 395, under Alaric, their king, they invaded Greece, but were compelled by Stilicho in 397 to retire into Epirus. Stilicho was the commander-in-chief of the Roman army and the guardian of the young emperor Honorius. Alaric soon afterward became commander-in-chief of the Roman forces in eastern Illyricum and held that office for four years. During that time, he remained quiet, arming and drilling his followers and waiting for the opportunity to make a bold stroke for a wider and more secure dominion. In the autumn of AD 400, while Stilicho was campaigning in Gaul, Alaric made his first invasion of Italy, and for more than a year he ranged at will over the northern part of the peninsula. Rome was made ready for defense, and Honorius, the weak emperor of the Western Empire, prepared for flight into Gaul. But on March 19th of the year 402, Stilicho surprised the camp of Alaric near Palencia, while most of his followers were at worship, and after a desperate battle they were beaten. Alaric made a safe retreat, and soon afterward crossed the Po, intending to march against Rome, but desertions from his ranks caused him to abandon that purpose. In 403 he was overtaken, and again defeated by Stilicho at Verona, Alaric himself barely escaping capture. Stilicho, however, permitted him, some historians say bribed him, to withdraw to Illyricum, and he was made prefect of Western Illyricum by Honorius. Such is the prelude, followed in history by the amazing exploits of Alaric's second invasion of Italy. His troops having revolted at Pavia, Stilicho fled to Ravenna, where the ungrateful emperor had him put to death August 23, 408. In October of that year, Alaric crossed the Alps, advancing without resistance until he reached Ravenna. After threatening Ravenna, he marched upon Rome and began the preparations that ended in the sack of the city. The incapacity of a weak and distracted government may often assume the appearance and produce the effects of a treasonable correspondence with the public enemy. If Alaric himself had been introduced into the Council of Ravenna, he would probably have advised the same measures which were actually pursued by the ministers of Honorius. The king of the Goths would have conspired, perhaps with some reluctance, to destroy the formidable adversary by whose arms, in Italy as well as in Greece, he had been twice overthrown. Their active and interested hatred laboriously accomplished the disgrace and ruin of the great Stilicho. The valor of Sarus, his fame in arms, and his personal or hereditary influence over the confederate barbarians could recommend him only to the friends of their country, who despised or detested the worthless characters of Turpilio, Veranus, and Vigilantius. By the pressing instances of the new favorites, these generals, unworthy as they had shown themselves of the names of soldiers, were promoted to the command of the cavalry, of the infantry, and of the domestic troops. The Gothic prince would have subscribed with pleasure the edict which the fanaticism of Olympius dictated to the simple and devout emperor. Honorius excluded all persons who were adverse to the Catholic Church from holding any office in the state, obstinately rejected the service of all those who dissented from his religion, and rashly disqualified many of his bravest and most skillful officers who adhered to the pagan worship or who had imbibed the opinions of Arianism. These measures, so advantageous to an enemy, Alaric would have approved, and might perhaps have suggested. But it may seem doubtful whether the barbarian would have promoted his interest at the expense of the inhuman and absurd cruelty which was perpetrated by the direction, or at least with the connivance, of the imperial ministers. The foreign auxiliaries who had been attached to the person of Stilicho lamented his death, 
but the desire of revenge was checked by a natural apprehension for the safety of their wives and children, who were detained as hostages in the strong cities of Italy, where they had likewise deposited their most valuable effects. At the same hour, and as if by a common signal, the cities of Italy were polluted by the same horrid scenes of universal massacre and pillage, which involved in promiscuous destruction the families and fortunes of the barbarians. Exasperated by such an injury, which might have awakened the tamest and most servile spirit, they cast a look of indignation and hope toward the camp of Alaric, and unanimously swore to pursue, with just and implacable war, the perfidious nation that had so basely violated the laws of hospitality. By the imprudent conduct of the ministers of Honorius, the Republic lost the assistance and deserved the enmity of 30,000 of her bravest soldiers. And the weight of that formidable army, which alone might have determined the event of the war, was transferred from the scale of the Romans into that of the Goths. In the arts of negotiation, as well as in those of war, the Gothic king maintained his superior ascendant over an enemy, whose seeming changes proceeded from the total want of counsel and design. From his camp, on the confines of Italy, Alaric attentively observed the revolutions of the palace, watched the progress of faction and discontent, disguised the hostile aspect of a barbarian invader, and assumed the more popular appearance of the friend and ally of the great Stilicho, to whose virtues, when they were no longer formidable, he could pay a just tribute of sincere praise and regret. The pressing invitation of the malcontents, who urged the king of the Goths to invade Italy, was enforced by a lively sense of his personal injuries, and he might speciously complain that the imperial ministers still delayed and eluded the payment of the 4,000 pounds of gold which had been granted by the Roman Senate, either to reward his services or to appease his fury. His decent firmness was supported by an artful moderation, which contributed to the success of his designs. He required a fair and reasonable satisfaction, but he gave the strongest assurances that as soon as he had obtained it, he would immediately retire. He refused to trust the faith of the Romans, unless Aetius and Jason, the sons of two great officers of state, were sent as hostages to his camp, but he offered to deliver in exchange several of the noblest youths of the Gothic nation. The modesty of Alaric was interpreted by the ministers of Ravenna as a sure evidence of his weakness and fear. They disdained either to negotiate a treaty or to assemble an army, and with a rash confidence, derived only from their ignorance of the extreme danger, irretrievably wasted the decisive moments of peace and war while they expected in sullen silence that the barbarians should evacuate the confines of Italy, Alaric, with bold and rapid marches, passed the Alps and the Po, hastily pillaged the cities of Aquilia, Altinum, Concordia, and Cremona, which yielded to his arms, increased his forces by the accession of 30,000 auxiliaries, and, without meeting a single enemy in the field, advanced as far as the edges of the morass which protected the impregnable residence of the Emperor of the West. Instead of attempting the hopeless siege of Ravenna, the prudent leader of the Goths proceeded to Ramini, stretched his ravages along the seacoast of the Adriatic, and meditated the conquest of the ancient mistress of the world. An Italian hermit, whose zeal and sanctity were respected by the barbarians themselves, encountered the victorious monarch and boldly denounced the indignation of heaven against the oppressors of the earth. But the saint himself was confounded by the solemn asseveration of Alaric, that he felt a secret and preternatural impulse, which directed and even compelled his march to the gates of Rome. He felt that his genius and his fortune were equal to the most arduous enterprises, and the enthusiasm which he communicated to the Goths insensibly removed the popular, an almost superstitious reverence of the nations for the majesty of the Roman name. His troops, animated by the hopes of spoil, followed the course of the Flaminian Way, occupied the unguarded passes of the Apennine, descended into the rich plains of Umbria, and, as they lay encamped on the banks of the Clitumnus, might wantonly slaughter and devour the milk-white oxen, which had been so long reserved for the use of Roman triumphs. A lofty situation, and a seasonable tempest of thunder and lightning, preserved the little city of Narni. But the king of the Goths, despising the ignoble prey, still advanced with unabated vigor, 
and after he had passed through the stately arches, adorned with the spoils of barbaric victories, he pitched his camp under the walls of Rome. By a skillful disposition of his numerous forces, who impatiently watched the moment of an assault, Alaric encompassed the walls, commanded the twelve principal gates, intercepted all communication with the adjacent country, and vigilantly guarded the navigation of the Tiber, from which the Romans derived the surest and most plentiful supply of provisions. The first emotions of the nobles and of the people were those of surprise and indignation that a vile barbarian should dare to insult the capital of the world. But their arrogance was soon humbled by misfortune, and their unmanly rage, instead of being directed against an enemy in arms, was meanly exercised on a defenseless and innocent victim. Perhaps in the person of Serena, the Romans might have respected the niece of Theodosius, the aunt, nay, even the adoptive mother of the reigning emperor. But they abhorred the widow of Stilicho, and they listened with credulous passion to the tale of calumny, which accused her of maintaining a secret and criminal correspondence with the Gothic invader. Actuated or overawed by the same popular frenzy, the Senate, without requiring any evidence of her guilt, pronounced the sentence of her death. Serena was ignominiously strangled, and the infatuated multitude were astonished to find that this cruel act of injustice did not immediately produce the retreat of the barbarians and the deliverance of the city. That unfortunate city gradually experienced the distress of scarcity, and at length the horrid calamities of famine. The daily allowance of three pounds of bread was reduced to one half, to one third, to nothing and the price of corn still continued to rise in a rapid and extravagant proportion. The poorer citizens, who were unable to purchase the necessaries of life, solicited the precarious charity of the rich, and for a while the public misery was alleviated by the humanity of Laeta, the widow of the Emperor Gratian, who had fixed her residence at Rome and consecrated to the use of the indigent the princely revenue which she annually received from the grateful successors of her husband. But these private and temporary donatives were insufficient to appease the hunger of a numerous people, and the progress of famine invaded the marble palaces of the senators themselves. The persons of both sexes who had been educated in the enjoyment of ease and luxury discovered how little is requisite to supply the demands of nature, and lavished their unavailing treasures of gold and silver to obtain the coarse and scanty sustenance which they would formerly have rejected with disdain. The food the most repugnant to sense or imagination, the aliments the most unwholesome and pernicious to the constitution, were eagerly devoured and fiercely disputed by the rage of hunger. A dark suspicion was entertained that some desperate wretches fed on the bodies of their fellow creatures, whom they had secretly murdered, and even mothers. Such was the horrid conflict of the two most powerful instincts implanted by nature in the human breast even mothers are said to have tasted the flesh of their slaughtered infants. Many thousands of the inhabitants of Rome expired in their houses or in the streets for want of sustenance, and as the public sepulchres without the walls were in the power of the enemy, the stench which arose from so many putrid and unburied carcasses infected the air, and the miseries of famine were succeeded and aggravated by the contagion of a pestilential disease. The assurances of speedy and effectual relief, which were repeatedly transmitted from the court of Ravenna, supported for some time the fainting resolution of the Romans, till at length the despair of any human aid tempted them to accept the offers of a preternatural deliverance. Pompeianus, prefect of the city, had been persuaded, by the art or fanaticism of some Tuscan diviners, that, by the mysterious force of spells and sacrifices, they could extract the lightning from the clouds and point those celestial fires against the camp of the barbarians. The important secret was communicated to Innocent, the Bishop of Rome, and the successor of St. Peter is accused, perhaps with foundation, of preferring the safety of the Republic to the rigid severity of the Christian worship. But when the question was agitated in the Senate, when it was proposed as an essential condition that those sacrifices should be performed in the capital, by the authority and in the presence of the magistrates, the majority of that respectable assembly, apprehensive either of the divine or of the imperial displeasure, refused to join in an act which appeared almost equivalent to the public restoration of paganism. 
The last resource of the Romans was in the clemency, or at least in the moderation, of the king of the Goths. The Senate, who in this emergency assumed the supreme powers of government, appointed two ambassadors to negotiate with the enemy. This important trust was delegated to Basilius, a senator of Spanish extraction, and already conspicuous in the administration of provinces, and to John, the first tribune of the notaries, who was peculiarly qualified by his dexterity in business, as well as by his former intimacy with the Gothic prince. When they were introduced into his presence, they declared, perhaps in a more lofty style than became their abject condition, that the Romans were resolved to maintain their dignity, either in peace or war, and that if Alaric refused them a fair and honorable capitulation, he might sound his trumpets and prepare to give battle to an innumerable people, exercised in arms and animated by despair. The thicker the hay, the easier it is mowed, was the concise reply of the barbarian, and this rustic metaphor was accompanied by a loud and insulting laugh, expressive of his contempt for the menaces of an unwarlike populace, enervated by luxury before they were emaciated by famine. He then condescended to fix the ransom, which he would accept as the price of his retreat from the walls of Rome. All the gold and silver in the city, whether it were the property of the state or of individuals, all the rich and precious movables, and all the slaves who could prove their title to the name of barbarians. The ministers of the Senate presumed to ask, in a modest and suppliant tone, If such, O king, are your demands, what do you intend to leave us? Your lives, replied the haughty conqueror. They trembled and retired. Yet, before they retired, a short suspension of arms was granted, which allowed some time for a more temperate negotiation. The stern features of Alaric were insensibly relaxed. He abated much of the rigor of his terms, and at length consented to raise the siege on the immediate payment of 5,000 pounds of gold, of 30,000 pounds of silver, of 4,000 robes of silk, of 3,000 pieces of fine scarlet cloth, and of 3,000 pounds weight of pepper. But the public treasury was exhausted. The annual rents of the great estates in Italy and the provinces were intercepted by the calamities of war. The gold and gems had been exchanged during the famine for the vilest sustenance. The hordes of secret wealth were still concealed by the obstinacy of avarice, and some remains of consecrated spoils afforded the only resource that could avert the impending ruin of the city. As soon as the Romans had satisfied the rapacious demands of Alaric, they were restored in some measure to the enjoyment of peace and plenty. Several of the gates were cautiously opened. The importation of provisions from the river and the adjacent country was no longer obstructed by the Goths. The citizens resorted in crowds to the free market, which was held during three days in the suburbs. And while the merchants who undertook this gainful trade made a considerable profit, the future subsistence of the city was secured by the ample magazines which were deposited in the public and private granaries. A more regular discipline than could have been expected was maintained in the camp of Alaric, and the wise barbarian justified his regard for the faith of treaties by the just severity with which he chastised a party of licentious Goths who had insulted some Roman citizens on the road to Ostia. His army, enriched by the contributions of the capital, slowly advanced into the fair and fruitful province of Tuscany, where he proposed to establish his winter quarters, and the Gothic standard became the refuge of 40,000 barbarian slaves who had broken their chains, and aspired, under the command of their great deliverer, to revenge the injuries and the disgrace of their cruel servitude. About the same time, he received a more honorable reinforcement of Goths and Huns, whom Adolphus, the brother of his wife, had conducted, at his pressing invitation, from the banks of the Danube to those of the Tiber, and who had cut their way, with some difficulty and loss, through the superior numbers of the imperial troops. A victorious leader, who united the daring spirit of a barbarian with the art and discipline of a Roman general, was at the head of a hundred thousand fighting men, and Italy pronounced, with terror and respect, the formidable name of Alaric. At the distance of 14 centuries, we may be satisfied with relating the military exploits of the conquerors of Rome without presuming to investigate the motives of their political conduct. In the midst of his apparent prosperity, Alaric was conscious, perhaps, of some secret weakness, some internal defect, 
or perhaps the moderation which he displayed was intended only to deceive and disarm the easy credulity of the ministers of Honorius. The king of the Goths repeatedly declared that it was his desire to be considered as the friend of peace and of the Romans. Three senators, at his earnest request, were sent ambassadors to the court of Ravenna to solicit the exchange of hostages and the conclusion of the treaty and the proposals, which he more clearly expressed during the course of the negotiations, could only inspire a doubt of his sincerity as they might seem inadequate to the state of his fortune. The barbarian still aspired to the rank of Master General of the Armies of the West. He stipulated an annual subsidy of corn and money, and he chose the provinces of Dalmatia, Noricum, and Venetia for the seat of his new kingdom which would have commanded the important communication between Italy and the Danube. If these modest terms should be rejected, Alaric showed a disposition to relinquish his pecuniary demands and even to content himself with the possession of Noricum, an exhausted and impoverished country perpetually exposed to the inroads of the barbarians of Germany. But the hopes of peace were disappointed by the weak obstinacy or interested views of the minister Olympius. Without listening to the salutary remonstrances of the Senate, he dismissed their ambassadors under the conduct of a military escort, too numerous for a retinue of honor and too feeble for an army of defense. Six thousand Dalmatians, the flower of the imperial legions, were ordered to march from Ravenna to Rome through an open country that was occupied by the formidable myriads of the barbarians. These brave legionaries, encompassed and betrayed, fell a sacrifice to ministerial folly. Their general, Valens, with a hundred soldiers, escaped from the field of battle, and one of the ambassadors, who could no longer claim the protection of the law of nations, was obliged to purchase his freedom with a ransom of 30,000 pieces of gold. Yet Alaric, instead of resenting this act of impotent hostility, immediately renewed his proposals of peace, and the second embassy of the Roman Senate which derived weight and dignity from the presence of Innocent, bishop of the city, was guarded from the dangers of the road by a detachment of Gothic soldiers. Olympius might have continued to insult the just resentment of a people who loudly accused him as the author of the public calamities, but his power was undermined by the secret intrigues of the palace. The favorite eunuchs transferred the government of Honorius and the empire to Jovius, the Praetorian prefect, an unworthy servant who did not atone by the merit of personal attachment for the errors and misfortunes of his administration. The exile or escape of the guilty Olympius reserved him for more vicissitudes of fortune. He experienced the adventure of an obscure and wandering life. He again rose to power. He fell a second time into disgrace. His ears were cut off. He expired under the lash and his ignominious death afforded a grateful spectacle to the friends of Stilicho. After the removal of Olympias, whose character was deeply tainted with religious fanaticism, the pagans and heretics were delivered from the impolitic proscription which excluded them from the dignities of the state. The brave Gennarid, a soldier of barbarian origin, who still adhered to the worship of his ancestors, had been obliged to lay aside the military belt and though he was repeatedly assured by the emperor himself that laws were not made for persons of his rank or merit, he refused to accept any partial dispensation and persevered in honorable disgrace till he had extorted a general act of justice from the distress of the Roman government. The conduct of Gennarid, in the important station to which he was promoted or restored, of Master General of Dematia, Pannonia, Noricum, and Raetia, seemed to revive the discipline and spirit of the Republic. From a life of idleness and want, his troops were soon habituated to severe exercise and plentiful subsistence, and his private generosity often supplied the rewards which were denied by the avarice or poverty of the court of Ravenna. The valor of Gennarid, formidable to the adjacent barbarians, was the firmest bulwark of the Illyrian frontier and his vigilant care assisted the empire with a reinforcement of 10,000 Huns who arrived on the confines of Italy, attended by such a convoy of provisions and such a numerous train of sheep and oxen as might have been sufficient not only for the march of an army, but for the settlement of a colony. But the court and councils of Honorius still remained a scene of weakness and distraction, of corruption and anarchy. 
Instigated by the prefect Jovius, the guards rose in furious mutiny and demanded the heads of two generals and of the two principal eunuchs. The generals, under a perfidious promise of safety, were sent on shipboard and privately executed, while the favor of the eunuchs procured them a mild and secure exile at Milan and Constantinople. Eusebius the eunuch and the barbarian Alibich succeeded to the command of the bedchamber and of the guards, and the mutual jealousy of these subordinate ministers was the cause of their mutual destruction. By the insolent order of the count of the domestics, the great chamberlain was shamefully beaten to death with sticks before the eyes of the astonished emperor, and the subsequent assassination of Alibich in the midst of a public procession is the only circumstance of his life in which Honorius discovered the faintest symptom of courage or resentment. Yet, before they fell, Eusebius and Alibich had contributed their part to the ruin of the empire by opposing the conclusion of a treaty which Jovius, from a selfish and perhaps a criminal motive, had negotiated with Alaric in a personal interview under the walls of Rimini. During the absence of Jovius, the emperor was persuaded to assume a lofty tone of inflexible dignity, such as neither his situation nor his character could enable him to support and a letter, signed with the name of Honorius, was immediately dispatched to the Praetorian prefect, granting him a free permission to dispose of the public money, but sternly refusing to prostitute the military honors of Rome to the proud demands of a barbarian. This letter was imprudently communicated to Alaric himself, and the Goth, who in the whole transaction had behaved with temper and decency, expressed in the most outrageous language his lively sense of the insult so wantonly offered to his person and to his nation. The conference of Rimini was hastily interrupted, and the prefect Jovius, on his return to Ravenna, was compelled to adopt and even to encourage the fashionable opinions of the court. By his advice and example, the principal officers of the state and army were obliged to swear that without listening in any circumstances to any conditions of peace, they would still persevere in perpetual and implacable war against the enemy of the Republic. This rash engagement opposed an insuperable bar to all future negotiation. The ministers of Honorius were heard to declare that if they had only invoked the name of the deity, they would consult the public safety and trust their souls to the mercy of heaven. But they had sworn by the sacred head of the emperor himself. They had touched, in solemn ceremony, that august seat of majesty and wisdom and the violation of their oath would expose them to the temporal penalties of sacrilege and rebellion. While the emperor and his court enjoyed, with sullen pride, the security of the marshes and fortifications of Ravenna, they abandoned Rome, almost without defense, to the resentment of Alaric. Yet such was the moderation which he still preserved, or affected, that, as he moved with his army along the Flaminian Way, he successively dispatched the bishops of the towns of Italy to reiterate his offers of peace and to conjure the emperor that he would save the city and its inhabitants from hostile fire and the sword of the barbarians. These impending calamities were, however, averted, not indeed by the wisdom of Honorius, but by the prudence or humanity of the Gothic king, who employed a milder, though not less effectual, method of conquest. Instead of assaulting the capital, he successfully directed his efforts against the port of Ostia, one of the boldest and most stupendous works of Roman magnificence. The accidents to which the precarious subsistence of the city was continually exposed in a winter navigation and an open road had suggested to the genius of the first Caesar the useful design which was executed under the reign of Claudius. The artificial moles, which formed the narrow entrance, advanced far into the sea and firmly repelled the fury of the waves, while the largest vessels securely rode at anchor within three deep and capacious basins, which received the northern branch of the Tiber, about two miles from the ancient colony of Ostia. The Roman port insensibly swelled to the size of an Episcopal city, where the corn of Africa was deposited in spacious granaries for the use of the capital. As soon as Alaric was in possession of that important place, he summoned the city to surrender at discretion, and his demands were enforced by the positive declaration that a refusal or even a delay should be instantly followed by the destruction of the magazines on which the life of the Roman people depended. The clamors of that people and the terror of famine subdued the pride of the Senate, 
they listened, without reluctance, to the proposal of placing a new emperor on the throne of the unworthy Honorius, and the suffrage of the Gothic conqueror bestowed the purple on Attalus, prefect of the city. The grateful monarch immediately acknowledged his protector as master general of the armies of the West. Adolphus, within the rank of Count of the Domestics, obtained the custody of the person of Attalus, and the two hostile nations seemed to be united in the closest bands of friendship and alliance. The gates of the city were thrown open, and the new emperor of the Romans, encompassed on every side by the Gothic arms, was conducted in tumultuous procession to the palace of Augustus and Trajan. After he had distributed the civil and military dignities among his favorites and followers, Attalus convened an assembly of the Senate, before whom, in a formal and florid speech, he asserted his resolution of restoring the majesty of the Republic and of uniting to the empire the provinces of Egypt and the East, which had once acknowledged the sovereignty of Rome. Such extravagant promises inspired every reasonable citizen with a just contempt for the character of an unwarlike usurper whose elevation was the deepest and most ignominious wound which the Republic had yet sustained from the insolence of the barbarians. But the populace, with their usual levity, applauded the change of masters. The public discontent was favorable to the rival of Honorius, and the sectaries, oppressed by his persecuting edicts, expected some degree of countenance, or at least of toleration, from a prince who, in his native country of Ionia, had been educated in the pagan superstition, and who had since received the sacrament of baptism from the hands of an Arian bishop. End of section one. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section two of The Great Events by Famous Historians, volume four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Visigoths Pillage Rome, A.D. 410, by Edward Gibbon, Part 2. The first days of the reign of Attalus were fair and prosperous. An officer of confidence was sent with an inconsiderable body of troops to secure the obedience of Africa. The greatest part of Italy submitted to the terror of the Gothic powers, and though the city of Bologna made a vigorous and effectual resistance, the people of Milan, dissatisfied perhaps with the absence of Honorius, accepted with loud acclamations the choice of the Roman Senate. At the head of a formidable army, Alaric conducted his royal captive almost to the gates of Ravenna, and a solemn embassy of the principal ministers of Jovius, the Praetorian prefect, of Valens, master of the cavalry and infantry, of the quaestor Potamius, and of Julian, the first of the notaries, was introduced with martial pomp into the Gothic camp. In the name of their sovereign, they consented to acknowledge the lawful election of his competitor, and to divide the provinces of Italy and the West between the two emperors. Their proposals were rejected with disdain, and the refusal was aggravated by the insulting clemency of Attalus, who condescended to promise that if Honorius would instantly resign the purple, he should be permitted to pass the remainder of his life in the peaceful exile of some remote island. So desperate indeed did the situation of the son of Theodosius appear to those who were the best acquainted with his strength and resources, that Jovius and Valens, his minister and his general, betrayed their trust infamously deserted the sinking cause of their benefactor, and devoted their treacherous allegiance to the service of his more fortunate rival. Astonished by such examples of domestic treason, Honorius trembled at the approach of every servant, at the arrival of every messenger. He dreaded the secret enemies who might lurk in his capital, his palace, his bedchamber, and some ships lay ready in the harbor of Ravenna to transport the abdicated monarch to the dominions of his infant nephew, the Emperor of the East. But there is a providence, such at least was the opinion of the historian Procopius, that watches over innocence and folly, and the pretensions of Honorius to its peculiar care cannot reasonably be disputed. At the moment when his despair, incapable of any wise or manly resolution, meditated a shameful flight, a seasonable reinforcement of 4,000 veterans unexpectedly landed in the port of Ravenna. 
To these valiant strangers, whose fidelity had not been corrupted by the factions of the court, he committed the walls and gates of the city, and the slumbers of the emperor were no longer disturbed by the apprehension of imminent and internal danger. The favorable intelligence which was received from Africa suddenly changed the opinions of men in the state of public affairs. The troops and officers whom Attalus had sent into that province were defeated and slain, and the active zeal of Heracleion maintained his own allegiance and that of his people. The faithful Count of Africa transmitted a large sum of money, which fixed the attachment of the imperial guards, and his vigilance in preventing the exportation of corn and oil introduced famine, tumult, and discontent within the walls of Rome. The failure of the African expedition was the source of mutual complaint and recrimination in the party of Attalus, and the mind of his protector was insensibly alienated from the interest of a prince who wanted spirit to command or docility to obey. The most imprudent measures were adopted without the knowledge or against the advice of Alaric, and the obstinate refusal of the Senate to allow, in the embarkation, the mixture even of 500 Goths betrayed a suspicious and distrustful temper, which in their situation was neither generous nor prudent. The resentment of the Gothic king was exasperated by the malicious arts of Jovius, who had been raised to the rank of patrician, and who afterward excused his double perfidy by declaring without a blush that he had only seemed to abandon the service of Honorius, more effectually to ruin the cause of the usurper. In a large plain near Rimini, and in the presence of an innumerable multitude of Romans and barbarians, the wretched Attalus was publicly despoiled of the diadem and purple, and those ensigns of royalty were sent by Alaric as the pledge of peace and friendship to the son of Theodosius. The officers who returned to their duty were reinstated in their employments, and even the merit of a tardy repentance was graciously allowed. But the degraded emperor of the Romans, desirous of life and insensible of disgrace, implored the permission of following the Gothic camp in the train of a haughty and capricious barbarian. The degradation of Attalus removed the only real obstacle to the conclusion of the peace, and Alaric advanced within three miles of Ravenna to press the irresolution of the imperial ministers, whose insolence soon returned with the return of fortune. His indignation was kindled by the report that a rival chieftain, that Cyrus, the personal enemy of Adolphus and the hereditary foe of the house of Balti, had been received into the palace. At the head of 300 followers, that fearless barbarian immediately sallied from the gates of Ravenna, surprised and cut in pieces a considerable body of Goths, re-entered the city in triumph, and was permitted to insult his adversary by the voice of a herald, who publicly declared that the guilt of Alaric had forever excluded him from the friendship and alliance of the emperor. The crime and folly of the court of Ravenna were expiated a third time by the calamities of Rome. The king of the Goths, who no longer dissembled his appetite for plunder and revenge, appeared in arms under the walls of the capital, and the trembling senate, without any hopes of relief, prepared by a desperate resistance to delay the ruin of their country. But they were unable to guard against the secret conspiracy of their slaves and domestics, who, either from birth or interest, were attached to the cause of the enemy. At the hour of midnight, the Salarian gate was silently opened, and the inhabitants were awakened by the tremendous sound of the Gothic trumpet. 1163 years after the foundation of Rome, the imperial city, which had subdued and civilized so considerable a part of mankind, was delivered to the licentious fury of the tribes of Germany and Scythia. The proclamation of Alaric, when he forced his entrance into a vanquished city, discovered, however, some regard for the laws of humanity and religion. He encouraged his troops boldly to seize the rewards of valor and to enrich themselves with the spoils of a wealthy and effeminate people, but he exhorted them at the same time to spare the lives of the unresisting citizens and to respect the churches of the apostles St. Peter and St. Paul as holy and inviolable sanctuaries. Amid the horrors of a nocturnal tumult, several of the Christian Goths displayed the fervor of a recent conversion, and some instances of their uncommon piety and moderation are related, and perhaps adorned, by the zeal of ecclesiastical writers. While the barbarians roamed through the city in quest of prey, the humble dwelling of an aged virgin, who had devoted her life to the service of the altar, was forced open by one of the powerful Goths. He immediately demanded, though in civil language, all the gold and silver in her possession, 
and was astonished at the readiness with which she conducted him to a splendid hoard of massy plate of the richest materials and the most curious workmanship. The barbarian viewed with wonder and delight this valuable acquisition, till he was interrupted by a serious admonition addressed to him in the following words. These, said she, are the consecrated vessels belonging to St. Peter. If you presume to touch them, the sacrilegious deed will remain on your conscience. For my part, I dare not keep what I am unable to defend. The Gothic captain, struck with reverential awe, dispatched a messenger to inform the king of the treasure which he had discovered, and received a peremptory order from Alaric that all the consecrated plate and ornaments should be transported without damage or delay to the Church of the Apostle. From the extremity, perhaps, of the Corinal Hill to the distant quarter of the Vatican, a numerous detachment of Goths, marching in order of battle through the principal streets, protected with glittering arms the long train of their devout companions, who bore aloft on their heads the sacred vessels of gold and silver, and the martial shouts of the barbarians were mingled with the sound of religious psalmody. From all the adjacent houses a crowd of Christians hastened to join this edifying procession, and a multitude of fugitives, without distinction of age or rank or even of sect, had the good fortune to escape to the secure and hospitable sanctuary of the Vatican. The learned work concerning the City of God was professedly composed by St. Augustine, to justify the ways of providence in the destruction of the Roman greatness. He celebrates with peculiar satisfaction this memorable triumph of Christ, and insults his adversaries by challenging them to produce some similar example of a town taken by storm in which the fabulous gods of antiquity had been able to protect either themselves or their deluded votaries. In the sack of Rome, some rare and extraordinary examples of barbarian virtue have been deservedly applauded. But the holy precincts of the Vatican and the apostolic churches could receive a very small proportion of the Roman people. Many thousand warriors, more especially of the Huns, who served under the standard of Alaric, were strangers to the name, or at least to the faith, of Christ. And we may suspect, without any breach of charity or candor, that in the hour of savage license, when every passion was inflamed and every restraint was removed, the precepts of the gospel seldom influenced the behavior of the Gothic Christians. The writers, the best disposed to exaggerate their clemency, have freely confessed that a cruel slaughter was made of the Romans, and that the streets of the city were filled with dead bodies, which remained without burial during the general consternation. The despair of the citizens was sometimes converted into fury, and whenever the barbarians were provoked by opposition, they extended the promiscuous massacre to the feeble, the innocent, and the helpless. The private revenge of 40,000 slaves was exercised without pity or remorse, and the ignominious lashes which they had formerly received were washed away in the blood of the guilty or obnoxious families. The matrons and virgins of Rome were exposed to injuries more dreadful in the apprehension of chastity than death itself and the ecclesiastical historian has selected an example of female virtue for the admiration of future ages. A Roman lady of singular beauty and orthodox faith had excited the impatient desires of a young Goth, who, according to the sagacious remark of Sozomen, was attached to the Arian heresy. Exasperated by her obstinate resistance, he drew his sword, and with the anger of a lover, slightly wounded her neck. The bleeding heroine still continued to brave his resentment and to repel his love, till the ravisher desisted from his unavailing effort, respectfully conducted her to the sanctuary of the Vatican, and gave six pieces of gold to the guards of the church, on condition that they should restore her inviolate to the arms of her husband. Such instances of courage and generosity were not extremely common. Avarice is an insatiate and universal passion since the enjoyment of almost every object that can afford pleasure to the different tastes and tempers of mankind may be procured by the possession of wealth. In the pillage of Rome, a just preference was given to gold and jewels, which contain the greatest value in the smallest compass and weight. But after these portable riches had been removed by the more diligent robbers, the palaces of Rome were rudely stripped of their splendid and costly furniture. The sideboards of massy plate and the variegated wardrobes of silk and purple were irregularly piled in the wagons that always followed the march of a Gothic army. The most exquisite works of art were roughly handled or wantonly destroyed. Many a statue was melted for the sake of the precious materials, 
and many a vase in the division of the spoil was shivered into fragments by the stroke of a battle axe. The acquisition of riches served only to stimulate the avarice of the rapacious barbarians, who proceeded, by threats, by blows, and by tortures, to force from their prisoners the confession of hidden treasure. Visible splendor and expense were alleged as the proof of a plentiful fortune. The appearance of poverty was imputed to a parsimonious disposition, and the obstinacy of some misers, who endured the most cruel torments before they would discover the secret object of their affection, was fatal to many unhappy wretches, who expired under the lash for refusing to reveal their imaginary treasures. The edifices of Rome, though the damage has been much exaggerated, received some injury from the violence of the Goths. At their entrance through the Salarian Gate, they fired the adjacent houses to guide their march and to distract the attention of the citizens. The flames, which encountered no obstacle in the disorder of the night, consumed many private and public buildings, and the ruins of the Palace of Sallust remained, in the age of Justinian, a stately monument to the Gothic conflagration. Yet a contemporary historian has observed that fire could scarcely consume the enormous beams of solid brass, and that the strength of man was insufficient to subvert the foundations of ancient structures. Some truth may possibly be concealed in his devout assertion that the wrath of heaven supplied the imperfections of hostile rage, and that the proud Forum of Rome, decorated with the statues of so many gods and heroes, was leveled in the dust by the stroke of lightning. Whatever might be the number of equestrian or plebeian rank who perished in the massacre of Rome, it is confidently affirmed that only one senator lost his life by the sword of the enemy. But it was not easy to compute the multitudes who, from an honorable station and a prosperous fortune, were suddenly reduced to the miserable condition of captives and exiles. As the barbarians had more occasion for money than for slaves, they fixed a moderate price for the redemption of their indigent prisoners, and the ransom was often paid by the benevolence of their friends or the charity of strangers. The captives, who were regularly sold either in open market or by private contract, would have legally retained their native freedom, which it was impossible for a citizen to lose or to alienate. But it was soon discovered that the vindication of their liberty would endanger their lives, and that the Goths, unless they were tempted to sell, might be provoked to murder the useless prisoners. The civil jurisprudence had been already qualified by a wise regulation that they should be obliged to serve the moderate term of five years till they had discharged by labor the price of their redemption. The nations who invaded the Roman Empire had driven before them into Italy whole troops of hungry and affrighted provincials, less apprehensive of servitude than of famine. The calamities of Rome and Italy dispersed the inhabitants to the most lonely, the most secure, the most distant places of refuge. While the Gothic cavalry spread terror and desolation among the seacoast of Campania and Tuscany, the little island of Vigilium, separated by a narrow channel from the Argentarian promontory, repulsed or eluded their hostile attempts, and at so small a distance from Rome, great numbers of citizens were securely concealed in the thick woods of that sequestered spot. The ample patrimonies, which many senatorian families possessed in Africa, invited them, if they had time and prudence, to escape from the ruin of their country, to embrace the shelter of that hospitable province. The most illustrious of these fugitives was the noble and pious Proba, the widow of the prefect Petronius. After the death of her husband, the most powerful subject of Rome, she had remained at the head of the Anician family, and successively supplied from her private fortune the expense of the consulships of her three sons. When the city was besieged and taken by the Goths, Proba supported, with Christian resignation, the loss of immense riches, embarked in a small vessel, from whence she beheld at sea the flames of her burning palace, and fled with her daughter Laida and her granddaughter, the celebrated virgin Demetrius, to the coast of Africa. The benevolent profusion with which the matron distributed the fruits or the price of her estates contributed to alleviate the misfortunes of exile and captivity. But even the family of Proba herself was not exempt from the rapacious oppression of Count Heraclian, who basely sold in matrimonial prostitution the noblest maidens of Rome to the lust or avarice of the Syrian merchants. The Italian fugitives were dispersed through the provinces along the coast of Egypt and Asia as far as Constantinople and Jerusalem, and the village of Bethlehem, 
the solitary residence of St. Jerome and his female converts, was crowded with illustrious beggars of either sex and every age, who excited the public compassion by the remembrance of their past fortune. This awful catastrophe of Rome filled the astonished empire with grief and terror. So interesting a contrast of greatness and ruin disposed the fond credulity of the people to deplore and even to exaggerate the afflictions of the queen of cities. The clergy who applied to recent events the lofty metaphors of oriental prophecy were sometimes tempted to confound the destruction of the capital and the dissolution of the globe. There exists in human nature a strong propensity to depreciate the advantages and to magnify the evils of the present times. Yet when the first emotions had subsided and a fair estimate was made of the real damage, the more learned and judicious contemporaries were forced to confess that infant Rome had formerly received more essential injury from the Gauls than she had now sustained from the Goths in her declining age. The experience of 11 centuries has enabled posterity to produce a much more singular parallel and to affirm with confidence that the ravages of the barbarians whom Alaric had led from the banks of the Danube were less destructive than the hostilities exercised by the troops of Charles V, a Catholic prince, who styled himself Emperor of the Romans. The Goths evacuated the city at the end of six days, but Rome remained above nine months in the possession of the imperialists and every hour was stained by some atrocious act of cruelty, lust, and rapine. The authority of Alaric preserved some order and moderation among the ferocious multitude which acknowledged him for their leader and king, but the constable of Bourbon had gloriously fallen in the attack of the walls, and the death of the general removed every restraint of discipline from an army which consisted of three independent nations, the Italians, the Spaniards, and the Germans. The retreat of the victorious Goths, who evacuated Rome on the sixth day, might be the result of prudence, but it was not surely the effect of fear. At the head of an army encumbered with rich and weighty spoils, their intrepid leader advanced along the Appian Way into the southern provinces of Italy, destroying whatever dared to oppose his passage and contenting himself with the plunder of the unresisting country. Above four years elapsed from the successful invasion of Italy by the arms of Alaric to the voluntary retreat of the Goths under the conduct of his successor Adolphus, and during the whole time they reigned without control over a country which in the opinion of the ancients had united all the various excellences of nature and art. The prosperity, indeed, which Italy had attained in the auspicious age of the Antonines had gradually declined with the decline of the empire. The fruits of a long peace perished under the rude grasp of the barbarians, and they themselves were incapable of tasting the more elegant refinements of luxury, which had been prepared for the use of the soft and polished Italians. Each soldier, however, claimed an ample portion of the substantial plenty, the corn and cattle, oil and wine that was daily collected and consumed in the Gothic camp and the principal warriors insulted the villas and gardens, once inhabited by Lucullus and Cicero, along the beauteous coast of Campania. Their trembling captives, the sons and daughters of Roman senators, presented in goblets of gold and gems large drafts of Falernian wine to the haughty victors, who stretched their huge limbs under the shade of plane trees, artificially disposed to exclude the scorching rays and to admit the genial warmth of the sun. These delights were enhanced by the memory of past hardships, the comparison of their native soil, the bleak and barren hills of Scythia, and the frozen banks of the Elbe and Danube added new charms to the felicity of the Italian climate. Whether fame or conquest or riches were the object of Alaric, he pursued that object with an indefatigable ardor, which could neither be quelled by adversity nor satiated by success. No sooner had he reached the extreme land of Italy then he was attracted by the neighboring prospect of a fertile and peaceful island. Yet even the possession of Sicily he considered only as an intermediate step to the important expedition which he already meditated against the continent of Africa. The whole design was defeated by the premature death of Alaric, which fixed, after a short illness, the fatal term of his conquests. The ferocious character of the barbarians was displayed in the funeral of a hero whose valor and fortune they celebrated with mournful applause. By the labor of a captive multitude, they forcibly diverted the course of the Bucentinus, a small river that washes the walls of Consensia. The royal sepulchre, adorned with the splendid spoils and trophies of Rome, was constructed in the vacant bed, 
the waters were then restored to their natural channel, and the secret spot where the remains of Alaric had been deposited was forever concealed by the inhuman massacre of the prisoners who had been employed to execute the work. The personal animosities and hereditary feuds of the barbarians were suspended by the strong necessity of their affairs, and the brave Adolphus, the brother-in-law of the deceased monarch, was unanimously elected to succeed to his throne. The character and political system of the new king of the Goths may be best understood from his own conversation with an illustrious citizen of Narbonne, who, afterward, in a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, related it to St. Jerome, in the presence of the historian Erosius. In the full confidence of valor and victory, I once aspired, said Adolphus, to change the face of the universe, to obliterate the name of Rome, to erect on its ruins the dominion of the Goths, and to acquire like Augustus the immortal fame of the founder of a new empire. By repeated experiments, I was gradually convinced that laws are essentially necessary to maintain and regulate a well-constituted state, and that the fierce, untractable humor of the Goths was incapable of bearing the salutary yoke of laws and civil government. From that moment, I proposed to myself a different object of glory and ambition. And it is now my sincere wish that the gratitude of future ages should acknowledge the merit of a stranger who employed the sword of the Goths, not to subvert, but to restore and maintain the prosperity of the Roman Empire. With these pacific views, the successor of Alaric suspended the operations of war and seriously negotiated with the imperial court a treaty of friendship and alliance. It was the interest of the ministers of Honorius, who were now released from the obligation of their extravagant oath, to deliver Italy from the intolerable weight of the Gothic powers, and they readily accepted their service against the tyrants and barbarians who infested the provinces beyond the Alps. Adolphus, assuming the character of a Roman general, directed his march from the extremity of Campania to the southern provinces of Gaul. His troops, either by force or agreement, immediately occupied the cities of Narbonne, Toulouse, and Bordeaux, and though they were repulsed by Count Boniface from the walls of Marseille, they soon extended their quarters from the Mediterranean to the ocean. The oppressed provincials might exclaim that the miserable remnant which the enemy had spared was cruelly ravished by their pretended allies. Yet some specious colors were not wanting to palliate or justify the violence of the Goth. The cities of Gaul which they attacked might perhaps be considered as in a state of rebellion against the government of Honorius. The articles of the treaty or the secret instructions of the court might sometimes be alleged in favor of the seeming usurpations of Adolphus, and the guilt of any irregular, unsuccessful act of hostility might always be imputed with an appearance of truth to the ungovernable spirit of a barbarian host, impatient of peace or discipline. The luxury of Italy had been less effectual to soften the temper than to relax the courage of the Goths, and they had imbibed the vices without imitating the arts and institutions of civilized society. The professions of Adolphus were probably sincere, and his attachment to the cause of the Republic was secured by the ascendant which a Roman princess had acquired over the heart and understanding of the barbarian king. Placidia, the daughter of the great Theodosius, and of Gala, his second wife, had received a royal education in the palace of Constantinople. But the eventful story of her life is connected with the revolutions which agitated the Western Empire under the reign of her brother Honorius. When Rome was first invested by the arms of Alaric, Placidia, who was then about 20 years of age, resided in the city, and her ready consent to the death of her cousin Serena has a cruel and ungrateful appearance, which, according to the circumstances of the action, may be aggravated or excused by the consideration of her tender age. The victorious barbarians detained, either as a hostage or a captive, the sister of Honorius. But while she was exposed to the disgrace of following round Italy the motions of a Gothic camp, she experienced, however, a decent and respectful treatment. The authority of Jornandus, who praises the beauty of Placidia, may perhaps be counterbalanced by the silence, the expressive silence, of her flatterers. Yet the splendor of her birth, the bloom of youth, the elegance of manners, and the dexterous insinuation which she condescended to employ made a deep impression on the mind of Adolphus, and the Gothic king aspired to call himself the brother of the emperor. The ministers of Honorius rejected with disdain the proposal of an alliance so injurious to every sentiment of Roman pride, and repeatedly urged the restitution of Placidia as an indispensable condition of the treaty of peace. 
but the daughter of Theodosius submitted without reluctance to the desires of the conqueror, a young and valiant prince who yielded to Alaric in loftiness of stature, but who excelled in the more attractive qualities of grace and beauty. The marriage of Adolphus and Placidia was consummated before the Goths retired from Italy, and the solemn, perhaps the anniversary day of their nuptials, was afterward celebrated in the house of Ingenuus, one of the most illustrious citizens of Narbonne in Gaul. The bride, attired and adorned like a Roman empress, was placed on a throne of state, and the king of the Goths, who assumed on this occasion the Roman habit, contented himself with a less honorable seat by her side. The nuptial gift, which, according to the custom of his nation, was offered to Placidia, consisted of the rare and magnificent spoils of her country. Fifty beautiful youths in silken robes carried a basin in each hand, and one of these basins was filled with pieces of gold, the other with precious stones of an inestimable value. Attalus, so long the sport of fortune and of the Goths, was appointed to lead the chorus of the hymeneal song, and the degraded emperor might aspire to the praise of a skillful musician. The barbarians enjoyed the insolence of their triumph, and the provincials rejoiced in this alliance, which tempered, by the mild influence of love and reason, the fierce spirit of their Gothic lord. After the deliverance of Italy from the oppression of the Goths, some secret counselor was permitted, amid the factions of the palace, to heal the wounds of that afflicted country. By a wise and humane regulation, the eight provinces which had been the most deeply injured, Campania, Tuscany, Picenum, Samnium, Apulia, Calabria, Brutium, and Lucania, obtained an indulgence of five years. The ordinary tribute was reduced to one-fifth, and even that fifth was destined to restore and support the useful institution of the public posts. By another law, the lands which had been left without inhabitants or cultivation were granted, with some diminution of taxes, to the neighbors who should occupy or the strangers who should solicit them, and the new possessors were secured against the future claims of the fugitive proprietors. About the same time, a general amnesty was published in the name of Honorius, to abolish the guilt and memory of all the involuntary offenses which had been committed by his unhappy subjects during the term of the public disorder and calamity. A decent and respectful attention was paid to the restoration of the capital. The citizens were encouraged to rebuild the edifices which had been destroyed or damaged by hostile fire, and extraordinary supplies of corn were imported from the coast of Africa. The crowds that so lately fled before the sword of the barbarians were soon recalled by the hopes of plenty and pleasure. And Albinus, prefect of Rome, informed the court with some anxiety and surprise that in a single day he had taken an account of the arrival of 14,000 strangers. In less than seven years, the vestiges of the Gothic invasion were almost obliterated, and the city appeared to resume its former splendor and tranquility. The venerable matron replaced her crown of laurel which had been ruffled by the storms of war, and was still amused in the last moment of her decay with the prophecies of revenge, of victory, and of eternal dominion. End of section two. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section three, part one, of The Great Events by Famous Historians, volume four, this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4, by Rossiter Johnson, Charles F. Horn, and John Rudd. Section 3, Part 1. Huns invade the Eastern Roman Empire. Attila Dictates a Treaty of Peace, A.D. 441, Edward Gibbon Beyond the Great Wall of China, erected to secure the empire from their encroachments, were numerous tribes of troublesome Hyangnu, who, becoming united under one head, were successful in an invasion of that country. These confederated tribes became known as the Huns, until the advent of Monsieur Deguin, all was dark concerning them. 
that learned and laborious scholar conceived the idea that the Huns might be thus identified, and has written the history from Chinese sources of those who since that time have poured down upon the civilized countries of Asia and Europe and wasted them. Bulger also identifies these tribes with the Huns of Attila. After driving the Alani across the Danube and compelling them to seek an asylum within the borders of the Roman Empire, the terrible Huns had halted in their march westward for something more than a generation. They were hovering, meantime, on the eastern frontiers of the empire, taking part, like other barbarians, in its disturbances and alliances. Emperors paid them tribute, and Roman generals kept up a politic or a questionable correspondence with them. Stilicho had detachments of Huns in the armies which fought against Alaric, king of the Goths, the greatest Roman soldier after Stilicho, and like Stilicho, of barbarian parentage. Etius, who was to be their most formidable antagonist, had been a hostage and messmate in their camps. All historians agree that the influx of these barbaric peoples hastened, more than any other cause, the rapid decline of the great empire which the Romans had built up. About A.D. 433, Attila, equally famous in history and legend, became the king of the Huns. The attraction of his daring character, and of his genius for the war which nomadic tribes delight in, gave him absolute ascendancy over his nation, and over the Teutonic and Slavonic tribes near him. Like other conquerors of his race, he imagined and attempted an empire of ravage and desolation, a vast hunting ground and preserve, in which men and their works should supply the objects and zest of the chase. The gradual encroachments of the Huns on the northern frontiers of the Roman domain led to a terrific war in 441. Attila was king. His first assault upon the Roman power was directed against the Eastern Empire. The court at Constantinople had been duly obsequious to him, but he found a pretext for war. The dreadful ravages of his hordes and the shameful treaty which he forced upon the empire form a thrilling yet terrible chapter in the history of the world. The western world was oppressed by the Goths and Vandals who fled before the Huns, but the achievements of the Huns themselves were not adequate to their power and prosperity. Their victorious hordes had spread from the Volga to the Danube, but the public force was exhausted by the discord of independent chieftains. Their valor was idly consumed in obscure and predatory excursions, and they often degraded their national dignity by condescending for the hopes of spoil to enlist under the banners of their fugitive enemies. In the reign of Attila, the Huns again became the terror of the world, and I shall now describe the character and actions of that formidable barbarian, who alternately insulted and invaded the East and the West, and urged the rapid downfall of the Roman Empire. In the tide of emigration, which impetuously rolled from the confines of China to those of Germany, the most powerful and populous tribes may commonly be found on the verge of the Roman provinces, the accumulated weight was sustained for a while by artificial barriers, and the easy condescension of the emperors invited without satisfying the insolent demands of the barbarians, who had acquired an eager appetite for the luxuries of civilized life. The Hungarians, who ambitiously insert the name of Attila among their native kings, may affirm with truth that the hordes which were subject to his uncle Roas, or Rugelas, had formed their encampments within the limits of modern Hungary, in a fertile country, which liberally supplied the wants of a nation of hunters and shepherds. 
In this advantageous situation, Rugulus and his valiant brothers, who continually added to their power and reputation, commanded the alternative of peace or war with the two empires. His alliance with the Romans of the West was cemented by his personal friendship for the great Etius, who was always secure of finding in the barbarian camp a hospitable reception and a powerful support. At his solicitation, and in the name of John the Usurper, 60,000 Huns advanced to the confines of Italy. Their march and their retreat were alike expensive to the state, and the grateful policy of Etius abandoned the possession of Pannonia to his faithful confederates. The Romans of the East were not less apprehensive of the arms of Rugulus, which threatened the provinces or even the capital. Some ecclesiastical historians have destroyed the barbarians with lightning and pestilence, but Theodosius was reduced to the more humble expedient of stipulating an annual payment of 350 pounds of gold, and of disguising this dishonorable tribute by the title of general, which the king of the Huns condescended to accept. The public tranquillity was frequently interrupted by the fierce impatience of the barbarians and the perfidious intrigues of the Byzantine court, Four dependent nations, among whom we may distinguish the Bavarians, disclaimed the sovereignty of the Huns, and their revolt was encouraged and protected by a Roman alliance, till the just claims and formidable power of Rugulus were effectually urged by the voice of Eslaw, his ambassador. Peace was the unanimous wish of the Senate. Their decree was ratified by the emperor, and two ambassadors were named. Plinthus, a general of Scythian extraction, but of consular rank, and the quaestor Epigenes, a wise and experienced statesman, who was recommended to that office by his ambitious colleague. The death of Rugulus suspended the progress of the treaty. His two nephews, Attila and Bleda, who succeeded to the throne of their uncle, consented to a personal interview with the ambassadors of Constantinople. But as they proudly refused to dismount, the business was transacted on horseback, in a spacious plain near the city of Margus in the upper Messia. The kings of the Huns assumed the solid benefits, as well as the vain honors of the negotiation. They dictated the conditions of peace, and each condition was an insult on the majesty of the empire. Besides the freedom of a safe and plentiful market on the banks of the Danube, they required that the annual contribution should be augmented from 350 to 700 pounds of gold, that a fine or ransom of eight pieces of gold should be paid for every Roman captive who had escaped from his barbarian master, that the emperor should renounce all treaties and engagements with the enemies of the Huns, and that all the fugitives who had taken refuge in the court or provinces of Theodosius should be delivered to the justice of their offended sovereign. This justice was rigorously inflicted on some unfortunate youths of a royal race. They were crucified on the territories of the empire by the command of Attila, and as soon as the king of the Huns had impressed the Romans with the terror of his name, he indulged them in a short and arbitrary respite, while he subdued the rebellious or independent nations of Scythia and Germany. Attila, the son of Munzuk, deduced his noble, perhaps his regal, descent from the ancient Huns, who had formerly contended with the monarchs of China. His features, according to the observation of a Gothic historian, bore the stamp of his national origin, and the portrait of Attila exhibits the genuine deformity of a modern Kalmuk, a large head, a swarthy complexion, small deep-seated eyes, a flat nose, a few hairs in the place of a beard, broad shoulders, and a short square body, of nervous strength, though of a disproportioned form. 
the haughty step and demeanor of the king of the Huns expressed the consciousness of his superiority above the rest of mankind, and he had a custom of fiercely rolling his eyes as if he wished to enjoy the terror which he inspired. Yet this savage hero was not inaccessible to pity. His suppliant enemies might confide in the assurance of peace or pardon, and Attila was considered by his subjects as a just and indulgent master. He delighted in war, but after he had ascended the throne in a mature age, his head, rather than his hand, achieved the conquest of the north, and the fame of an adventurous soldier was usefully exchanged for that of a prudent and successful general. The effects of personal valor are so inconsiderable, except in poetry or romance, that victory, even among barbarians, must depend on the degree of skill with which the passions of the multitude are combined and guided for the service of a single man. The Scythian conquerors, Attila and Zingis, surpass their rude countrymen in art rather than in courage and it may be observed that the monarchies, both of the Huns and of the Mughals, were erected by their founders on the basis of popular superstition. The miraculous conception which fraud and credulity ascribed to the Virgin Mother of Zingis raised him above the level of human nature, and the naked prophet, who in the name of the deity invested him with the empire of the earth, pointed the valor of the Mughals with irresistible enthusiasm. The religious arts of Attila were not less skillfully adapted to the character of his age and country. It was natural enough that the Scythians should adore with peculiar devotion the god of war. But as they were incapable of forming either an abstract idea or a corporeal representation, they worshipped their tutelar deity under the symbol of an iron scimitar. One of the shepherds of the Huns perceived that a heifer who was grazing had wounded herself in the foot, and curiously followed the track of the blood till he discovered among the long grass the point of an ancient sword which he dug out of the ground and presented to Attila. That magnanimous, or rather that artful, prince accepted, with pious gratitude, this celestial favor, and as the rightful possessor of the sword of Mars, asserted his divine and indefeasible claim to the dominion of the earth. If the rites of Scythia were practiced on this solemn occasion, a lofty altar, or rather pile of faggots, three hundred yards in length and in breadth, was raised in a spacious plain, and the sword of Mars was placed erect on the summit of this rustic altar, which was annually consecrated by the blood of sheep, horses, and of the hundredth captive. Whether human sacrifices formed any part of the worship of Attila, or whether he propitiated the god of war with the victims which he continually offered in the field of battle, the favorite of Mars soon acquired a sacred character, which rendered his conquests more easy and more permanent and the barbarian princes confessed, in the language of devotion or flattery, that they could not presume to gaze with a steady eye on the divine majesty of the king of the Huns. His brother Bleda, who reigned over a considerable part of the nation, was compelled to resign his scepter and his life. Yet even this cruel act was attributed to a supernatural impulse and the vigor with which Attila wielded the sword of Mars convinced the world that it had been reserved alone for his invincible arm. But the extent of his empire affords the only remaining evidence of the number and importance of his victories, and the Scythian monarch, however ignorant of the value of science and philosophy, might perhaps lament that his illiterate subjects were destitute of the art which could perpetrate the memory of his exploits. 
If a line of separation were drawn between the civilized and the savage climates of the globe, between the inhabitants of cities who cultivated the earth and the hunters and shepherds who dwelt in tents, Attila might aspire to the title of supreme and sole monarch of the barbarians. He alone, among the conquerors of ancient and modern times, united the two mighty kingdoms of Germany and Scythia. And those vague appellations, when they are applied to his reign, may be understood with an ample latitude. Thuringia, which stretched beyond its actual limits as far as the Danube, was in the number of his provinces. He interposed with the weight of a powerful neighbor in the domestic affairs of the Franks, and one of his lieutenants chastised and almost exterminated the Burgundians of the Rhine. He subdued the islands of the ocean, the kingdoms of Scandinavia, encompassed and divided by the waters of the Baltic, and the Huns might derive a tribute of furs from that northern region, which has been protected from all other conquerors by the severity of the climate and the courage of the natives. Toward the east, it is difficult to circumscribe the dominion of Attila over the Scythian desert. Yet we may be assured that he reigned on the banks of the Volga, that the king of the Huns was dreaded not only as a warrior but as a magician, that he insulted and vanquished the Khan of the formidable Gyojin, and that he sent ambassadors to negotiate an equal alliance with the Empire of China. In the proud review of the nations who acknowledge the sovereignty of Attila, and who never entertained during his lifetime the thought of a revolt, the Jepide and the Ostrogoths were distinguished by their numbers, their bravery, and the personal merit of their chiefs. The renowned Arderic, king of the Jebidae, was the faithful and sagacious counselor of the monarch, who esteemed his intrepid genius, while he loved the mild and discreet virtues of the noble Valamir, king of the Ostrogoths. The crowd of vulgar kings, the leaders of so many martial tribes, who served under the standard of Attila, were ranged in the submissive order of guards and domestics round the person of their master. They watched his nod, they trembled at his frown, and at the first signal of his will they executed, without murmur or hesitation, his stern and absolute commands. In times of peace, the dependent princes, with their national troops, attended the royal camp in regular succession. But when Attila collected his military force, he was able to bring into the field an army of five, or according to another account, of seven hundred thousand barbarians. The ambassadors of the Huns might awaken the attention of Theodosius by reminding him that they were his neighbors both in Europe and Asia, since they touched the Danube on one hand and reached with the other as far as the Tenes. In the reign of his father, Arcadius, a band of adventurous Huns had ravaged the provinces of the east, from whence they brought away rich spoils and innumerable captives. They advanced by a secret path along the shores of the Caspian Sea, traversed the snowy mountains of Armenia, passed the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Halys, recruited their weary cavalry with the generous breed of Cappadocian horses, occupied the hilly country of Cilicia, and disturbed the festal songs and dances of the citizens of Antioch. Egypt trembled at their approach, and the monks and pilgrims of the Holy Land prepared to escape their fury by a speedy embarkation. The memory of this invasion was still recent in the minds of the Orientals. The subjects of Attila might execute with superior forces the design which these adventurers had so boldly attempted and it soon became the subject of anxious conjecture whether the tempest would fall on the dominions of Rome or of Persia. Some of the great vassals of the king of the Huns, who were themselves in the rank of powerful princes, had been sent to ratify an alliance and society of arms with the emperor, or rather with the general of the West. 
They related, during their residence at Rome, the circumstances of an expedition which they had lately made into the East. After passing a desert and a morass, supposed by the Romans to be the Lake Metus, they penetrated through the mountains, and arrived, at the end of fifteen days' march, on the confines of Media, where they advanced as far as the unknown cities of Basic and Kursic. They encountered the Persian army in the plains of Media, and the air, according to their own expression, was darkened by a cloud of arrows. But the Huns were obliged to retire before the numbers of the enemy. Their laborious retreat was effected by a different road. They lost the greater part of their booty, and at length returned to the royal camp, with some knowledge of the country, and an impatient desire of revenge. In the free conversation of the imperial ambassadors, who discussed at the court of Attila the character and designs of their formidable enemy, the ministers of Constantinople expressed their hope that his strength might be diverted and employed in a long and doubtful contest with the princes of the house of Sassan. The more sagacious Italians admonished their eastern brethren of the folly and danger of such a hope, and convinced them that the Medes and Persians were incapable of resisting the arms of the Huns and that the easy and important acquisition would exalt the pride as well as power of the conqueror. Instead of contenting himself with a moderate contribution and a military title, which equaled him only to the generals of Theodosius, Attila would proceed to impose a disgraceful and intolerable yoke on the necks of the prostrate and captive Romans, who would then be encompassed on all sides by the empire of the Huns. While the powers of Europe and Asia were solicitous to avert the impending danger, the alliance of Attila maintained the Vandals in the possession of Africa. An enterprise had been concerted between the courts of Ravenna and Constantinople for the recovery of that valuable province, and the ports of Sicily were already filled with the military and naval forces of Theodosius. But the subtle Genseric, who spread his negotiations round the world, prevented their designs by exciting the king of the Huns to invade the Eastern Empire, and a trifling incident soon became the motive or pretense of a destructive war. Under the faith of the Treaty of Margus, a free market was held on the northern side of the Danube, which was protected by a Roman fortress surnamed Constantia. A troop of barbarians violated the commercial security, killed or dispersed the unsuspecting traders, and leveled the fortress with the ground. The Huns justified this outrage as an act of reprisal, alleged that the Bishop of Marcus had entered their territories to discover and steal a secret treasure of their kings, and sternly demanded the guilty prelate, the sacrilegious spoil, and the fugitive subjects who had escaped from the justice of Attila. The refusal of the Byzantine court was the signal of war, and the Macians at first applauded the generous firmness of their sovereign, but they were soon intimidated by the destruction of Viminiasum and the adjacent towns and the people were persuaded to adopt the convenient maxim that a private citizen, however innocent or respectable, may be justly sacrificed to the safety of his country. The Bishop of Margus, who did not possess the spirit of a martyr, resolved to prevent the designs which he suspected. He boldly treated with the princes of the Huns, secured by solemn oaths his pardon and reward posted a numerous detachment of barbarians in silent ambush on the banks of the Danube, and at the appointed hour opened with his own hand the gates of his episcopal city. This advantage, which had been obtained by treachery, served as a prelude to more honorable and decisive victories. The Illyrian frontier was covered by a line of castles and fortresses, 
and though the greatest part of them consisted only of a single tower with a small garrison, they were commonly sufficient to repel or to intercept the inroads of an enemy who was ignorant of the art and impatient of the delay of a regular siege. But these slight obstacles were instantly swept away by the inundation of the Huns. They destroyed, with fire and sword, the populous cities of Sirmium and Singidunum, of Ratiaria and Marcianopolis, of Nasus and Sardica, where every circumstance of the discipline of the people and the construction of the buildings had been gradually adapted to the sole purpose of defense. The whole breadth of Europe, as it extends above five hundred miles from the Euxine to the Hadriatic, was at once invaded and occupied and desolated by the myriads of barbarians whom Attila led into the field. The public danger and distress could not, however, provoke Theodosius to interrupt his amusements and devotion, or to appear in person at the head of the Roman legions. But the troops which had been sent against Genseric were hastily recalled from Sicily. The garrisons on the side of Persia were exhausted, and a military force was collected in Europe, formidable by their arms and numbers. If the generals had understood the science of command, and their soldiers the duty of obedience, the armies of the Eastern Empire were vanquished in three successive engagements and the progress of Attila may be traced by the fields of battle. The two former, on the banks of the Utus and under the walls of Marcianopolis, were fought in the extensive plains between the Danube and Mount Hamus. As the Romans were pressed by a victorious enemy, they gradually and unskillfully retired toward the Chernosius of Thrace, and that narrow peninsula, the last extremity of the land, was marked by their third and irreparable defeat. By the destruction of this army, Attila acquired the indisputable possession of the field. From the Hellespont to Thermopylae and the suburbs of Constantinople, he ravaged without resistance and without mercy the provinces of Thrace and Macedonia. Heraclea and Hadrianople might perhaps escape this dreadful eruption of the Huns, but the words the most expressive of total extirpation and erasure are applied to the calamities which they inflicted on seventy cities of the Eastern Empire. Theodosius, his court, and the unwarlike people were protected by the walls of Constantinople, but those walls had been shaken by a recent earthquake, and the fall of fifty-eight towers had opened a large and tremendous breach. The damage indeed was speedily repaired, but this accident was aggravated by a superstitious fear that heaven itself had delivered the imperial city to the shepherds of Scythia, who were strangers to the laws, the language, and the religion of the Romans. In all their invasions of the civilized empires of the south, the Scythian shepherds have been uniformly actuated by a savage and destructive spirit. The laws of war that restrain the exercise of national rapine and murder are founded on two principles of substantial interest, the knowledge of the permanent benefits which may be obtained by a moderate use of conquest, and a just apprehension, lest the desolation which we inflict on the enemy's country may be retaliated on our own. But these considerations of hope and fear are almost unknown in the pastoral state of nations. The Huns of Attila may, without injustice, be compared to the Mughals and Tartars before their primitive manners were changed by religion and luxury. After the Mughals had subdued the northern provinces of China, it was seriously proposed, not in the hour of victory and passion, but in calm, deliberate counsel, to exterminate all the inhabitants of that populous country, that the vacant land might be converted to the pasture of cattle. The firmness of a Chinese Mandarin, who insinuated some principles of rational policy into the mind of Genghis, diverted him from the execution of this horrid design. 
but in the cities of Asia, which yielded to the Mughals, the inhuman abuse of the rights of war was exercised with a regular form of discipline, which may, with equal reason, though not with equal authority, be imputed to the victorious Huns. The inhabitants, who had submitted to their discretion, were ordered to evacuate their houses, and to assemble in some plain adjacent to the city, where a division was made of the vanquished into three parts. The first class consisted of the soldiers of the garrison, and of the young men capable of bearing arms, and their fate was instantly decided. They were either enlisted among the moguls, or they were massacred on the spot by the troops, who with pointed spears and bended bows had formed a circle round the captive multitude. The second class, composed of the young and beautiful women, of the artificers of every rank and profession, and of the more wealthy or honorable citizens, from whom a private ransom might be expected, was distributed in equal or proportionable lots, the remainder, whose life or death was alike useless to the conquerors, were permitted to return to the city, which in the meanwhile had been stripped of its valuable furniture, and a tax was imposed on those wretched inhabitants for the indulgence of breathing their native air. Such was the behavior of the moguls when they were not conscious of any extraordinary rigor. But the most casual provocation, the slightest motive of caprice or convenience, often provoked them to involve a whole people in an indiscriminate massacre, and the ruin of some flourishing cities was executed with such unrelenting perseverance that, according to their own expression, horses might run without stumbling over the ground where they had once stood. The three great capitals of Khorasan and Maru, Nisabur and Herat, were destroyed by the armies of Genghis, and the exact account which was taken of the slain amounted to 4,347,000 persons. Timur, or Tamerlane, was educated in a less barbarous age, and in the profession of the Mahometan religion. Yet if Attila equaled the hostile ravages of Tamerlane, either the Tartar or the Hun might deserve the epithet of the Scourge of God. It may be affirmed with bolder assurance that the Huns depopulated the provinces of the empire by the murder of Roman subjects whom they led away into captivity. In the hands of a wise legislator, such an industrious colony might have contributed to diffuse through the deserts of Scythia the rudiments of the useful and ornamental arts. But these captives, who had been taken in war, were accidentally dispersed among the hordes that obeyed the empire of Attila. The estimate of their respective value was formed by the simple judgment of unenlightened and unprejudiced barbarians. Perhaps they might not understand the merit of a theologian, profoundly skilled in the controversies of the Trinity and the Incarnation, yet they respected the ministers of every religion, and the active zeal of the Christian missionaries, without approaching the person or the palace of the monarch, successfully labored in the propagation of the gospel. The pastoral tribes, who were ignorant of the distinction of landed property, must have disregarded the use, as well as the abuse, of civil jurisprudence, and the skill of an eloquent lawyer could excite only their contempt or their abhorrence. The perpetual intercourse of the Huns and the Goths had communicated the familiar knowledge of the two national dialects, and the barbarians were ambitious of conversing in Latin, the military idiom even of the Eastern Empire. But they disdained the language and the sciences of the Greeks, and the vain sophist or grave philosopher, who had enjoyed the flattering applause of the schools, was mortified to find that his robust servant was a captive of more value and importance than himself. The mechanic arts were encouraged and esteemed as they tended to satisfy the wants of the Huns. An architect in the service of Onegesius, one of the favorites of Attila, was employed to construct a bath, 
but this work was a rare example of private luxury, and the trades of the smiths, the carpenter, the armorer, were much more adapted to supply a wandering people with the useful instruments of peace and war. But the merit of the physician was received with universal favor and respect. The barbarians, who despised death, might be apprehensive of disease, and the haughty conqueror trembled in the presence of a captive to whom he ascribed, perhaps, an imaginary power of prolonging or preserving his life. The Huns might be provoked to insult the misery of their slaves, over whom they exercised a despotic command. But their manners were not susceptible of a refined system of oppression, and the efforts of courage and diligence were often recompensed by the gift of freedom. The historian Priscus, whose embassy is a source of curious instruction, was accosted in the camp of Attila by a stranger, who saluted him in the Greek language, but whose dress and figure displayed the appearance of a wealthy Scythian. In the siege of Viminiasum he had lost, according to his own account, his fortune and liberty. He became the slave of Onegesius, but his faithful services against the Romans and the Akatsirs had gradually raised him to the rank of the native Huns, to whom he was attached by the domestic pledges of a new wife and several children. The spoils of war had restored and improved his private property. He was admitted to the table of his former lord, and the apostate Greek blessed the hour of his captivity, since it had been the introduction to a happy and independent state, which he held by the honorable tenure of military service. This reflection naturally produced a dispute on the advantages and defects of the Roman government, which was severely arraigned by the apostate, and defended by Priscus in a prolix and feeble declamation. The freedmen of Onegesius exposed, in true and lively colors, the vices of a declining empire, of which he had so long been the victim. The cruel absurdity of the Roman princes, unable to protect their subjects against the public enemy, unwilling to trust them with arms for their own defense, the intolerable weight of taxes, rendered still more oppressive by the intricate or arbitrary modes of collection, the obscurity of numerous and contradictory laws, the tedious and expensive forms of judicial proceedings, the partial administration of justice, and the universal corruption which increased the influence of the rich and aggravated the misfortunes of the poor. A sentiment of patriotic sympathy was at length revived in the breast of the fortunate exile, and he lamented, with a flood of tears, the guilt or weakness of those magistrates who had perverted the wisest and most salutary institutions. End of section 3section 4 part 2 of the great events by famous historians volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rita butros the great events by famous historians volume 4 by rossiter johnson charles f horn and john rudd Section 4, Part 2 Huns invade the Eastern Roman Empire. Attila dictates a treaty of peace. A.D. 441. Edward Gibbon The timid or selfish policy of the Western Romans had abandoned the Eastern Empire to the Huns. The loss of armies and the want of discipline or virtue were not supplied by the personal character of the monarch. Theodosius might still affect the style as well as the title of Invincible Augustus, but he was reduced to solicit the clemency of Attila, who imperiously dictated these harsh and humiliating conditions of peace. Number 1. The Emperor of the East resigned, by an express or tacit convention, an extensive and important territory which stretched along the southern banks of the Danube, 
from Syngidunum, or Belgrade, as far as Nove, in the Diocese of Thrace. The breadth was defined by the vague computation of fifteen days' journey. But from the proposal of Attila to remove the situation of the national market, it soon appeared that he comprehended the ruined city of Nasus within the limits of his dominions. Number 2. The king of the Huns required and obtained that his tribute or subsidy should be augmented by seven hundred pounds of gold to the annual sum of two thousand one hundred, and he stipulated the immediate payment of six thousand pounds of gold to defray the expenses or to expiate the guilt of the war. One might imagine that such a demand, which scarcely equaled the measure of private wealth, would have been readily discharged by the opulent empire of the East, and the public distress affords a remarkable proof of the impoverished, or at least of the disorderly, state of the finances. A large proportion of the taxes extorted from the people was detained and intercepted in their passage through the foulest channels to the treasury of Constantinople. The revenue was dissipated by Theodosius and his favorites in wasteful and profuse luxury, which was disguised by the name of imperial magnificence or Christian charity. The immediate supplies had been exhausted by the unforeseen necessity of military preparations. A personal contribution, rigorously but capriciously imposed on the members of the senatorian order, was the only expedient that could disarm, without loss of time, the impatient avarice of Attila. And the poverty of the nobles compelled them to adopt the scandalous resource of exposing to public auction the jewels of their wives and the hereditary ornaments of their palaces. Number 3 the king of the Huns appears to have established as a principle of national jurisprudence that he could never lose the property which he had once acquired in the persons who had yielded either a voluntary or reluctant submission to his authority. From this principle he concluded, and the conclusions of Attila were irrevocable laws, that the Huns, who had been taken prisoners in war, should be released without delay and without ransom that every Roman captive who had presumed to escape should purchase his right to freedom at the price of twelve pieces of gold, and that all the barbarians who had deserted the standard of Attila should be restored, without any promise or stipulation of pardon. In the execution of this cruel and ignominious treaty, the imperial officers were forced to massacre several loyal and noble deserters who refused to devote themselves to certain death, and the Romans forfeited all reasonable claims to the friendship of any Scythian people, by this public confession that they were destitute either of faith or power to protect the suppliant who had embraced the throne of Theodosius. It would have been strange indeed if Theodosius had purchased, by the loss of honor, a secure and solid tranquillity, or if his tameness had not invited the repetition of injuries. The Byzantine court was insulted by five or six successive embassies, and the ministers of Attila were uniformly instructed to press the tardy or imperfect execution of the last treaty to produce the names of fugitives and deserters who were still protected by the empire, and to declare with seeming moderation that unless their sovereign obtained complete and immediate satisfaction, it would be impossible for him, were it even his wish, to check the resentment of his warlike tribes. Besides the motives of pride and interest which might prompt the king of the Huns to continue this train of negotiation, he was influenced by the less honorable view of enriching his favorites at the expense of his enemies. The imperial treasury was exhausted to procure the friendly offices of the ambassadors and their principal attendants, whose favorable report might conduce to the maintenance of peace. The barbarian monarch was flattered by the liberal reception of his ministers. 
he computed with pleasure the value and splendor of their gifts, rigorously exacted the performance of every promise which would contribute to their private emolument, and treated as an important business of state the marriage of his secretary Constantius. That Gallic adventurer, who was recommended by Etius to the king of the Huns, had engaged his service to the ministers of Constantinople for the stipulated reward of a wealthy and noble wife, and the daughter of Count Saturninus was chosen to discharge the obligations of her country. The reluctance of the victim, some domestic troubles, and the unjust confiscation of her fortune cooled the ardor of her interested lover, but he still demanded in the name of Attila an equivalent alliance, and after many ambiguous delays and excuses, the Byzantine court was compelled to sacrifice to this insolent stranger the widow of Armatius, whose birth, opulence, and beauty placed her in the most illustrious rank of the Roman matrons. For these importunate and oppressive embassies, Attila claimed a suitable return. He weighed with suspicious pride the character and station of the imperial envoys, but he condescended to promise that he would advance as far as Sardica to receive any ministers who had been invested with the consular dignity. The consul of Theodosius eluded this proposal by representing the desolate and ruined condition of Sardica, and even ventured to insinuate that every officer of the army or household was qualified to treat with the most powerful princes of Scythia. Maximin, a respectable courtier whose abilities had been long exercised in civil and military employments, accepted with reluctance the troublesome and perhaps dangerous commission of reconciling the angry spirit of the king of the Huns. His friend, the historian Priscus, embraced the opportunity of observing the barbarian hero in the peaceful and domestic scenes of life, but the secret of the embassy, a fatal and guilty secret, was entrusted only to the interpreter Vigilius. The two last ambassadors of the Huns, Orestes, a noble subject of the Pannonian province, and Edicon, a valiant chieftain of the tribe of the Scyri, returned at the same time from Constantinople to the royal camp. Their obscure names were afterward illustrated by the extraordinary fortune and the contrast of their sons. The two servants of Attila became the fathers of the last Roman emperor of the West and of the first barbarian king of Italy. The ambassadors, who were followed by a numerous train of men and horses, made their first halt at Sardica, at the distance of 350 miles or thirteen days' journey from Constantinople. As the remains of Sardica were still included within the limits of the empire, it was incumbent on the Romans to exercise the duties of hospitality. They provided, with the assistance of the provincials, a sufficient number of sheep and oxen, and invited the Huns to a splendid or at least a plentiful supper. But the harmony of the entertainment was soon disturbed by mutual prejudice and indiscretion. The greatness of the emperor and the empire was warmly maintained by their ministers. The Huns, with equal ardor, asserted the superiority of their victorious monarch. The dispute was inflamed by the rash and unseasonable flattery of Vigilius who passionately rejected the comparison of a mere mortal with the divine Theodosius. And it was with extreme difficulty that Maximin and Priscus were able to divert the conversation or to soothe the angry minds of the barbarians. When they rose from the table, the imperial ambassador presented Edicon and Orestes with rich gifts of silk robes and Indian pearls, which they thankfully accepted. Yet Orestes could not forbear insinuating that he had not always been treated with such respect and liberality, 
and the offensive distinction which was implied between his civil office and the hereditary rank of his colleague seems to have made Edicon a doubtful friend and Orestes an irreconcilable enemy. After this entertainment, they traveled about 100 miles from Sardica to Nessus, that flourishing city which had given birth to the great Constantine was leveled with the ground. The inhabitants were destroyed or dispersed, and the appearance of some sick persons who were still permitted to exist among the ruins of the churches served only to increase the horror of the prospect. The surface of the country was covered with the bones of the slain, and the ambassadors who directed their course to the northwest were obliged to pass the hills of modern Servia before they descended into the flat and marshy grounds which are terminated by the Danube. The Huns were masters of the great river. Their navigation was performed in large canoes hollowed out of the trunk of a single tree. The ministers of Theodosius were safely landed on the opposite bank and their barbarian associates immediately hastened to the camp of Attila, which was equally prepared for the amusements of hunting or of war. No sooner had Maximin advanced about two miles from the Danube than he began to experience the fastidious insolence of the conqueror. He was sternly forbidden to pitch his tents in a pleasant valley, lest he should infringe the distant awe that was due to the royal mansion. The ministers of Attila pressed him to communicate the business and the instructions which he reserved for the ear of their sovereign. When Maximin temperately urged the contrary practice of nations, he was still more confounded to find that the resolutions of the sacred consistory, those secrets, says Priscus, which should not be revealed to the gods themselves, had been treacherously disclosed to the public enemy. On his refusal to comply with such ignominious terms, the imperial envoy was commanded instantly to depart. The order was recalled, it was again repeated, and the Huns renewed their ineffectual attempts to subdue the patient firmness of Maximin. At length, by the intercession of Scotta, the brother of Onegesius, whose friendship had been purchased by a liberal gift, he was admitted to the royal presence, but instead of obtaining a decisive answer, he was compelled to undertake a remote journey toward the north that Attila might enjoy the proud satisfaction of receiving, in the same camp, the ambassadors of the eastern and western empires. His journey was regulated by the guides who obliged him to halt to hasten his march, or to deviate from the common road, as it best suited the convenience of the king. The Romans, who traversed the plains of Hungary, supposed that they passed several navigable rivers, either in canoes or portable boats, but there is reason to suspect that the winding stream of the Tais or Tibiscus, might present itself in different places under different names. From the contiguous villages they received a plentiful and regular supply of provisions, mead instead of wine, millet in the place of bread, and a certain liquor named camus, which, according to the report of Priscus, was distilled from barley. Such fare might appear coarse and indelicate to men who had tasted the luxury of Constantinople but in their accidental distress they were relieved by the gentleness and hospitality of the same barbarians, so terrible and so merciless in war. The ambassadors had encamped on the edge of a large morass. A violent tempest of wind and rain, of thunder and lightning, overturned their tents, immersed their baggage and furniture in the water, and scattered their retinue, who wandered in the darkness of the night uncertain of their road, and apprehensive of some unknown danger, till they awakened by their cries the inhabitants of a neighboring village, the property of the widow of Bleda. A bright illumination, and in a few moments a comfortable fire of reeds, was kindled by their officious benevolence. The wants and even the desires of the Romans were liberally satisfied 
and they seem to have been embarrassed by the singular politeness of Bleda's widow, who added to her other favors the gift, or at least the loan, of a sufficient number of beautiful and obsequious damsels. The sunshine of the succeeding day was dedicated to repose, to collect and dry the baggage, and to the refreshment of the men and horses. But in the evening, before they pursued their journey, the ambassadors expressed their gratitude to the bounteous lady of the village by a very acceptable present of silver cups, red fleeces, dried fruits, and Indian pepper. Soon after this adventure, they rejoined the march of Attila, from whom they had been separated about six days, and slowly proceeded to the capital of an empire which did not contain, in the space of several thousand miles, a single city. As far as we may ascertain the vague and obscure geography of Priscus, this capital appears to have been seated between the Danube, the Tais, and the Carpathian hills in the plains of Upper Hungary, and most probably in the neighborhood of Jezberin, Agria, or Toke. In its origin it could be no more than an accidental camp, which, by the long and frequent residence of Attila, had insensibly swelled into a huge village for the reception of his court, of the troops who followed his person, and of the various multitude of idle or industrious slaves and retainers. The baths, constructed by Onegesius, were the only edifice of stone. The materials had been transported from Pannonia, and since the adjacent country was destitute even of large timber, it may be presumed that the meaner habitations of the royal village consisted of straw or mud or of canvas. The wooden houses of the more illustrious Huns were built and adorned with rude magnificence according to the rank, the fortune, or the taste of the proprietors. They seem to have been distributed with some degree of order and symmetry, and each spot became more honorable as it approached the person of the sovereign. The palace of Attila, which surpassed all other houses in his dominions, was built entirely of wood and covered an ample space of ground. The outward enclosure was a lofty wall or palisade of smooth square timber intersected with high towers but intended rather for ornament than defense. This wall, which seems to have encircled the declivity of the hill, comprehended a great variety of wooden edifices adapted to the uses of royalty. A separate house was assigned to each of the numerous wives of Attila, and instead of the rigid and illiberal confinement imposed by Asiatic jealousy, they politely admitted the Roman ambassadors to their presence, their table, and even to the freedom of an innocent embrace. When Maximin offered his presence to Circe, the principal queen, he admired the singular architecture of her mansion, the height of the round columns, the size and beauty of the wood, which was curiously shaped or turned, or polished or carved, and his attentive eye was able to discover some taste in the ornaments and some regularity in the proportions. After passing through the guards who watched before the gate, the ambassadors were introduced into the private apartment of Sars. The wife of Attila received their visit sitting, or rather lying, on a soft couch. The floor was covered with a carpet. The domestics formed a circle round the queen and her damsels seated on the ground were employed in working the variegated embroidery which adorned the dress of the barbaric warriors. The Huns were ambitious of displaying those riches which were the fruit and evidence of their victories. The trappings of their horses, their swords, and even their shoes were studded with gold and precious stones, and their tables were profusely spread with plates and goblets and vases of gold and silver which had been fashioned by the labor of Grecian artists. The monarch alone assumed the superior pride of still adhering to the simplicity of his Scythian ancestors. The dress of Attila, his arms, and the furniture of his house were plain, without ornament, and of a single color. The royal table was served in wooden cups and platters. 
Flesh was his only food, and the conqueror of the north never tasted the luxury of bread. When Attila first gave audience to the Roman ambassadors on the banks of the Danube, his tent was encompassed with a formidable guard. The monarch himself was seated in a wooden chair. His stern countenance, angry gestures, and impatient tone astonished the firmness of Maximin. But Vigilius had more reason to tremble, since he distinctly understood the menace, that if Attila did not respect the law of nations, he would nail the deceitful interpreter to the cross and leave his body to the vultures. The barbarian condescended by producing an accurate list to expose the bold falsehood of Vigilius, who had affirmed that no more than seventeen deserters could be found. But he arrogantly declared that he apprehended only the disgrace of contending with his fugitive slaves, since he despised their impotent efforts to defend the provinces which Theodosius had entrusted to their arms. For what fortress, added Attila, what city in the wide extent of the Roman Empire can hope to exist, secure and impregnable, if it is our pleasure that it should be erased from the earth? He dismissed, however, the interpreter, who returned to Constantinople with his peremptory demand of more complete restitution and a more splendid embassy. His anger gradually subsided, and his domestic satisfaction in a marriage which he celebrated on the road with the daughter of Eslam might perhaps contribute to mollify the native fierceness of his temper. The entrance of Attila into the royal village was marked by a very singular ceremony. A numerous troop of women came out to meet their hero and their king. They marched before him, distributed into long and regular files. The intervals between the files were filled by white veils of thin linen, which the women on either side bore aloft in their hands, and which formed a canopy for a chorus of young virgins who chanted hymns and songs in the Scythian language. The wife of his favorite Onegesius, with a train of female attendants, saluted Attila at the door of her own house on his way to the palace, and offered, according to the custom of the country, her respectful homage by entreating him to taste the wine and meat which she had prepared for his reception. As soon as the monarch had graciously accepted her hospitable gift, his domestics lifted a small silver table to a convenient height as he sat on horseback, and Attila, when he had touched the goblet with his lips, again saluted the wife of Onegesius and continued his march. During his residence at the seat of empire, his hours were not wasted in the recluse idleness of a seraglio and the king of the Huns could maintain his superior dignity without concealing his person from the public view. He frequently assembled his council and gave audience to the ambassadors of the nations, and his people might appeal to the supreme tribunal which he held at stated times, and according to the eastern custom, before the principal gate of his wooden palace. The Romans, both of the East and of the West, were twice invited to the banquets, where Attila feasted with the princes and nobles of Scythia. Maximin and his colleagues were stopped on the threshold till they had made a devout libation to the health and prosperity of the king of the Huns, and were conducted, after this ceremony, to their respective seats in a spacious hall. The royal table and couch, covered with carpets and fine linen, was raised by several steps in the midst of the hall, and a son, an uncle, or perhaps a favorite king, were admitted to share the simple and homely repast of Attila. Two lines of small tables, each of which contained three or four guests, were ranged in order on either hand. The right was esteemed the most honorable, but the Romans ingenuously confess that they were placed on the left, and that Beric, an unknown chieftain, most probably of the Gothic race, preceded the representatives of Theodosius and Valentinian. The barbarian monarch received from his cup-bearer a goblet filled with wine, and courteously drank to the health of the most distinguished guest, 
who rose from his seat and expressed in the same manner his loyal and respectful vows. This ceremony was successively performed for all, or at least for the illustrious persons of the assembly, and a considerable time must have been consumed since it was thrice repeated as each course or service was placed on the table. But the wine still remained after the meat had been removed, and the Huns continued to indulge their intemperance long after the sober and decent ambassadors of the two empires had withdrawn themselves from the nocturnal banquet. Yet, before they retired, they enjoyed a singular opportunity of observing the manners of the nation in their convivial amusements. Two Scythians stood before the couch of Attila, and recited the verses which they had composed to celebrate his valor and his victories. A profound silence prevailed in the hall, and the attention of the guests was captivated by the vocal harmony which revived and perpetrated the memory of their own exploits. A martial ardor flashed from the eyes of the warriors who were impatient for battle, and the tears of the old men expressed their generous despair that they could no longer partake the danger and glory of the field. This entertainment, which might be considered as a school of military virtue, was succeeded by a farce that debased the dignity of human nature. A Moorish and a Scythian buffoon successively excited the mirth of the rude spectators by their deformed figure, ridiculous dress, antic gestures, absurd speeches, and the strange, unintelligible confusion of the Latin, the Gothic, and the Hunnic languages and the hall resounded with loud and licentious peals of laughter. In the midst of this intemperate riot, Attila alone, without a change of countenance, maintained his steadfast and inflexible gravity, which was never relaxed, except on the entrance of Ernak, the youngest of his sons. He embraced the boy with a smile of paternal tenderness, gently pinched him by the cheek, and betrayed a partial affection, which was justified by the assurance of his prophets that Ernak would be the future support of his family and empire. Two days afterward, the ambassadors received a second invitation, and they had reason to praise the politeness as well as the hospitality of Attila. The king of the Huns held a long and familiar conversation with Maximin, but his civility was interrupted by rude expressions and haughty reproaches, and he was provoked by a motive of interest to support with unbecoming zeal the private claims of his secretary Constantius. The emperor, said Attila, has long promised him a rich wife. Constantius must not be disappointed, nor should a Roman emperor deserve the name of liar. On the third day the ambassadors were dismissed, the freedom of several captives was granted for a moderate ransom to their pressing entreaties, and besides the royal presence they were permitted to accept from each of the Scythian nobles the honorable and useful gift of a horse. Maximin returned by the same road to Constantinople, and though he was involved in an accidental dispute with Beric, the new ambassador of Attila, he flattered himself that he had contributed, by the laborious journey, to confirm the peace and alliance of the two nations. But the Roman ambassador was ignorant of the treacherous design which had been concealed under the mask of the public faith. The surprise and satisfaction of Edicon, when he contemplated the splendor of Constantinople, had encouraged the interpreter Vigilius to procure for him a secret interview with the eunuch Chrysaphius, who governed the emperor and the empire. After some previous conversation and a mutual oath of secrecy, the eunuch, who had not from his own feelings or experience imbibed any exalted notions of ministerial virtue, ventured to propose the death of Attila as an important service, by which Edicon might deserve a liberal share of the wealth and luxury which he admired. The ambassador of the Huns listened to the tempting offer, and professed, with apparent zeal, his ability as well as readiness to execute the bloody deed. 
the design was communicated to the master of the offices, and the devout Theodosius consented to the assassination of his invincible enemy. But this perfidious conspiracy was defeated by the dissimulation or the repentance of Edicon, and though he might exaggerate his inward abhorrence for the treason, which he seemed to approve, he dexterously assumed the merit of an early and voluntary confession. If we now review the embassy of Maximin and the behavior of Attila, we must applaud the barbarian, who respected the laws of hospitality, and generously entertained and dismissed the minister of a prince who had conspired against his life. But the rashness of Vigilius will appear still more extraordinary, since he returned, conscious of his guilt and danger, to the royal camp, accompanied by his son, and carrying with him a weighty purse of gold, which the favorite eunuch had furnished, to satisfy the demands of Edicon, and to corrupt the fidelity of the guards. The interpreter was instantly seized and dragged before the tribunal of Attila, where he asserted his innocence with specious firmness, till the threat of inflicting instant death on his son extorted from him a sincere discovery of the criminal transaction. Under the name of ransom or confiscation, the rapacious king of the Huns accepted two hundred pounds of gold for the life of a traitor whom he disdained to punish. He pointed his just indignation against a nobler object. His ambassadors, Eslaw and Orestes, were immediately dispatched to Constantinople with a peremptory instruction which it was much safer for them to execute than to disobey. They boldly entered the imperial presence with the fatal purse hanging down from the neck of Orestes, who interrogated the eunuch Chrysaphius as he stood beside the throne whether he recognized the evidence of his guilt. But the office of reproof was reserved for the superior dignity of his colleague Eslaw, who gravely addressed the emperor of the East in the following words, Theodosius is the son of an illustrious and respectable parent, Attila, likewise, is descended from a noble race, and he has supported by his actions the dignity which he inherited from his father, Manzuk. But Theodosius has forfeited his paternal honors, and by consenting to pay tribute, has degraded himself to the condition of a slave. It is therefore just that he should reverence the man whom fortune and merit have placed above him, instead of attempting, like a wicked slave, clandestinely to conspire against his master. The son of Arcadius, who was accustomed only to the voice of flattery, heard with astonishment the severe language of truth. He blushed and trembled, nor did he presume directly to refuse the head of Chrysaphius, which Eslaw and Orestes were instructed to demand. A solemn embassy, armed with full powers and magnificent gifts, was hastily sent to deprecate the wrath of Attila, and his pride was gratified by the choice of Nomius and Anatolius, two ministers of consular or patrician rank, of whom the one was great treasurer, and the other was master general of the armies of the East. He condescended to meet these ambassadors on the banks of the river Drenko, and though he at first affected a stern and haughty demeanor, his anger was insensibly mollified by their eloquence and liberality. He condescended to pardon the emperor, the eunuch, and the interpreter, bound himself by an oath to observe the conditions of peace, released a great number of captives, abandoned the fugitives and deserters to their fate, and resigned a large territory to the south of the Danube, which he had already exhausted of its wealth and inhabitants. But this treaty was purchased at an expense which might have supported a vigorous and successful war, and the subjects of Theodosius were compelled to redeem the safety of a worthless favorite by oppressive taxes which they would more cheerfully have paid for his destruction. End of Section 4, Part 2「Section 5 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rositer Johnson, and John Rudd. The English Conquest of Britain, A.D. 449-579. to By John R. Green. If we look for the fatherland of the English race, we must, as modern historians have clearly shown, direct our search far away from England herself. In the 5th century of the Christian era, a region in what is now called Schleswig was known by the name of Anglen, but the inhabitants of this district are believed to have comprised only a small detached portion of the Ingle, while the great body of this people probably dwelt within the limits of the present Oldenburg and Lower Hanover. On several sides of Anglin were the homes of various tribes of Saxons and Jutes. And these peoples were all kindred, being members of one branch, Low German, of the Teutonic family. History first finds them becoming united through community of blood, of language, institutions, and customs. Although it was too early yet, to justify the historian in giving to them the inclusive name of Englishmen. They all, however, had a part in the conquest of England, and it was their union in that land that gave birth to the English people. Little is known of the actual character and life of these people who made the earliest England, but their Germanic inheritance is traceable in their social and political framework, which already prefigured the national organization that through centuries of gradual development became modern England. Out of the early modes grew the forms of English citizenship and legislation, and the individual and public freedom, which has slowly broadened down from generation to generation. Later came the modifying, if not transforming, influence of Christianity, replacing the ancient nature worship, which they took with them to their new home. On these foundations, the English race, as it has grown up in the land they made their own, and in other lands to which like men and institutions have been carried, has reared its various structures of nationality. Of the three English tribes, the Saxons lay nearest to the empire, and they were naturally the first to touch the Roman world. Before the close of the third century, indeed, their boats appeared in such force in the English Channel as to call for a special fleet to resist them. The piracy of our fathers had thus brought them to the shores of a land which, dear as it is now to Englishmen, has not as yet been trodden by English feet. This land was Britain. When the Saxon boats touched its coast, the island was the westernmost province of the Roman Empire. In the 55th year before Christ, a descent of Julius Caesar revealed it to the Roman world. And a century after Caesar's landing, the Emperor Claudius undertook its conquest. The work was swiftly carried out. Before 30 years were over, the bulk of the island had passed beneath the Roman sway, and the Roman frontier had been carried out to the Firths of Forth and of Clyde. The work of civilization followed fast on the work of the sword. To the last, indeed, the distance of the island from the seat of empire left her less Romanized than any other province of the West. The bulk of the population scattered over the country seem, in spite of imperial edicts, to have clung to their old law as to their old language, and to have retained some traditional allegiance to their native chiefs. But Roman civilization rested mainly on citizen life, and in Britain as elsewhere, the city was thoroughly Roman. In towns such as Lincoln or York, governed by their own municipal officers, guarded by massive walls and linked together by a network of magnificent roads which reached from one end of the island to the other, manners, language, political life, all were of Rome. For 300 years, the Roman sword secured order and peace without Britain and within. And with peace and order came a wide and rapid prosperity. Commerce sprang up in ports among which London held the first rank. Agriculture flourished till Britain became one of the corn exporting countries of the world. The mineral resources of the province were explored in the tin mines of Cornwall, the lead mines of Somerset or Northumberland, and the iron mines of the Forest of Dean. But evils which sapped the strength of the whole empire 
told at last on the province of Britain. Wealth and population alike declined under a crushing system of taxation, under restrictions which fettered industry, under a despotism which crushed out all local independence. And with decay within came danger from without. For centuries past, the Roman frontier had held back the barbaric world beyond it, the Parthian of the Euphrates, the Numidian of the African desert, the German of the Danube or the Rhine. In Britain, a wall drawn from Newcastle to Carlisle bridled the British tribes, the Picts as they were called, who had been sheltered from Roman conquest by the fastness of the highlands. It was this mass of savage barbarism which broke upon the empire as it sank into decay. In its western dominions, the triumph of these assailants was complete. The Franks conquered and colonized Gaul. The West Goths conquered and colonized Spain. The Vandals founded a kingdom in Africa. The Burgundians encamped in the borderland between Italy and the Rome. The East Goths ruled at last in Italy itself. It was to defend Italy against the Goths that Rome in the opening of the fifth century withdrew her legions from Britain. And from that moment, the province was left to struggle unaided against the Picts. Nor were these its only enemies. While marauders from Ireland, whose inhabitants then bore the name of Scots, harried the West, the boats of Saxon pirates, as we have seen, were swarming off its eastern and southern coasts. For 40 years, Britain held bravely out against these assailants, but civil strife broke its powers of resistance, and its rulers fell back at last on the fatal policy by which the empire invited its doom, while striving to avert it, the policy of matching barbarian against barbarian. By the usual promises of land and pay, a band of warriors was drawn from this purpose from Jutland in 449 with two eldermen, Hengist and Horsa at their head. If by English history we mean the history of Englishmen in the land from which that time they made their own, it is with this landing of Hengist's warband that English history begins. They landed on the shores of the Isle of Thanet, at a spot known since as Ebbsfleet. No spot can be so sacred to Englishmen as the spot which first felt the tread of English feet. There is little to catch the eye in Ebbsfleet itself a mere lift of ground with a few great cottages dotted over it, cut off nowadays from the sea by a reclaimed meadow and a seawall. But taken as a whole, the scene has a wild beauty of its own. To the right, the white curve of Ramsgate Cliffs looks down on the crescent of Pegwell Bay. Far away to the left, across grey marsh levels where smoke wreaths mark the site of Richborough and Sandwich, the coastline trends dimly toward Deal. Everything in the character of the spot confirms the national tradition which fixed here the landing place of our fathers. For the physical changes of the country since the 5th century have told little on its main features. At the time of Hengist's landing, a broad inlet of sea parted Thanet from the mainland of Britain. And through this inlet, the pirate boats would naturally come sailing with a fair wind to what was then the gravel spit of Ebbsfleet. The work for which the mercenaries had been hired was quickly done, and the Picts are said to have been scattered to the winds in a battle fought on the eastern coast of Britain. But danger from the Pict was hardly over when danger came from the Jutes themselves. Their fellow pirates must have flocked from the channel to their settlement in Thanet. The inlet between Thanet and the mainland was crossed, and the Englishmen won their first victory over the Britons enforcing their passage of the Medway at the village of Aylesford. A second defeat at the passage of the Cray drove the British forces in terror upon London, but the ground was soon won back again, and it was not until 465 that a series of petty conflicts, which had gone along the shores of Tanit, made way for a decisive struggle at Whippet's fleet. Here, however, the overthrow was so terrible that from this moment all hope of saving northern Kent seemed to have been abandoned and it was only on its southern shore that the Britons held their ground. Ten years later, in 475, the long contest was over, and with the fall of Lyna, whose broken walls looked from the slope to which they clung over the great flat of Romney Marsh, the work of the first English conqueror was done. 
The warriors of Hengist had been drawn from the Jutes, the smallest of the three tribes, who were to blend in the English people. But the greed of the plunder now told on the great tribe, which stretched from the Elbe to the Rhine. And in 477, Saxon invaders were seen pushing slowly along the strip of land which lay westward of Kent between the Weald and the sea. Nowhere has the physical aspect of the country more utterly changed. A vast sheet of scrub, woodland, and waste, which then bore the name of the Andred's Weald, stretched for more than a hundred miles from the borders of Kent to the Hampshire Downs, extending northward almost to the Thames, and leaving only a thin strip of coast, which now bears the name of Sussex, between its southern edge and the sea. This coast was guarded by a fortress, which occupied the spot now called Pevensey, the future landing place of the Norman conqueror, and the fall of this fortress of Anderida in 491 established the kingdom of the South Saxons. Ela and Sissa beset Anderida, so ran the pitiless record of the conquerors, and slew all that were therein, nor was there afterward one Briton left. But Hengist and Ella's men had touched hardly more than the coast, and the true conquest of southern Britain was reserved for a fresh band of Saxons, a tribe known as the Govises, who landed under Cerdric and Cynric on the shores of the Southampton Water, and pushed in 495 to the Great Downs, or Gwent, where Winchester offered so rich a prize. Nowhere was the strife fiercer than here, and it was not until 519 that a decisive victory at Chartford ended the struggle for the Gwent and set the crown of the West Saxons on the head of Cerdic. But the forest belt around it checked any further advance, and only a year after Sharford, the Britons rallied under a new leader, Arthur, and threw back the invaders as they pressed westward through the Dorsetshire woodlands in a great overthrow at Bradbury or Mount Baden. The defeat was followed by a long pause in the Saxon advance from the southern coast. But while the Gavises rested, a series of victories, whose history is lost, was given to men of the same Saxon tribe, a coast district north of the mouth of the Thames. It is probable, however, that the strength of Camelodunum, the predecessor of our modern Colchester, made the progress of these assailants a slow and doubtful one. And even when its reduction enabled the East Saxons to occupy the territory, to which they have given their name of Essex, a line of woodland, which has left its traces in Epping and Heinold forests, checked their farther advance into the island. Though 70 years had passed since the victory of Ellsford, only the outskirts of Britain were won. The invaders were masters, as yet, but of Kent, Sussex, Hampshire, and Essex. From London to St. David's Head, from the Andredsfield to the Firth of Forth, the country still remained unconquered. And there was little in the years which followed Arthur's triumph to herald that onset of the invaders, which was soon to make Britain England. Till now its assailants have been drawn from two only of the three tribes whom we saw dwelling by the Northern Sea, from the Saxons and the Jutes. But the main work of conquest was to be done by the third, by the tribe which bore that name of Angle, or Englishman, which was to absorb that of Saxon or Jute and to stamp itself on the people which sprang from the union of the conquerors as on the land that they won. The Angle had probably been settling for years along the coast of Northumbria and in the great district which was cut off from the rest of Britain by the Wash and the Fens, the later East Angle. But it was not until the moment we have reached that the line of defenses which had hitherto held the invaders at bay was turned by their appearance in the Humber and the Trent. The great river line led like a highway into the heart of Britain, and civil strife seems to have broken the strength of British resistance. But of the incidents of this final struggle we know nothing. One part of the English force marched from the Humber over the Yorkshire walls to found what was called the Kingdom of the Dirans. Under the Empire, political power had centered in the district between the Humber and the Roman Wall. York was the capital of Roman Britain. Villas of rich landowners studded the Valley of Us, and the bulk of the garrison maintained in the island lay camped along the northern border. 
but no record tells of how Yorkshire was won or how the Angle made themselves masters of the uplands about Lincoln. It is only by the later settlements that we follow their march into the heart of Britain. Seizing the valley of the Don and whatever breaks there were in the woodland that then filled the space between the Humber and the Trent, the Ingle followed the curve of the latter river and struck along the line of its tributary, the Soar. Here, round the Roman Rite, the predecessor of our Leicester settled a tribe known as the Middle English, while a small body pushed farther southward and under the name of South Ingle, occupied the Ulytic upland that forms our present Northamptonshire. But the mass of the invaders seem to have held to the line of the Trent and to have pushed westward to its headwaters. Repton, Lichfield, and Tamworth mark the country of these Western Englishmen whose older name was soon lost in that of Mercians or Men of the March. Their settlement was in fact a new march or borderland between conqueror and conquered. For here, the impenetrable fastness of the peak, the massive Canuck chase, and the broken country of Staffordshire enabled the Briton to make a fresh and desperate stand. It was probably this conquest of Mid-Britain by the Engle that roused the West Saxons to a new advance. For 30 years, they had rested inactive within the limits of the Gwent. But in 552, their capture of the hill fort of Old Sarum threw open the reaches of the wheelchair downs, and a march of King Cutwulf of the Thames made them masters in 571 of the districts which now form Oxfordshire and Berkshire. Pushing along the upper valley of Avon to a new battle at Barbary Hill, they swooped at last from the uplands of the rich prey that lay along the Severn, Gloucester, Chirinchester, and Bath, cities which had leagued under the British kings to resist this onset, became in 577 the spoil of an English victory at Deerham. And the line of the Great Western River lay open to the arms of the conquerors. Once the West Saxons penetrated to the borders of Chester and Uriconium, a town beside the Reckon, which had been recently brought against to light, went up in flames. The raid ended in a crushing defeat which broke the West Saxon strength. But a British poet in verses, still left to us, sings piteously the death songs of Iriconium, the white town in the valley, the town of white stone gleaming among the green woodlands. The torch of the foe had left it a heap of blackened ruins where the singer wandered through the halls he had known in happier days the halls of its chief kindling. Without fire, without light, without song, their stillness broken only by the eagle's scream. The eagle, who has swallowed fresh drink, heart's blood of kindling, the fair. With the victory of Deerham, the conquest of the bulk of Britain was complete. Eastward of a line which may be roughly drawn along the moorlands of Northumberland and Yorkshire, through Derbyshire and the forest of Arden to the lower Severn and thence to Mendip to the sea. The island had passed into English hands. Britain had in the main become England. And within this new England, a Teutonic society was settled on the wreck of Rome. So far as the conquest had yet gone, it had been complete. Not a Briton remained as subject or slave on English ground. Sullenly, inch by inch, the beaten men drew back from the land from which their conquerors had won, and eastward of the borderline which the English sword had drawn, all was now purely English. End of section 5. Section 6 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosa to Johnson, and John Rudd. The English Conquest of Britain, A.D. 449-579. to Charles Knight. They, the Romans, says Bede, resided within the rampart that Severus made across the island on the south side of it. As the cities, temples, bridges, 
and paved ways do testify to this day. On the north of the wall were the nations that no severity had reduced to subjection and no resistance could restrain from plunder. At the extreme west of England were the people of Cornwall, or Little Wales, as it was called, having the most intimate relations with the people of Britannia Secunda, or Wales, and both connected with the colony of Amorica. The inhabitants of Cornwall and Wales, we may assume, were almost exclusively of the old British stock. The abandonment of the country by the Romans had affected them far less than that change affected the more cultivated country that had been the earliest subdued, and for nearly four centuries had received the Roman institutions and adopted the Roman customs. But in the chief portion of the island, from the southern and eastern coasts to the Tyne and the Solway, there was a mixed population, among whom it would be difficult to trace that common bond which would constitute nationality. The British families of the interior had become mingled with the settlers of Rome and its tributaries to whom grants of land had been assigned as the rewards of military service. And the coasts from the Humber to the Exa had been here and there peopled with northern settlers who had gradually planted themselves among the Romanized British and were, we may well believe, among the most active of those who carried forward the commercial intercourse of Britain with Gaul and Italy. When, therefore, we approach the period of what is termed the Saxon invasion and hear of the decay, the feebleness, the cowardice, and the misery of the Britons, all which attributes have been somewhat too readily bestowed upon the population which the Romans had left behind, it would be well to consider what these so-called Britons really were to enable us properly to understand the transition state through which the country passed. Our first native historian, Skildas, who lived in the middle of the 6th century, from the early part of the 5th century, when the Greek and Roman writers ceased to notice the affairs of Britain, his narrative, on whatever authority it may have been founded, has been adopted without question by Bede, and succeeding authors, and accepted, notwithstanding its barrenness of facts and pompous obscurity, by all but general consent, as the basis of early English history. Gibbon had justly pointed out his inconsistencies, his florid descriptions, of the flourishing condition of agriculture and commerce after the departure of the Romans, and his denunciations of the luxury of the people, when he, at the same time, described a race who were ignorant of the arts, incapable of building walls of defense or arming themselves with proper weapons. When this monk, as Gibbon calls him, who in the profound ignorance of human life presumes to exercise the office of historian, tells us that the Romans, who were occasionally called into aid against the Picts and Scots, gave energetic counsel to the timorous natives, and leave them patterns by which to manufacture arms. We seem to be reading an account of some remote tribe to whom the Roman sword and buckler was as unfamiliar as the musket was to the Otaheitans when Cook first went among them. When Gildas describes the soldiers on the wall as equally slow to fight and ill-adapted to run away, he tells the remarkable incident which forms part of every schoolboy's belief that the defenders of the wall were pulled down by great hooked weapons and dashed against the ground. We feel a pity, akin to contempt, for a people so stupid and passive, and are not altogether sorry that the Picts and Scots, differing one from another in manners but inspired with the same avidity for blood, had come with their bushy beards and their half-clothed bodies to supplant so effeminate a race. When he makes the feeble people send an embassy to a Roman in Gaul to say, the barbarians drive us to the sea, the sea throws us back on the barbarians, thus two modes of death await us, we are either slain or drowned. We must wonder at the very straitened limits in which this unhappy people were shut up. Surely much of this is little more than the tumid rhetoric of the cloister, for all the assumptions that have been raised of the physical degeneracy of the people are quite unsupported by any real historical evidence. 
Monsieur Guizot considers it unjust and cruel to view their humble supplications, so declared by Gildas, to Rome for aid, as evidences of that effeminacy of that nation, whose resistance to the Saxons has given a chapter to history at a time when history has few traces of Italians, Spaniards, and Gauls. That the representations of Gildas could only be partially true, as applied to some particular districts, is sufficiently proved by the undoubted fact that within little more than 20 years from the date of those cowardly demonstrations, Anthemius, the emperor, solicited the aid of the Britons against the Visigoths, and 12,000 men from this island under one of the native chieftains, Riothemus, sailed up the Loire and fought under the Roman command. They are described by a contemporary Roman writer as quick, well-armed, turbulent, and contumacious for their bravery, their numbers, and their common agreement. These were not the people who were likely to have stood upon a wall to be pulled down by hook weapons. They might have been the people who had clung, more than the other inhabitants of the Roman provinces, to their original language and customs. But it is not improbable that they would have been of the mixed races with whom Rome had been in more intimate relations, and to whom she continued to render offices of friendship after the separation of the island province from her empire. Amid all this conflict of testimony, there is the undoubted fact that out of the Roman municipal institutions had risen the establishment of separate sovereignties, as Procopius relates. Britain, according to St. Jerome, was a province fertile in tyrants. The Roman municipal government was kept compact and uniform under a great centralizing power. It fell to pieces here, as in Gaul, when that power was withdrawn. It resolved itself into a number of local governments without any principle of cohesion. Vicar of Municipium became an independent ruler and head of a little republic, and that his authority was contested by some who had partaken of his delegated dignity may be reasonably inferred. The difference of races would also promote the contests for command. If East Anglia contained a preponderance of one race of settlers and Kent and Sussex of another, they might well quarrel for supremacy. But when all the settlers on the Saxon shore had lost the control and protection of the Count who once governed them, it may also be imagined that the more exclusively British districts would not readily cooperate for defense with those who were more strange to their kindred even than the Roman. All the European continent was in a state of political dislocation, and we may safely conclude that when the great power was shattered, that had so long held the government of the world, the more distant and subordinate branch of its empire would resolve itself into some of the separate elements of authority and of imperfect obedience by which a clan is distinguished from a nation. Nor was the power of the Christian church in Britain of a more united character than that of the civil rulers. No doubt a church had been formed and organized. There were bishops, so-called, in several cities. But their authority was little concentrated, and their tenets were discordant. Pilgrimages were even made to the sacred places of Palestine, and at a very early period, monasteries were founded. That of Bangor, with a great circle, seemed to have some relation to the ancient Druidical worship, upon which it was probably engrafted in that region where Druidism had long flourished. There were British versions of the Bible, but that the church had no sustaining power at the period when civil society was so wholly disorganized may be inferred from circumstances which preceded the complete overthrow of Christian rites by Saxon heathendom. Bede devotes several chapters of his ecclesiastical history to the actions of St. Germanus, who came expressly to Britain to put down the Pelagian heresy and amid the multitude of miraculous circumstances, records how the authors of the perverse notions lay hid, and, like the evil spirits, grieved for the loss of the people that was rescued from them. At length, after mature deliberation, they had the boldness to enter the lists, and appeared, being conspicuous for riches, 
glittering in apparel and supported by the flatteries of many. The people, according to B, were the judges of this great controversy and gave their voice for the orthodox belief. Whether the Pelagians were expelled from Britain by reason or by force, it is evident that in the middle of the fifth century, there was a strong element of religious disunion, very generally prevailing, and that at a period when the congregations were in a great degree independent of each other, and therefore difficult of subjection to a common authority, the rich and the powerful had adopted a creed, which was opposed to the centralizing rule of the Roman church and were arguing about points of faith as strongly as they were contesting for world supremacy. Dr. Lappenberg justly points out this celebrated controversy in our country as indicating the weakness of that religious connection which was soon to be totally annihilated. We may in some degree account for the reception of the doctrine of Pelagius by knowing that he was a Briton whose plain, unlatinized name was Morgan. Macaulay had startled many a reader of the most familiar histories of England in saying Hengist and Horsta, Vortigern and Rovena, Arthur and Mordred are mythical persons whose very existence may be questioned and whose adventures must be classed with those of Hercules and Romulus. It is difficult to write of a period of which the same writer has said an age of fable completely separates two ages of truth. Yet no one knew better than this accomplished historian himself that an age of fable and an age of truth cannot be distinguished with absolute precision. It is not that what is presented to us through the haze of tradition must necessarily be unreal, any more than that what comes to us in an age of literature must be absolutely true. An historical fact, a real personage, may be handed down from a remote age in the songs of bards. But it is not therefore to be inferred that these national lyrics are founded upon pure invention. It is curious to observe that wandering amid these traces of events and persons that have been shaped into history, how ready we are to walk into the footsteps of some half fabulous records and wholly turn away from others which seem as strongly impressed upon the shifting sands of national existence. We derive Hengist and Horsa from the old Anglo-Saxon authorities, and modern history generally adopts them. Arthur and Mordred have a Celtic origin, and they are as generally rejected as mythical persons. It appears to us that it is a precipitate wholly to renounce the one as the other, because they are both surrounded with an atmosphere of the fabulous. Hengist and Horsa come to us encompassed with Gothic traditions, that belong to other nations. Arthur presents himself with his attributes of the magician Merlin and the Knights of the Round Table. But are we therefore to deny altogether their historical existence? In following the ignis fatuus of tradition, the credulous analysts of the monastic age were lost in the treacherous ground over which it led them. The more patient research of a critical age sees in that doubtful light a friendly warning of what to avoid, and hence a guide to more stable pathways. Hengist and Horsa, who according to the Anglo-Saxon historians landed in the year 449 on the shore which is called Ebb's Fleet, were personages of more than common mark. They were the sons of Wickgils, Wickgils son of Witta, Witta of Wecta, Wecta of Woden. So says the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, and adds from this Woden sprang all our royal families. These descendants in the third generation from the great Saxon divinity came over in three boats. They came by invitation of Wertgeon, Vortigern, king of the Britons. The king gave them land in the southeast of the country on condition that they should fight against the Picts. And they did fight and had the victory wheresoever they came. And then they sent for the Angles and told them of the worthlessness of the people and the excellence of the land. This is the Saxon narrative. The seductive graces of Rowena, the daughter of Horsa, who corrupted the king of the Britons by love and wine, is an embellishment of the British traditions. Then came the great battles for possession of the land. At Aylesford and Crayford, the Kentish Britons were overthrown. 
Before the Angles, the Welsh fled like fire. These events occupy a quarter of a century. While they are going on, the Roman Emperor, as we have mentioned upon indubitable authority, receives an auxiliary force of 12,000 men from Britain. We cannot rely upon narratives that tell us of the King of the Britons, when we learn from no suspicious sources that the land was governed by many separate chiefs, and which represent a petty band of fugitives as gaining mighty triumphs for a great ruler. Then subduing him themselves in a wonderfully short time. The pretensions of Hengist and Horsa to be the immediate descendants of Woden would seem to imply their mythical origin, but many Saxon chiefs of undoubted reality rested their pretensions upon a similar genealogy. The myth was as flattering to the Anglo-Saxon pride of descent as the corresponding myth that the ancient inhabitants of the island were descended from the Trojan brute was acceptable to the British race. But amid much of fable, there is the undoubted fact that Germanic tribes were gradually possessing themselves of the fairest parts of Britain, a progressive usurpation, far different from a sudden conquest. Amid the wreck of the social institutions left by Rome, when all that remained of a governing power was centered in the towns, it may be readily conceived that the rich districts of the eastern and southern coasts would be eagerly peopled by new settlers whose bond of society was founded upon the occupation of the land and who, extending the area of their occupation, would eventually come into hostile conflict with the previous possessors. For a century and a half, a thick darkness seemed to overspread the history of our country. In the Anglo-Saxon writers, we can trace little with any distinctness beyond the brief and monotonous records of victories and slaughters. Hengist and Ansk slew four troops of Britons with the edge of the sword. Hengist then vanishes, and Ella comes with his three sons. In 491, they besieged Andrischester and slew all that dwelt therein, so that not a single Breton was there left. Then comes Sergic and Sindric, his son, then Port and his two sons, and landed Portsmouth. And so we reach the 6th century. Sertic and Sinric now stand foremost among the slaughterers, and they establish the Kingdom of the West, Saxons, and conquer the Isle of Wight. In the middle of the century, Ida begins to reign, from who arose the royal race of Northumbria. In 565, Ethelbert succeeded to the Kingdom of the Kentish Men and held it 53 years. The war goes on in the South Midland counties, where Cuthwulf is fighting, and it reaches the districts of the Severn, where Cuthwine and Caelan slay great kings, and take Gloucester and Chirinchester and Bath. One of these fierce brethren is killed at last, and Caelan, having taken many spoils and towns innumerable, wrathful, returned to his own. Where his own was, we are not informed. We reach at length the year 596, when Pope Gregory sent Augustine to Britain with a great many monks, who preached the word of God to the nation of the Angles. Bede very judiciously omits all such details. He tells us that they carried on the conflagration from the eastern to the western sea without any opposition, and almost covered all the superficies of the perishing island. Public as well as private structures were overturned, the priests were everywhere slain before the altars. The prelates and the people, without any respect of persons, were destroyed with fire and sword. There is little to add to these impressive words, which no doubt contain the general truth. But if we open the British history of Geoffrey at Monmouth, we find ourselves relieved from the thick darkness of the Anglo-Saxon records by the blue lights and red lights of the most wondrous romance. Rowena comes with her golden wine cup. Merlin instructs Vortigern how to discover the two sleeping dragons who hindered the foundation of his tower. Aurelius, the Christian king, burns Vortigern and his Cambrian city of refuge. Eldal fights a duel with Hengist, cuts off his head, and destroys the Saxons without mercy. Merlin, the magician, and Utha Pendragon, with 15,000 men, bring over the giant's dance from Ireland and set it up in Salisbury Plain. Ruth of Pendragon has made the Christian king all over Britain. At length, we arrive at Arthur, the son of Uther. To him, the entire monarchy of Britain belonged by hereditary right. 
Howell sends him 15,000 men from Amorica, and he makes the Saxons his tributaries, and with his own hand kills 470 in one battle. He not only conquers the Saxons, but subdues Gaul, among other countries, and holds his court in Paris. His coronation at the City of the Legions, Caroleon, is gorgeous beyond all recorded magnificence, and the general state of the country in these days of Arthur, before the middle of the 6th century, is thus described. At that time, Britain had arrived at such a pitch of grandeur that in abundance of riches, luxury of ornaments, and politeness of inhabitants, it far surpassed all other kingdoms. Mordred, the wicked traitor, at length disturbs all this tranquility and grandeur, and brings over barbarous people from different countries. Arthur falls in battle, the Saxons prevail, and the Britons retire into Cornwall and Wales. Amid the bewildering mass of the obscure and the fabulous, which our history presents of the first century and a half of the Saxon colonization, there are some well-established facts which are borne out by subsequent investigations, such as Bede's account of the country of the invaders and the parts in which they settled. This account, compared with other authorities, gives us the following results. They consisted of the three most powerful nations of Germany, Saxons, Angles, and Jutes. The Saxons came from the parts which, in Bede's time, were called the country of the Old Saxons. That country is now known as the Duchy of Holstein. These, under Ella, founded the kingdom of the South Saxons, our present Sussex. Later in the fifth century, the same people, under Cerdic, established themselves in the district extending from Sussex to Devonshire and Cornwall, which is the kingdom of the West Saxons. Other Saxons settled in Essex and Middlesex. The Angles, says Bede, came from the country called Angeland, and it is said from that time to remain desert to this day. There is a part of the Duchy of Schleswig to the north of Holstein, which still bears the name of Angland. These people gave their name to the whole country, Englaland, or Angloland, from the greater extent of territory which they permanently occupied. As the Saxons possessed themselves of the southern coasts, the Angles established themselves on the northeastern. Their kingdom of East Anglia comprised Norfolk and Suffolk, as well as part of Cambridgeshire, and they extended themselves to the north of the Humber, forming the powerful state of Northumbria and carrying their dominion even to the Forth and the Clyde. The Jutes came from the country north of the Angles, which is in the upper part of the present Schleswig, and they occupied Kent and the Isle of Wight, with that part of the Hampshire which is opposite the island. Sir Francis Palgrave is of the opinion that the tribes by whom Britain was invaded appear principally to have proceeded from the country now called Friesland. For all of the continental dialects, the ancient Friesic is the one which approaches most nearly to the Anglo-Saxon of our ancestors. Mr. Craig has pointed out that the modern kingdom of Denmark comprehends all the districts from which issued, according to old accounts, the several tribes who invaded Britain upon the fall of the Roman Empire, and the Danes proper, who may be considered to represent the Jutes, the Angles, who lived between the Bight of Flensburg and the River Schley on the Baltic, the Friesians, who inhabit the islands along the west coast of Jutland, with a part of the bailiwick of Husum and Schleswig, and the Germans of Holstein, Bede's Old Saxons, are still all recognized by geographers and ethnographers as distant races. End of section 6. Section 7 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4, by Rossiter Johnson, Charles F. Horn, and John Rudd. Attila Invades Western Europe Battle of Chalon 
A.D. 451 by Sir Edward Creasy and Edward Gibbon After Attila had conquered and laid waste the provinces of the Eastern Empire south of the Danube and exacted heavy tribute from Theodosius II, he turned his attention to the subjugation of the Slavic and Germanic tribes, who still remained independent. These, with one exception, he overcame and placed under the sovereignty of his son. He laid claim to one half of the Western Empire as the betrothed husband of Valentinian's sister, Honoraria, from whom he had years before received the offer of her hand in marriage. In 451, with Genseric, king of the Vandals, for his ally, he invaded Gaul. Before his advance, the cities hastened to capitulate, and so complete was his devastation of the country that it came to be a saying that the grass never grew where his horses had trod. But in Aetius, their commander-in-chief under Valentinian III, the Romans had an able general who was aided by the West Gothic king Theodoric. The West Goths and the Franks, the former from the south, the latter from the north of Gaul joined him in large numbers, and the allied forces drove the Huns from the walls of Orléans, which he had besieged. From there he retreated to Chalon, where his westward movement was to receive its final check. This decisive event was, in the words of Herbert, the discomfiture of the mighty attempt of Attila to found a new anti-Christian dynasty upon the wreck of the temporal power of Rome at the end of the term of 1200 years, to which its duration had been limited by the forebodings of the heathen. Sir Edward Shepherd Creasy a broad expanse of plains, the Campi Catalonici of the ancients, spread far and wide around the city of Chalon in the northeast of France. The long rows of poplars, through which the river Marne winds its way, and a few thinly scattered villages are almost the only objects that vary the monotonous aspect of the greater part of this region but about five miles from Chalon, near the little hamlets of Chap and Cuperly, the ground is indented and heaped up in ranges of grassy mounds and trenches, which attest the work of man's hands in ages past, and which, to the practiced eye, demonstrate that this quiet spot has once been the fortified position of a huge military host, Local tradition gives to these ancient earthworks the name of Attila's camp, nor is there any reason to question the correctness of the title, or to doubt that beyond these very ramparts it was that fourteen hundred years ago the most powerful heathen king that ever ruled in Europe mustered the remnants of his vast army, which had striven on these plains against the Christian soldiery of Toulouse and Rome. Here it was that Attila prepared to resist to the death his victors in the field, and here he heaped up the treasures of his camp in one vast pile, which was to be his funeral pyre should his camp be stormed. It was here that the Gothic and Italian forces watched, but dared not assail their enemy in his despair, after that great and terrible day of battle when, the sound of conflict was o'erpassed, the shout of all, whom earth could send from her remotest bounds, heathen or faithful from thy hundred mouths, that feed the Caspian with Riffian snows, huge Volga from famed Hippanus, which once cradled the Hun from all the countless realms, between Emmaus and that utmost strand, where columns of Herculean rock confront the blown Atlantic. Roman, Goth, and Hun, and Scythian strength of chivalry, that tread the cold Caudadian shore, or what far lands inhospitable drink Cimmerinian floods, Franks, Saxons, Suevic, and Sarmatian chiefs, and who from Greek Armorica or Spain flocked to the work of death. 
The victory which the Roman general Aetius, with his Gothic allies, had then gained over the Huns, was the last victory of imperial Rome. But among the long fasti of her triumphs, few can be found that, for their importance and ultimate benefit to mankind, are comparable with this expiring effort of her arms. It did not indeed open to her any new career of conquest. It did not consolidate the relics of her power. It did not turn the rapid ebb of her fortunes. The mission of imperial Rome was, in truth, already accomplished. She had received and transmitted through her once ample dominion the civilization of Greece. She had broken up the barriers of narrow nationalities among the various states and tribes that dwelt around the coasts of the Mediterranean. She had fused these and many other races into one organized empire, bound together by a community of laws, of government, and institutions. Under the shelter of her full power, the true faith had arisen in the earth, and during the years of her decline it had been nourished to maturity. It had overspread all the provinces that ever obeyed her sway. For no beneficial purpose to mankind could the dominion of the seven-hilled city have been restored or prolonged. But it was all important to mankind what nations should divide among them Rome's rich inheritance of empire. Whether the Germanic and Gothic warriors should form states and kingdoms out of the fragments of her dominions and become the free members of the commonwealth of Christian Europe, or whether pagan savages from the wilds of Central Asia should crush the relics of classic civilization and the early institutions of the Christianized Germans in one hopeless chaos of barbaric conquest. The Christian Visigoths of King Theodoric fought and triumphed at Shalom side by side with the legions of Aetius. Their joint victory over the Hunnish host not only rescued for a time from destruction the old age of Rome, but preserved for centuries of power and glory the Germanic element in the civilization of modern Europe. In order to estimate the full importance to mankind of the Battle of Shalon, we must keep steadily in mind who and what the Germans were and the important distinctions between them and the numerous other races that assailed the Roman Empire. And it is to be understood that the Gothic and Scandinavian nations are included in the German race. Now, in two remarkable traits, the Germans differed from the Sarmatic as well as from the Slavic nations, and indeed from all those other races to whom the Greeks and Romans gave the designation of barbarians. I allude to their personal freedom and regard for the rights of men. Secondly, to the respect paid by them to the female sex, and the chastity for which the latter were celebrated among the people of the North. These were the foundations of that probity of character, self-respect, and purity of manners which may be traced among the Germans and Goths even during pagan times, and which, when their sentiments were enlightened by Christianity, brought out those splendid traits of character which distinguish the age of chivalry and romance. What the intermixture of the German stock with the classic at the fall of the Western Empire has done for mankind may be best felt by watching, with Arnold, over how large a portion of the earth the influence of the German element is now extended. It affects, more or less, the whole west of Europe, from the head of the Gulf of Bothnia to the most southern promontory of Sicily, from the Oder and the Adriatic to the Hebrides and to Lisbon. It is true that the language spoken over a large portion of this place is not predominantly German, but even in France and Italy and Spain, the influence of the Franks, Burgundians, Visigoths, 
Ostrogoths, and Lombards, while it has colored even the language, has in blood and institutions left its mark legibly and indelibly. Germany, the Low Countries, Switzerland, for the most part Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, and our own islands are all in language, in blood, and in institutions German most decidedly. But all South America is peopled with Spaniards and Portuguese, all North America and all Australia with Englishmen. I say nothing of the prospects and influence of the German race in Africa and in India. It is enough to say that half of Europe and all America and Australia are German, more or less completely, in race, in language, or in institutions, or in all. By the middle of the fifth century, Germanic nations had settled themselves in many of the fairest regions of the Roman Empire, had imposed their yoke on the provincials, and had undergone, to a considerable extent, that moral conquest which the arts and refinements of the vanquished in arms have so often achieved over the rough victor. The Visigoths held the north of Spain and Gaul south of the Loire. Franks, Alemanni, Alans, and Burgundians had established themselves in other Gallic provinces, and the Suevi were masters of a large southern portion of the Spanish peninsula. A king of the Vandals reigned in North Africa, and the Ostrogoths had firmly planted themselves in the provinces north of Italy. Of these powers and principalities, that of the Visigoths under their king Theodoric, son of Alaric, was by far the first in power and in civilization. The pressure of the Huns upon Europe had first been felt in the fourth century of our era. They had long been formidable to the Chinese Empire, but the ascendancy in arms which another nomadic tribe of Central Asia, the Sienpi, gained over them, drove the Huns from their Chinese conquest westward. And this movement, once being communicated to the whole chain of barbaric nations that dwelt northward of the Black Sea and the Roman Empire, tribe after tribe of savage warriors broke in upon the barriers of civilized Europe. The Huns crossed the Tanay into Europe in 375 and rapidly reduced to subjection the Alans, the Ostrogoths, and other tribes that were then dwelling along the course of the Danube. The armies of the Roman emperor that tried to check their progress were cut to pieces by them, and Pannonia and other provinces south of the Danube were speedily occupied by the victorious cavalry of these new invaders. Not merely the degenerate Romans, but the bold and hardy warriors of Germany and Scandinavia were appalled at the number, the ferocity, the ghastly appearance, and the lightning-like rapidity of the Huns. Strange and loathsome legends were coined and credited, which attributed their origin to the union of secret, black, and midnight hags with the evil spirits of the wilderness. Tribe after tribe and city after city fell before them. Then came a pause in their career of conquest in southwestern Europe, caused probably by dissensions among their chiefs, and also by their arms being employed in attacks upon the Scandinavian nations. But when Attila, or Atzel, as he is called in the Hungarian language, became their ruler, the torrent of their arms was directed with augmented terrors upon the west and the south, and their myriads marched beneath the guidance of one mastermind to the overthrow both of the new and the old powers of the earth. Recent events have thrown such a strong interest over everything connected with the Hungarian name that even the terrible renown of Attila now impresses us the more vividly through our sympathizing admiration of the exploits of those who claim to be descended from his warriors and ambitiously insert the name of Attila among their native kings. 
The authenticity of this martial genealogy is denied by some writers and questioned by more but it is at least certain that the Magyars of Arpad, who are the immediate ancestors of the bulk of the modern Hungarians, and who conquered the country which bears the name of Hungary in A.D. 889, were of the same stock of mankind as were the Huns of Attila, even if they did not belong to the same subdivision of that stock nor is there any improbability in the tradition that after Attila's death many of his warriors remained in Hungary, and that their descendants afterward joined the Huns of Arpad in their career of conquest. It is certain that Attila made Hungary the seat of his empire. It seems also susceptible of clear proof that the territory was then called Hungvar, and Attila's soldiers hung Vari. Both the Huns of Attila and those of Arpad came from the family of nomadic nations whose primitive regions were those vast wildernesses of high Asia which are included between the Altaic and the Himalayan mountain chains. The inroads of these tribes upon the lower regions of Asia and into Europe have caused many of the most remarkable revolutions in the history of the world. There is every reason to believe that swarms of these nations made their way into distant parts of the earth at periods long before the date of the Scythian invasion of Asia, which is the earliest inroad of the nomadic race that history records. The first, as far as we can conjecture, in respect to the time of their descent, were the Finnish and Ugrian tribes, who appear to have come down from the Altaic border of High Asia toward the northwest, in which direction they advanced to the Uralian mountains. There they established themselves, and that mountain chain, with its valleys and pasture lands, became to them a new country whence they set out colonies on every side. But the Ugrian colony, which, under Arpad, occupied Hungary and became the ancestors of the bulk of the present Hungarian nation, did not quit their settlements on the Uralian mountains till a very late period, and not until four centuries after the time when Attila led from the primary seats of the nomadic races in High Asia the host with which he advanced into the heart of France. That host was Turkish, but closely allied in origin, language, and habits with the Finno-Ugrian settlers on the Ural. Attila's fame has not come down to us through the partial and suspicious medium of chroniclers and poets of his own race. It is not from Hunnish authorities that we learn the extent of his might. It is from his enemies, from the literature and the legends of the nations whom he afflicted with his arms, that we draw the unquestionable evidence of his greatness. Besides the express narratives of Byzantine, Latin, and Gothic writers, we have the strongest proof of the stern reality of Attila's conquests in the extent to which he and his Huns have been the themes of the earliest German and Scandinavian lays. Wild as many of these legends are, they bear concurrent and certain testimony to the awe with which the memory of Attila was regarded by the bold warriors who composed and delighted in them. Attila's exploits and the wonders of his unearthly steed and magic sword repeatedly occur in the sagas of Norway and Iceland and the celebrated Nibelungenlied, the most ancient of Germanic poetry, is full of them. There Etzel, or Attila, is described as the wearer of twelve mighty crowns, and as promising to his bride the lands of thirty kings whom his irresistible sword had subdued. He is in fact the hero of the latter part of this remarkable poem, and it is at his capital city, at Selenburg, which evidently corresponds to the modern Buddha, that much of his action takes place. 
When we turn from the legendary to the historic Attila, we see clearly that he was not one of the vulgar herd of barbaric conquerors. Consummate military skill may be traced in his campaigns, and he relied far less on the brute force of armies for the aggrandizement of his empire than on the unbounded influence over the affections of friends and the fears of foes which his genius enabled him to acquire. Austerely sober in his private life, severely just on the judgment seat, conspicuous among a nation of warriors for hardihood, strength, and skill in every martial exercise, grave and deliberate in counsel, but rapid and remorseless in execution. He gave safety and security to all who were under his dominion, while he waged a warfare of extermination against all who opposed or sought to escape from it. He watched the national passions, the prejudices, the creeds, and the superstitions of the various nations over which he ruled, and of those which he sought to reduce beneath his sway. All these feelings he had the skill to turn to his own account. His own warriors believed him to be the inspired favorite of their deities, and followed him with fanatic zeal. His enemies looked on him as the pre-appointed minister of heaven's wrath against themselves, and though they believed not in his creed, their own made them tremble before him. In one of his early campaigns he appeared before his troops with an ancient iron sword in his grasp, which he told them was the god of war whom their ancestors had worshipped. It is certain that the nomadic tribes of northern Asia, whom Herodotus described under the name of Scythians, from the earliest times, worshipped as their god a bare sword. That sword god was supposed, in Attila's time, to have disappeared from earth, but the Hunnish king now claimed to have received it by special revelation. It was said that a herdsman, who was tracking in the desert a wounded heifer by the drops of blood, found the mysterious sword standing fixed in the ground, as if it had darted down from heaven. The herdsman bore it to Attila, who thenceforth was believed by the Huns to wield the spirit of death in battle, and their seers prophesied that that sword was to destroy the world. A Roman, who was on an embassy to the Hunnish camp, recorded in his memoirs Attila's acquisition of this supernatural weapon, and the immense influence over the minds of the barbaric tribes which its possession gave him. In the title which he assumed, we shall see the skill with which he availed himself of the legends and creeds of other nations as well as of his own. He designated himself Attila, descendant of the great Nimrod, nurtured in Engadi, by the grace of God, king of the Huns, the Goths, the Danes, and the Medes, the dread of the world. Herbert states that Attila is represented on an old medallion with a teraph or a head on his breast, and the same writer adds, we know from the Hematogenia of Prudentius that Nimrod, with a snaky-haired head, was the object of adoration of the heretical followers of Marcion, and the same head was the palladium set up by Antiochus Epiphanes over the gates of Antioch, though it has been called the visage of Sharon. The memory of Nimrod was certainly regarded with mystic veneration by many and by asserting himself to be the heir of that mighty hunter before the Lord, he vindicated to himself at least the whole Babylonian kingdom. The singular assertion in his style that he was nurtured in Engadi, where he certainly had never been, will be more easily understood on reference to the twelfth chapter of the Book of Revelation concerning the woman clothed with the sun who was to bring forth in the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, a man-child, who was to contend with the dragon having seven heads and ten horns and rule all nations with a rod of iron. 
This prophecy was at that time understood universally by the sincere Christians to refer to the birth of Constantine, who was to overwhelm the paganism of the city on the seven hills, and it is still so explained. But it is evident that the heathens must have looked on it in a different light, and have regarded it as a foretelling of the birth of that great one who should master the temporal power of Rome. The assertion, therefore, that he was nurtured in Engadi is a claim to be looked upon as that man-child who was to be brought forth in a place prepared of God in the wilderness. Engadi means a place of palms and vines in the desert. It was hard by Zoar, the city of refuge, which was saved in the Vale of Sidim, or demons, when the rest were destroyed by fire and brimstone from the Lord in heaven and might therefore be especially called a place prepared of God in the wilderness. It is obvious enough why he styled himself by the grace of God King of the Huns and Goths, and it seems far from difficult to see why he added the names of the Medes and the Danes. His armies had been engaged in warfare against the Persian kingdom of the Sassanidae, and it is certain that he mediated the invasion and overthrow of the Medo-Persian power. Probably some of the northern provinces of that kingdom had been compelled to pay him tribute, and this would account for his styling himself King of the Medes, they being his remotest subjects to the south. From a similar cause, he may have called himself King of the Danes, as his power may well have extended northward as far as the nearest of the Scandinavian nations. And this mention of Medes and Danes as his subjects would serve at once to indicate the vast extent of his dominion. The immense territory north of the Danube and Black Sea, and eastward of Caucasus, over which Attila ruled, first in conjunction with his brother Bleda, and afterward alone, cannot be very accurately defined, but it must have comprised within it, besides the Huns, many nations of Slavic, Gothic, Teutonic, and Finnish origin. South also of the Danube, the country from the river Sau as far as Novi in Thrace was a Hunnish province. Such was the empire of the Huns in A.D. 445, a memorable year in which Attila founded Buda on the Danube as his capital city, and rid himself of his brother by a crime which seems to have been prompted not only by selfish ambition, but also by a desire of turning to his purpose the legends and forebodings which then were universally spread throughout the Roman Empire and must have been well known to the watchful and ruthless Hun. The year 445 of our era completed the twelfth century from the foundation of Rome, according to the best chronologers. It had always been believed among the Romans that the twelve vultures, which were said to have appeared to Romulus when he founded this city, signified the time during which the Roman power should endure. The twelve vultures denoted twelve centuries. This interpretation of the vision of the birds of destiny was current among learned Romans, even when there were yet many of the twelve centuries to run, and while the imperial city was at the zenith of its power. But as the allotted time drew nearer and nearer to its conclusion, and as Rome grew weaker and weaker beneath the blows of barbaric invaders, the terrible omen was more and more talked and thought of, and in Attila's time men watched for the momentary extinction of the Roman state with the last beat of the last vulture's wing. Moreover, among the numerous legends connected with the foundation of the city and the fratricidal death of Remus, there was one most terrible one, which told that Romulus did not put his brother to death in accident or in hasty quarrel, but that he slew his gallant twin with inexpiable sin, deliberately and in compliance with the warnings of supernatural powers. 
the shedding of a brother's blood was believed to have been the price at which the founder of Rome had purchased from destiny her twelve centuries of existence. We may imagine, therefore, with what terror in this, the twelve hundredth year after the foundation of Rome, the inhabitants of the Roman Empire must have heard the tidings that the royal brethren, Attila and Bleda, had founded a new capital on the Danube, which was designed to take over the ancient capital on the Tiber, and that Attila, like Romulus, had consecrated the foundations of his new city by murdering his brother, so that for the new cycle of centuries then about to commence, dominion had been bought from the gloomy spirits of destiny in favor of the Hun by a sacrifice of equal awe and value with that which had formerly obtained it for the Roman. It is to be remembered that not only the pagans, but also the Christians of that age, knew and believed in these legends and omens. However they might differ as to the nature of the superhuman agency by which such mysteries had been made known to mankind. And we may observe with Herbert, a modern learned dignitary of our church, how remarkably this augury was fulfilled, for if to the twelve centuries denoted by the twelve vultures that appeared to Romulus, we add, for the six birds that appeared to Remus, six lustra, or periods of five years each, by which the Romans were wont to number their time, it brings us precisely to the year 476, in which the Roman Empire was finally extinguished by Odoacer. An attempt to assassinate Attila, made, or supposed to have been made, at the instigation of Theodoric the Younger, the Emperor of Constantinople, drew the Hunnish armies, in 445, upon the Eastern Empire, and delayed for a time the destined blow against Rome. Probably a more important cause of delay was the revolt of some of the Hunnish tribes to the north of the Black Sea against Attila, which broke out about this period, and is cursorily mentioned by the Byzantine writers. Attila quelled this revolt, and having thus consolidated his power, and having punished the presumption of the Eastern Roman Emperor by fearful ravages of his fairest provinces, Attila, in 450 A.D., prepared to set his vast forces in motion for the conquest of Western Europe. He sought unsuccessfully by diplomatic intrigues to detach the king of the Visigoths from his alliance with Rome, and he resolved first to crush the power of Theodoric, and then to advance with overwhelming power to trample out the last sparks of the doomed Roman Empire. A strange invitation from a Roman princess gave him a pretext for the war, and threw an air of chivalric enterprise over his invasion. Honoria, sister of Valentinian III, the Emperor of the West, had sent to Attila to offer him her hand and her supposed right to share in the imperial power. This had been discovered by the Romans, and Honoria had been forthwith closely imprisoned. Attila now pretended to take up arms in behalf of his self-promised bride, and proclaimed that he was about to march to Rome to redress Honoria's wrongs. Ambition and spite against her brother must have been the sole motives that led the lady to woo the royal Hun, for Attila's face and person had all the natural ugliness of his race and the description given of him by a Byzantine ambassador must have been well known in the imperial courts. Herbert has well versified the portrait drawn by Priscus of the great enemy of both Byzantium and Rome. Terrific was his semblance, in no mould of beautiful proportion cast, his limbs nothing exalted, but with sinews braced of Shalibian temper agile, lithe, and swifter than the roe, 
His ample chest was overbrowed by a gigantic head, with eyes keen, deeply sunk and small, that gleamed strangely in wrath as though some spirit unclean within that corporal tenement installed looked from its windows, but with tempered fire beamed mildly on the unresisting. Thin his beard and hoary, his flat nostrils crowned, a cicatrized, swart visage, but withal, that questionable shape such glory wore, that mortals quailed beneath him. Two chiefs of the Franks, who were then settled on the lower Rhine, were at this period engaged in a feud with each other, and while one of them appealed to the Romans for aid, the other invoked the assistance and protection of the Huns. Attila thus obtained an ally whose cooperation secured for him the passage of the Rhine, and it was this circumstance which caused him to take a northward route from Hungary for his attack upon Gaul. The muster of the Hunnish hosts was swollen by warriors of every tribe that they had subjugated nor is there any reason to suspect the old chroniclers of willful exaggeration in estimating Attila's army as seven hundred thousand strong. Having crossed the Rhine, probably a little below Koblenz, he defeated the king of the Burgundians, who endeavored to bar his progress. He then divided his vast forces into two armies, one of which marched northwest upon Tangres and Arras, and the other cities of that part of France, while the main body under Attila himself advanced up the Moselle, and destroyed Besançon and other towns in the country of the Burgundians. One of the latest and best biographers of Attila well observes that, having thus conquered the eastern part of France, Attila prepared for an invasion of the West Gothic territories beyond the Loire. He marched upon Orléans, where he intended to force the passage of that river, and only a little attention is a requisite to enable us to perceive that he proceeded on a systematic plan. He had his right wing on the north for the protection of his Frank allies, his left wing on the south for the purpose of preventing the Burgundians from rallying and of menacing the passes of the Alps from Italy and he led his center toward the chief object of the campaign, the conquest of Orléans, and an easy passage into the West Gothic dominion. The whole plan is very like that of the Allied powers in 1814, with this difference, that their left wing entered France through the defiles of the Jura, in the direction of Lyon, and that the military object of the campaign was the capture of Paris. It was not until the year 451 that the Huns commenced the siege of Orléans, and during their campaign in eastern Gaul, the Roman general Aetius had strenuously exerted himself in collecting and organizing such an army as might, when united to the soldiery of the Visigoths, be fit to face the Huns in the field. He enlisted every subject of the Roman Empire whom patriotism, courage, or compulsion could collect beneath the standards, and round these troops, which assumed the once proud title of the legions of Rome, he arrayed the large forces of barbaric auxiliaries, whom pay, persuasion, or the general hate and dread of the Huns brought to the camp of the last of the Roman generals. King Theodoric exerted himself with equal energy. Orléans resisted her besiegers bravely, as in after times. The passage of the Loire was skillfully defended against the Huns, and Aetius and Theodoric, after much maneuvering and difficulty, ejected a junction of their armies to the south of that important river. On the advance of the Allies upon Orléans, Attila instantly broke up the siege of that city and retreated toward the Marne. He did not choose to risk a decisive battle with only the central core of his army against the combined power of his enemies, and he therefore fell back upon his base of operations, calling in his wings from Arras and Besançon, 
and concentrating the whole of the Hunnish forces on the vast plains of chalon sur marne A glance at the map will show how scientifically this place was chosen by the Hunnish general as the point for his scattered forces to converge upon and the nature of the ground was eminently favorable for the operations of cavalry, the arm in which Attila's strength peculiarly lay. It was during the retreat from Orléans that a Christian hermit is reported to have approached the Hunnish king and said to him, Thou art the scourge of God for the chastisement of the Christians. Attila instantly assumed this new title of terror, which thenceforth became the appellation by which he was most widely and most fearfully known. The confederate armies of Romans and Visigoths at last met their great adversary face to face on the ample battleground of the Chalon Plains. Etius commanded on the right of the Allies, King Theodoric on the left, and Sangapan, king of the Alans, whose fidelity was suspected, was placed purposely in the center, and in the very front of the battle. Attila commanded his center in person, at the head of his own countrymen, while the Ostrogoths, the Gepidae, and the other subject allies of the Huns were drawn up on the wings. Some maneuvering appears to have occurred before the engagement in which Etius had the advantage, inasmuch as he succeeded in occupying a sloping hill which commanded the left flank of the Huns. Attila saw the importance of the position taken by Etius on the high ground, and commenced the battle by a furious attack on this part of the Roman line, in which he seems to have detached some of his best troops from his center to aid his left. The Romans, having the advantage of the ground, repulsed the Huns, and while the Allies gained this advantage on their right, their left, under King Theodoric, assailed the Ostrogoths, who formed the right of Attila's army. The gallant king was himself struck down by a javelin as he rode onward at the head of his men and his own cavalry, charging over him, trampled him to death in the confusion. But the Visigoths, infuriated, not dispirited by their monarch's fall, routed the enemies opposed to them, and then wheeled upon the flank of the Hunnish center, which had been engaged in a sanguinary and indecisive contest with the Alans. In this peril Attila made his center fall back upon his camp, and when the shelter of its entrenchments and wagons had once been gained, the Hunnish archers repulsed without difficulty the charges of the vengeful Gothic cavalry. Etius had not pressed the advantage which he gained on his side of the field, and when night fell over the wild scene of havoc, Attila's left was still undefeated, but his right had been routed and his center forced back upon his camp. Expecting an assault on the morrow, Attila stationed his best archers in front of the cars and wagons, which were drawn up as a fortification along his lines, and made every preparation for a desperate resistance. But the scourge of God resolved that no man should boast of the honor of having either captured or slain him, and he caused to be raised in the center of his encampment a huge pyramid of the wooden saddles of his cavalry. Round it he heaped the spoils and the wealth that he had won. On it he stationed his wives, who had accompanied him in the campaign, and on the summit Attila placed himself, ready to perish in the flames and balk the victorious foe of their choicest booty, should they succeed in storming his defenses. But when the morning broke and revealed the extent of the carnage with which the plains were heaped for miles, the successful allies saw also and respected the resolute attitude of their antagonist. Neither were any measures taken to blockade him in his camp, and so to extort by famine that submission which it was too plainly perilous to enforce with the sword. Attila was allowed to march back the remnants of his army without molestation, and even with the semblance of success. It is probable that the crafty Etius was unwilling to be too victorious. 
he dreaded the glory which his allies the visigoths had acquired and feared that rome might find a second alaric in prince torismund who had signalled himself in the battle and had been chosen on the field to succeed his father theodoric he persuaded the young king to return at once to his capital and thus relieved himself at the same time of the presence of a dangerous friend as well as of a formidable though beaten foe attila's attacks on the western empire were soon renewed but never with such peril to the civilized world as had menaced it before his defeat at Chalon. And on his death, two years after that battle, the vast empire which his genius had founded was soon dissevered by the successful revolts of the subject nations. The names of the Huns ceased for some centuries to inspire terror in Western Europe and their ascendancy passed away with the life of the great king by whom it had been so fearfully augmented. End of section 7。section 8 of the great events by famous historians, volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4, by Rossiter Johnson, Charles F. Horn, and John Rudd. Section 8. Attila Invades Western Europe. Battle of Chalon, A.D. 451. Edward Gibbon. The facility with which Attila had penetrated into the heart of Gaul may be ascribed to his insidious policy as well as to the terror of his arms. His public declarations were skillfully mitigated by his private assurances. He alternately soothed and threatened the Romans and the Goths, and the courts of Ravenna and Toulouse, mutually suspicious of each other's intentions, beheld with supine indifference the approach of their common enemy. Edius was the sole guardian of the public safety, but his wisest measures were embarrassed by a faction which, since the death of Placidia, infested the imperial palace. The youth of Italy trembled at the sound of the trumpet, and the barbarians, who, from fear or affection, were inclined to the cause of Attila, awaited with doubtful and venal faith the event of the war. The patrician passed the Alps at the head of some troops, whose strength and number scarcely deserved the name of an army. But on his arrival at Ares, or Lyon, he was confounded by the intelligence that the Visigoths, refusing to embrace the defense of Gaul, had determined to expect, within their own territories, the formidable invader whom they professed to despise. The senator Avitus, who, after the honorable exercise of the Praetorian prefecture, had retired to his estate in Auvergne, was persuaded to accept the important embassy, which he executed with ability and success. He represented to Theodoric that an ambitious conqueror, who aspired to the dominion of the earth, could be resisted only by the firm and unanimous alliance of the powers whom he labored to oppress. The lively eloquence of Avitus inflamed the Gothic warriors by the description of the injuries which their ancestors had suffered from the Huns, whose implacable fury still pursued them from the Danube to the foot of the Pyrenees. He strenuously urged that it was the duty of every Christian to save from sacrilegious violation the churches of God and the relics of the saints that it was the interest of every barbarian who had acquired a settlement in Gaul to defend the fields and vineyards which were cultivated for his use against the desolation of the Scythian shepherds. Theodoric yielded to the evidence of truth, adopted the measure at once, the most prudent and the most honorable, 
and declared that, as the faithful ally of Aetius and the Romans, he was ready to expose his life and kingdom for the common safety of Gaul. The Visigoths, who at that time were in the mature vigor of their fame and power, obeyed with alacrity the signal of war, prepared their arms and horses, and assembled under the standard of their aged king, who was resolved, with his two eldest sons, Torismond and Theodoric, to command in person his numerous and valiant people. The example of the Goths determined several tribes or nations that seemed to fluctuate between the Huns and the Romans, the indefatigable diligence of the patrician gradually collected the troops of Gaul and Germany, who had formerly acknowledged themselves the subjects or soldiers of the Republic, but who now claimed the rewards of voluntary service and the rank of independent allies. The Laeti, the Armoricans, the Briones, the Saxons, the Burgundians, the Sarmatians or Alani, the Ripurians and the Franks, who followed Merovius as their lawful prince. Such was the various army which, under the conduct of Aetius and Theodoric, advanced by rapid marches to relieve Orléans and to give battle to the innumerable host of Attila. On their approach, the king of the Huns immediately raised the siege and sounded a retreat to recall the foremost of his troops from the pillage of a city which they had already entered. The valor of Attila was always guided by his prudence, and as he foresaw the fatal consequences of a defeat in the heart of Gaul, he repassed the Seine and expected the enemy in the plains of Chalon, whose smooth and level surface was adapted to the operations of his Scythian cavalry. But in this tumultuary retreat, the vanguard of the Romans and their allies continually pressed, and sometimes engaged the troops whom Attila had posted in the rear. The hostile columns, in the darkness of the night, and the perplexity of the roads might encounter each other without design, and the bloody conflict of the Franks and Jepidae, in which fifteen thousand barbarians were slain, was a prelude to a more general and decisive action. The Catalonian fields spread themselves round Chalon, and extend, according to the vague measurement of Jornandes, to the length of one hundred and fifty, and the breadth of one hundred miles, over the whole province, which is entitled to the appellation of a Champagne country. This spacious plain was distinguished, however, by some inequalities of ground, and the importance of a height which commanded the camp of Attila was understood and disputed by the two generals. The young and valiant Torismund first occupied the summit. The Goths rushed with irresistible weight on the Huns, who labored to ascend from the opposite side. And the possession of this advantageous post inspired both the troops and their leaders with a fair assurance of victory. The anxiety of Attila prompted him to consult his priests and Herospices. It was reported that, after scrutinizing the entrails of victims and scraping their bones, they revealed, in mysterious language, his own defeat, with the death of his principal adversary, and that the barbarian, by accepting the equivalent, expressed his involuntary esteem for the superior merit of Aetius. But the unusual despondency, which seemed to prevail among the Huns, engaged Attila to use the expedient, so familiar to the generals of antiquity, of animating his troops by a military oration. And his language was that of a king who had often fought and conquered at their head. He pressed them to consider their past glory, their actual danger, and their future hopes. The same fortune which opened the deserts and morasses of Scythia to their unarmed valor, which had laid so many warlike nations prostrate at their feet, had reserved the joys of this memorable field for the consummation of their victories. The cautious steps of their enemies, 
their strict alliance, and their advantageous posts he artfully represented as the effects not of prudence but of fear. The Visigoths alone were the strength and nerves of the opposite army, and the Huns might securely trample on the degenerate Romans, whose close and compact order betrayed their apprehensions, and who were equally incapable of supporting the dangers or the fatigues of a day of battle. The doctrine of predestination, so favorable to martial virtue, was carefully inculcated by the king of the Huns, who assured his subjects that the warriors, protected by heaven, were safe and invulnerable amid the darts of the enemy, but that the unerring fates would strike their victims in the bosom of inglorious peace. I myself, continued Attila, will throw the first javelin, and the wretch who refuses to imitate the example of his sovereign is devoted to inevitable death. The spirit of the barbarians was rekindled by the presence, the voice, and the example of their intrepid leader, and Attila, yielding to their impatience, immediately formed his order of battle. At the head of his brave and faithful Huns, he occupied in person the center of the line. The nations subject to his empire, the Rugians, the Heruli, the Thuringians, the Franks, the Burgundians, were extended on either hand over the ample space of the Catalonian fields. The right wing was commanded by Ardaric, king of the Gepidae and the three valiant brothers who reigned over the Ostrogoths were posted on the left to oppose the kindred tribes of the Visigoths. The disposition of the allies was regulated by a different principle. Sangiban, the faithless king of the Alani, was placed in the center where his motions might be strictly watched and his treachery might be instantly punished. Etius assumed the command of the left and Theodoric of the right wing, while Torismund still continued to occupy the heights which appear to have stretched on the flank and perhaps the rear of the Scythian army. The nations from the Volga to the Atlantic were assembled on the plain of Chalon, but many of these nations had been divided by faction or conquest or emigration and the appearance of similar arms and ensigns which threatened each other presented the image of a civil war. The discipline and tactics of the Greeks and Romans form an interesting part of their national manners. The attentive study of the military operations of Xenophon or Caesar or Frederick, when they are described by the same genius which conceived and executed them, may tend to improve if such improvement can be wished, the art of destroying the human species. But the Battle of Chalon can only excite our curiosity by the magnitude of the object, since it was decided by the blind impetuosity of barbarians, and has been related by partial writers, whose civil or ecclesiastical profession secluded them from the knowledge of military affairs. Cassiodorus, however, had familiarly conversed with many Gothic warriors who served in that memorable engagement, a conflict, as they informed him, fierce, various, obstinate, and bloody, such as could not be paralleled either in the present or in past ages. The number of the slain amounted to 162,000, or, according to another account, 300,000 persons, and these incredible exaggerations suppose a real and effective loss sufficient to justify the historian's remark that whole generations may be swept away by the madness of kings in the space of a single hour. After the mutual and repeated discharge of missile weapons, in which the archers of Scythia might signalize their superior dexterity, the cavalry and infantry of the two armies were furiously mingled in closer combat. The Huns, who fought under the eyes of their king, pierced through the feeble and doubtful center of the allies, 
separated their wings from each other, and wheeling with a rapid effort to the left, directed their whole force against the Visigoths. As Theodoric rode along the ranks to animate his troops, he received a mortal stroke from the javelin of Andages, a noble Ostrogoth, and immediately fell from his horse. The wounded king was oppressed in the general disorder, and trampled under the feet of his own cavalry, and this important death served to explain the ambiguous prophecy of the Harrow species. Attila already exulted in the confidence of victory, when the valiant Torismund descended from the hills and verified the remainder of the prediction. The Visigoths, who had been thrown into confusion by the flight or defection of the Alani, gradually restored their order of battle, and the Huns were undoubtedly vanquished, since Attila was compelled to retreat. He had exposed his person with the rashness of a private soldier, but the intrepid troops of the center had pushed forward beyond the rest of the line. Their attack was faintly supported. Their flanks were unguarded, and the conquerors of Scythia and Germany were saved by the approach of the night from a total defeat. They retired within the circle of wagons that fortified their camp, and the dismounted squadrons prepared themselves for a defense to which neither their arms nor their temper was adapted. The event was doubtful, but Attila had secured a last and honorable resource. The saddles and rich furniture of the cavalry were collected, by his order, into a funeral pile, and the magnanimous barbarian had resolved, if his entrenchments should be forced, to rush headlong into the flames and to deprive his enemies of the glory which they might have acquired by the death or captivity of Attila. But his enemies had passed the night in equal disorder and anxiety. The inconsiderate courage of Torismund was tempted to urge the pursuit, till he unexpectedly found himself with a few followers in the midst of the Scythian wagons. In the confusion of a nocturnal combat he was thrown from his horse, and the Gothic prince must have perished like his father, if his youthful strength and the intrepid zeal of his companions had not rescued him from this dangerous situation. In the same manner, but on the left of the line, Etius himself, separated from his allies, ignorant of their victory, and anxious for their fate, encountered and escaped the hostile troops that were scattered over the plains of Shalon, and at length reached the camp of the Goths, which he could only fortify with a slight rampart of shields till the dawn of day. The imperial general was soon satisfied of the defeat of Attila, who still remained inactive within his entrenchments, and when he contemplated the bloody scene, he observed with secret satisfaction that the loss had principally fallen on the barbarians. The body of Theodoric, pierced with honorable wounds, was discovered under a heap of the slain. His subjects bewailed the death of their king and father but their tears were mingled with songs and acclamations, and his funeral rites were performed in the face of a vanquished enemy. The Goths, clashing their arms, elevated on a buckler his eldest son, Torismund, to whom they justly ascribed the glory of their success, and the new king accepted the obligation of revenge as a sacred portion of his paternal inheritance. Yet the Goths themselves were astonished by the fierce and undaunted aspect of their formidable antagonist, and their historian has compared Attila to a lion encompassed in his den and threatening his hunters with redoubled fury. The kings and nations who might have deserted his standard in the hour of distress were made sensible that the displeasure of their monarch was the most imminent and inevitable danger. All his instruments of martial music incessantly sounded a loud and animating strain of defiance, and the foremost troops who advanced to the assault were checked or destroyed by showers of arrows from every side of the entrenchments. 
it was determined, in a general council of war, to besiege the king of the Huns in his camp, to intercept his provisions, and to reduce him to the alternative of a disgraceful treaty, or an unequal combat. But the impatience of the barbarians soon disdained these cautious and dilatory measures, and the mature policy of Etius was apprehensive that, after the extirpation of the Huns, the Republic would be oppressed by the pride and power of the Gothic nation. The patrician exerted the superior ascendance of authority and reason to calm the passions, which the son of Theodoric considered as a duty represented with seeming affection and real truth the dangers of absence and delay, and persuaded Torismont to disappoint by his speedy return the ambitious designs of his brothers, who might occupy the throne and treasures of Toulouse. After the departure of the Goths and the separation of the allied army, Attila was surprised at the vast silence that reigned over the plains of Chalon. The suspicion of some hostile stratagem detained him several days within the circle of his wagons, and his retreat beyond the Rhine confessed the last victory which was achieved in the name of the Western Empire. Morovius and his Franks, observing a prudent distance, and magnifying the opinion of their strength by the numerous fires which they kindled every night, continued to follow the rear of the Huns till they reached the confines of Thuringia. The Thuringians served in the army of Attila. They traversed, both in their march and in their return, the territories of the Franks, and it was perhaps in this war that they exercised the cruelties which, about fourscore years afterward, were revenged by the son of Clovis. They massacred their hostages as well as their captives. Two hundred young maidens were tortured with exquisite and unrelenting rage. Their bodies were torn asunder by wild horses, or their bones were crushed under the weight of rolling wagons, and their unburied limbs were abandoned on the public roads as a prey to dogs and vultures. Such were those savage ancestors whose imaginary virtues have sometimes excited the praise and envy of civilized ages. End of section 8。Section 9 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Foundation of Venice, A.D. 452, by Thomas Hodgkin. The foundation of Venice, Venetia, is an incident in the history of Attila's incursions, at the head of his Huns, into Italy, after his defeat at the Battle of chalon sur marne Venetia was then a large and fertile province of northern Italy, and fifty Venetian cities flourished in peace and safety under the protection of the empire. After Attila's remorseless hordes had taken and destroyed Aquileia, near the head of the Adriatic, they swept, with resistless fury, through Venetia, whose cities were so utterly destroyed that their very sites could henceforth scarcely be identified. The inhabitants fled in large numbers to the shores of the Adriatic, where, at the extremity of the gulf, a group of a hundred islets is separated by shallows from the mainland of Italy. Here the Venetians built their city on what had hitherto been uncultivated and almost uninhabited sandbanks. Under such unfavorable circumstances was started the career of that wonderful city, which afterward became Queen of the Adriatic, and mother of art, science, and learning. The two greatest authorities on Venice are Thomas Hodgkin, who made a life study of Italy and her invaders, and the immortal Ruskin, whose grandly descriptive articles were written in the atmosphere of Venice and the Adriatic Sea. Thomas Hodgkin. The terrible invaders, made wrathful and terrible by the resistance of Aquileia, streamed through the trembling cities of Venetia. 
Each earlier stage in the itinerary shows a town blotted out by their truly Tartar genius for destruction. At the distance of 31 miles from Aquileia stood the flourishing colony of Tulia Concordia, so named, probably, in commemoration of the universal peace which, 480 years before, Augustus had established in the world. Concordia was destroyed, and only an insignificant little village now remains to show where it once stood. At another interval of 31 miles stood Altinum, with its white villas clustering round the curves of its lagoons, and rivaling Baie in its luxurious charms. Altinum was effaced as Concordia and as Aquileia. Yet another march of 32 miles brought the squalid invaders to Patavium, proud of its imagined Trojan origin, and, with better reason, proud of having given birth to Livy. Patavium, too, was leveled with the ground. True, it has not like its sister towns remained in the nothingness to which Attila reduced it, it is now many domed Padua proud, but all its great buildings date from the Middle Ages. Only a few broken friezes and a few inscriptions in its museum exist as memorials of the classic Patavium. As the Huns marched on Vicenza, Verona, Brescia, Bergamo, all opened their gates at their approach, for the terror which they inspired was on every heart. In these towns, and in Milan and Pavia, Ticinum, which followed their example, the Huns enjoyed, doubtless to the full, their wild revel of lust and spoliation, but they left the buildings unharmed, and they carried captive the inhabitants instead of murdering them. The valley of the Po was now wasted to the heart's content of the invaders. Should they cross the Apennines and blot out Rome, as they had blotted out Aquileia from among the cities of the world? This was the great question that was being debated in the Hunnish camp, and, strange to say, the voices were not all for war. Already Italy began to strike that strange awe into the hearts of her northern conquerors, which so often in later ages has been her best defense. The remembrance of Alaric, cut off by a mysterious death immediately after his capture of Rome, was present in the mind of Attila and was frequently insisted upon by his counselors, who seemed to have had a foreboding that only while he lived would they be great and prosperous. While this discussion was going forward in the barbarian camp, all voices were hushed, and the attention of all was aroused by the news of the arrival of an embassy from Rome. What had been going on in that city, it is not easy to ascertain. The emperor seems to have been dwelling there, not at Ravenna. Ischius shows a strange lack of courage or of resource, and we find it difficult to recognize in him the victor of the Moriac plains. He appears to have been even meditating flight from Italy, and to have thought of persuading Valentinian to share his exile. But counsels a shade less timorous prevailed. Someone suggested that possibly even the Hun might be satiated with havoc, and that an embassy might assist to mitigate the remainder of his resentment. Accordingly, ambassadors were sent in the once mighty name of the Emperor and the Senate and the people of Rome, to crave for peace, and these were the men who were now ushered into the camp of Attila. The envoys had been well chosen to satisfy that punctilious pride which insisted that only men of the highest dignity among the Romans should be sent to treat with the lord of Scythia and Germany. Avienus, who had, two years before, worn the robes of consul, was one of the ambassadors. Trigestius, who had wielded the powers of a prefect, and who, seventeen years before, had been dispatched upon a similar mission to Genseric the Vandal, was another. But it was not upon these men but upon their greater colleague that the eyes of all the barbarian warriors and statesmen were fixed. Leo, bishop of Rome, had come, on behalf of his flock, to sue for peace from the idolater. The two men who had thus at last met by the banks of the Mincio are certainly the grandest figures whom the fifth century can show to us, at any rate since Alaric vanished from the scene.
Attila, we, by this time, know well enough. Adequately to describe Pope Leo I, we should have to travel too far into the region of ecclesiastical history. Chosen Pope in the year 440, he was now about halfway through his long pontificate, one of the few which have nearly rivaled the twenty-five years traditionally assigned to St. Peter. A firm disciplinarian, not to say a persecutor, he had caused the Priscillianists of Spain and the many keys of Rome to feel his heavy hand. A powerful rather than subtle theologian, he had asserted the claims of Christian common sense as against the endless refinements of oriental speculation concerning the nature of the Son of God. Like an able Roman general, he had traced, in his letters on the Eutychian controversy, the lines of the fortress in which the defenders of the Catholic verity were thenceforward to entrench themselves, and from which they were to repel the assaults of Monophysites on the one hand and of Nestorians on the other. These lines had been enthusiastically accepted by the great council of Chalcedon, held in the year of Attila's Gaulish campaign, and remain from that day to this the authoritative utterance of the Church concerning the mysterious union of the Godhead and the manhood in the person of Jesus Christ. And all these gifts of will, of intellect, and of soul were employed by Leo with undeviating constancy, with untired energy, in furthering his great aim, the exaltation of the dignity of the popedom, the conversion of the admitted primacy of the bishops of Rome into an absolute and worldwide spiritual monarchy. Whatever our opinions may be as to the influence of this spiritual monarchy on the happiness of the world, or its congruity with the character of the teacher in whose words it professed to root itself, we cannot withhold a tribute of admiration for the high temper of this Roman bishop, who, in the ever-deepening degradation of his country, still despaired not, but had the courage and endurance to work for a far distant future, who, when the Roman was becoming the common drudge and footstool of all nations, still remembered the proud words, Tu regere imperio populus Romane, memento, and under the very shadow of Attila and Genseric, prepared for the city of Romulus a new and spiritual dominion, vaster and more enduring than any which had been won for her by Julius or by Hadrian. Such were the two men who stood face to face in the summer of 452 upon the plains of Lombardy. The barbarian king had all the material power in his hand, and he was working but for a twelve month. The pontiff had no power but in the world of intellect, and his fabric was to last fourteen centuries. They met, as has been said, by the banks of the Mincio. Jordanis tells us that it was where the river is crossed by many wayfarers coming and going. Some writers think that these words point to the ground now occupied by the celebrated fortress of Pesquiera, close to the point where the Mincio issues from the lake of Garda. Others place the interview at Governolo, a little village hard by the junction of the Mincio and the Po. If the latter theory be true, and it seems to fit well with the route which would probably be taken by Attila, the meeting took place in Virgil's country and almost in sight of the very farm where Titurus and Melibius chatted at evening under the beech tree. Leah's success as an ambassador was complete. Attila laid aside all the fierceness of his anger, and promised to return across the Danube, and to live thenceforward at peace with the Romans. But in his usual style, in the midst of reconciliation, he left a loophole for a future wrath, for he insisted still on this point above all, that Honoria, the sister of the emperor and the daughter of the Augusta Placidia, should be sent to him with a portion of the royal wealth which was her due, and he threatened that, unless this was done, he would lay upon Italy a far heavier punishment than any which it had yet borne. But for the present, at any rate, the tide of devastation was turned, and few events more powerfully impressed the imagination of that new and blended world which was now standing at the threshold of the dying empire than this retreat of Attila 
the dreaded king of kings, before the unarmed successor of St. Peter. Attila was already predisposed to moderation by the counsels of his ministers. The awe of Rome was upon him and upon them, and he was forced incessantly to ponder the question. What if I conquer like Alaric, to die like him? Upon these doubts and ponderings of his, supervened the stately presence of Leo, a man of holy life, firm will, dauntless courage, that, be sure, Attila perceived in the first moments of their interview. And, besides this, holding an office honored and venerated through all the civilized world. The barbarian yielded to his spell as he had yielded to that of Lippus of Troy, and, according to a tradition, which, it must be admitted, is not very well authenticated, he jocularly excused his unaccustomed gentleness by saying that he knew how to conquer men, but the lion and the wolf, Leo and Lippus, had learned how to conquer him. The tradition which asserts that the Republic of Venice and its neighbor cities in the lagoons were peopled by fugitives from the Hunnish invasion of 452 is so constant and in itself so probable that we seem bound to accept it as substantially true, though contemporary or nearly contemporary evidence to the fact is utterly wanting. The thought of the glorious city in the sea so dazzles our imaginations when we turn our thoughts toward Venice, that we must take a little pains to free ourselves from the spell and reproduce the aspect of the desolate islands and far-stretching wastes of sand and sea to which the fear of Attila drove the delicately nurtured Roman provincials for a habitation. If we examine on the map the well-known and deep recess of the Adriatic Sea, we shall at once be struck by one marked difference between its eastern and its northern shores. For three hundred miles down the Dalmatian coast, not one large river, scarcely a considerable stream, descends from the two closely towering Deneric mountains to the sea. If we turn now to the northwestern angle, which formed the shore of the Roman province of Venetia, we find the coastline broken by at least seven streams, two of which are great rivers. These seven streams, whose mouths are crowded into less than 80 miles of coast, drain an area which, reckoning from Monteviso to the Turgon Alps, the source of the Isonzo, must be 450 miles in length, and may average 200 miles in breadth, and this area is bordered on one side by the highest mountains in Europe snow-covered, glacier-strewn, wrinkled and twisted into a thousand valleys and narrow defiles, each of which sends down its river or its rivulet to swell the great outpour. For our present purpose, and as a worker out of Venetian history, Po, notwithstanding the far greater volume of his waters, is of less importance than the six other small streams which bear him company. He carrying down the fine alluvial soil of Lombardy, goes on lazily adding, foot by foot, to the depth of his delta, and mile by mile to its extent. They, swiftly hurrying over their shorter course from mountain to sea, scatter indeed many fragments, detached from their native rocks, over the first meadows which they meet with in the plain, but carry some also far out to sea, and then, Behind the bulwark which they thus have made, deposit the finer alluvial particles with which they, too, are laden. Thus we get the two characteristic features of the ever-changing coastline, the Lido and the Laguna. The Lido, founded upon the masses of rock, is a long, thin slip of the terra firma, which form a sort of advance guard of the land. The Laguna, occupying the interval between the Lido and the true shore, is a wide expanse of waters, generally very few feet in depth, with a bottom of fine sand and with a few channels of deep water, the representatives of the forming rivers, winding intricately among them. In such a configuration of land and water, the state of the tide makes a striking difference in the scene. And unlike the rest of the Mediterranean, the Adriatic does possess a tide, 
small, it is true, in comparison with the greater tides of ocean, for the whole difference between high and low water at the flood is not more than six feet, and the average flow is said not to amount to more than two feet six inches. But even this flux is sufficient to produce large tracts of sea which the reflux converts into square miles of oozy sand. Here, between sea and land, upon this detritus of the rivers, settled the detritus of humanity. The Gothic and the Lombard invasions contributed probably their share of fugitives, but fear of the Hunnish world waster, whose very name, according to some, was derived from one of the mighty rivers of Russia, was the great degrading influence that carried down the fragments of Roman civilization and strewed them over the desolate lagoons. The inhabitants of Aquileia, or at least the feeble remnants that escaped the sword of Attila, took refuge at Grado. Concordia migrated to Caprularia, now Caorle. The inhabitants of Altinum, abandoning their ruined villas, founded their new habitations upon seven islands at the mouth of the Piave, which, according to tradition, they named from the seven gates of their old city, Torcellus, Maiurbius, Boreana, Ammiana, Constantiacum, and Anianum. The representatives of some of these names, Torcello, Mazzorbo, Burano, are familiar sounds to the Venetian at the present day. From Padua came the largest stream of emigrants. They left the tomb of their mythical ancestor Antenor and built their humble dwellings upon the islands of the rivers Altus and Methamochus, better known to us as Rialto and Malamocco. The Spaduan settlement was one day to be known to the world by the name of Venice. But let us not suppose that the future queen of the Adriatic sprang into existence at a single bound like Constantinople or Alexandria. For two hundred and fifty years, that is to say, for eight generations, the refugees on the islands of the Adriatic prolonged an obscure and squalid existence, fishing, salt manufacturing, damming out the waves with wattled vine branches, driving piles into the sandbanks, and thus gradually extending the area of their villages. Still, these were but fishing villages, loosely confederated together, loosely governed, poor and insignificant, so that the anonymous geographer of Ravenna, writing in the 7th century, can only say of them, in the country of Venetia there are some few islands which are inhabited by men. This seems to have been their condition, though perhaps gradually growing in commercial importance, until, at the beginning of the 8th century, the concentration of political authority in the hands of the first doge and the recognition of the Rialto cluster of islands as the capital of the confederacy started the republic on a career of success and victory in which for seven centuries she met no lasting check. But this lies far beyond the limit of our present subject. It must be again said that we have not to think of the pleasant place of all festivity but of a few huts among the sandbanks inhabited by Roman provincials who mournfully recall their charred and ruined habitations by the Brenta and the Piave. The sea alone does not constitute their safety. If that were all, the pirate ships of the Vandal Genseric might repeat upon their poor dwellings all the terror of Attila. But it is in their amphibious life, in that strange blending of land and sea which is exhibited by the lagoons, that their safety lies. Only experienced pilots can guide a vessel of any considerable draft through the mazy channels of deep water, which intersect these lagoons, and should they seem to be in imminent peril from the approach of an enemy, they will defend themselves not like the Dutch, by cutting the dikes which barricade them from the ocean, but by pulling up the poles which even those pilots need to indicate their pathway through the waters. There, then, engaged in their humble, beaver-like labors, we leave, for the present, the Venetian refugees from the rage of Attila. But even while protesting, it is impossible not to let into our minds some thought of what those desolate fishing villages will one day become. The dim religious light half revealing the slowly gathered glories of St. Mark's, 
the ducal palace, that history in stone, the Rialto, with the babble of many languages, the piazza, with its flock of fearless pigeons, the brazen horses, the winged lion, the bucentaur, all that the artists of Venice did to make her beautiful, her ambassadors to make her wise, her secret tribunals to make her terrible. Memories of these things must come thronging upon the mind at the mere mention of her spell-like name. Now, with these pictures glowing vividly before you, wrench the mind away with sudden effort to the dreary plains of Pannonia. Think of the moody Tartar sitting in his log hut, surrounded by his barbarous guests, of Zircon gabbling his uncouth mixture of Hunnish and Latin, of the bathmen of Onagash and the woolwork of Kreka, and the reed candles in the village of Bleda's widow, and say if cause and effect were ever more strangely meted in history than the rude and brutal mind of Attila with the stately and gorgeous and subtle Republic of Venice. One more consideration is suggested to us by that which was the noblest part of the work of Venice, the struggle which she maintained for centuries, really in behalf of all Europe, against the Turk. Attila's power was soon to pass away, but in the ages that were to come, another Turanian race was to arise, as brutal as the Huns, but with their fierceness sharp-pointed and hardened into a far more fearful weapon of offense by the fanaticism of Islam. These descendants of the kinsfolk of Attila were the Ottomans, and but for the barrier which, like their own Murazzi against the waves, the Venetians interposed against the Ottomans, it is scarcely too much to say that half Europe would have undergone the misery of subjection to the organized anarchy of the Turkish Pachas. The Tartar Attila, when he gave up Aquileia and her neighbor cities to the tender mercies of his myrmidons, little thought that he was but the instrument in an unseen hand for hammering out the shield which should one day defend Europe from Tartar robbers such as he was. The Turanian poison secreted the future antidote to itself, and the name of that antidote was Venice. End of section 9section 10 of the great events by famous historians volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the great events by famous historians volume 4 edited by charles f horn roster johnson and john rudd foundation of venice ad 452 by john ruskin in the olden days of traveling now to return no more, in which distance could not be vanquished without toil, but in which that toil was rewarded partly by the power of deliberate survey of the countries through which the journey lay, and partly by the happiness of the evening hours, when, from the top of the last hill he had surmounted, the traveller beheld the quiet village where he was to rest, scattered among the meadows beside its valley stream, or from the long-hoped-for turn in the dusty perspective of the causeway, saw, for the first time, the towers of some famed city, faint in the rays of sunset, hours of peaceful and thoughtful pleasure, for which the rush of the arrival in the railway station is perhaps not always, or to all men, an equivalent. In those days, I say, when there was something more to be anticipated and remembered, in the first aspect of each successive halting place, then a new arrangement of glass roofing and iron girder, there were few moments of which the recollection was more fondly cherished by the traveller than that which brought him within sight of Venice, as his gondola shot into the open lagoon from the canal of Mestre. Not but that the aspect of the city itself was generally the source of some slight disappointment, for, seen in this direction, its buildings are far less characteristic than those of the other great towns of Italy. But this inferiority, 
was partly disguised by distance, and more than atoned for by the strange rising of its walls and towers, out of the midst, as it seemed, of the deep sea, for it was impossible that the mind or the eye could at once comprehend the shallowness of the vast sheet of water which stretched away in leagues of rippling luster to the north and south, or trace the narrow line of islets bounding it to the east, the salt breeze, the white moaning seabirds, the masses of black weed separating and disappearing gradually in knots of heaving shoal under the advance of the steady tide, all proclaimed it to be indeed the ocean on whose bosom the great city rested so calmly. Not such blue, soft, lake-like ocean as bathes the Neapolitan promontories or sleeps between the marble rocks of Genoa, but a sea with the bleak power of our own northern waves, yet subdued into a strange spacious rest and changed from its angry pallor into a field of burnished gold as the sun declined between the belfry tower of the lonely island church, fitly named St. George of the Seaweed. As the boat drew nearer to the city, the coast which the traveller had just left sank behind him into one long, low, sad-coloured line, tufted irregularly with brushwood and willows. But, at what seemed its northern extremity, the hills of Arqua rose in a dark cluster of purple pyramids, balanced on the bright mirage of the lagoon. Two or three smooth surges of inferior hill extended themselves about their roots, and beyond these, beginning with the craggy peaks above Vicenza, the chain of the Alps girded the whole horizon to the north, a wall of jagged blue, here and there showing through its clefts a wilderness of misty precipices, fading far back into the recesses of Cador, and itself rising and breaking away eastward, where the sun stroke opposite upon its snow, into mighty fragments of peaked light, standing up behind the barred clouds of evening, one after another, countless, the crown of the Adrian Sea, until the eye turned back from pursuing them, to rest upon the nearer burning of the campanils of Murano, and on the great city, where it magnified itself along the waves, as the quick, silent pacing of the gondola drew nearer and nearer. And at last, when its walls were reached, and the outmost of its untrodden streets was entered, not through towered gate or guarded rampart, but as a deep inlet between two rocks of coral in the Indian Sea. When first upon the traveler's sight opened the long ranges of columned palaces, each with its black boat moored at the portal, each with its image cast down beneath its feet upon that green pavement which every breeze broke into new fantasies of rich tessellation, when first, at the extremity of the bright vista, the shadowy Rialto, through its colossal curve, slowly forth from behind the palace of the Camerlenghi, that strange curve, so delicate, so adamantine, strong as a mountain cavern, graceful as a bow just bent, when first, before its moon-like circumference was all risen, the gondolier's cry, Ha! Stalli! struck sharp upon the ear, and the prow turned aside under the mighty cornices that half met over the narrow canal, where the plash of the water followed close and loud, ringing along the marble by the boatside. And when at last that boat darted forth upon the breadth of Silver Sea, across which the front of the ducal palace flushed with its sanguine veins, looks to the snowy dome of Our Lady of Salvation. It was no marvel that the mind should be so deeply entranced by the visionary charm of a scene so beautiful and so strange, as to forget the darker truths of its history and its being. 
well might it seem that such a city had owed her existence rather to the rod of the enchanter than the fear of the fugitive, that the waters which encircled her had been chosen from the mirror of her state rather than the shelter of her nakedness, and that all which in nature was wild or merciless, time and decay, as well as the waves and tempests, had been won to adorn her instead of to destroy, and might still spare for ages to come that beauty which seemed to have fixed for its throne the sands of the hourglass as well as of the sea. And although the last few eventful years, fraught with change to the face of the whole earth, have been more fatal in their influence on Venice than the five hundred that preceded them, though the noble landscape of approach to her can now be seen no more, or seen only by a glance, as the engine slackens its rushing on the iron line, and though many of her palaces are forever defaced, and many in desecrated ruins, there is still so much of magic in her aspect, that the hurried traveller, who must leave her before the wonder of that first aspect has been worn away, may still be led to forget the humility of her origin, and to shut his eyes to the depth of her desolation. They, at least, are little to be envied, in whose hearts the great charities of the imagination lie dead, and for whom the fancy has no power to repress the importunity of painful impressions, or to raise what is ignoble and disguise what is discordant in a scene so rich in its remembrances, so surpassing in its beauty. But for this work of the imagination, there must be no permission during the task which is before us. The impotent feelings of romance, so singularly characteristic of this century, may indeed gild, but never save, the remains of those mightier ages to which they are attached like climbing flowers. And they must be torn away from the magnificent fragments if we would see them as they stood in their own strength. Those feelings, always as fruitless as they are fond, are in Venice not only incapable of protecting, but even of discerning the objects to which they ought to have been attached. The Venice of modern fiction and drama is a thing of yesterday, a mere efflorescence of decay, a stage dream which the first ray of daylight must dissipate into dust. No prisoner whose name is worth remembering or whose sorrow deserved sympathy, ever crossed that bridge of sighs which is the center of the Byronic ideal of Venice. No great merchant of Venice ever saw that Rialto under which the traveler now passes with breathless interest. The statue which Byron makes Faliero address as one of his great ancestors was erected to a soldier of fortune a hundred and fifty years after Faliero's death and the most conspicuous parts of the city have been so entirely altered in the course of the last three centuries that if Henry Dondolo or Francis Foscari could be summoned from his tomb and stood each on the deck of his galley at the entrance of the Grand Canal, that renowned entrance, the painter's favorite subject, the novelist's favorite scene, where the water first narrows by the steps of the church of La Salute, the mighty doges would not know in what spot of the world they stood, would literally not recognize one stone of the great city for whose sake and by whose ingratitude their gray hairs had been brought down with bitterness to the grave. The remains of their Venice lie hidden behind the cumbrous masses which were the delight of the nation in its dotage, hidden in many a grass-grown court and silent pathway and lightless canal, where the slow waves have sapped their foundations for five hundred years, and must soon prevail over them forever. It must be our task to glean and gather them forth, and restore out of them some faint image of the lost city, more gorgeous a thousandfold than that which now exists, yet not created in the daydream of the prince, nor by the ostentation of the noble, 
but built by iron hands and patient hearts, contending against the adversity of nature and the fury of men, so that its wonderfulness cannot be grasped by the indolence of imagination, but only after frank inquiry into the true nature of that wild and solitary scene, whose restless tides and trembling sands did indeed shelter the birth of the city, but long denied her dominion. When the eye falls casually on a map of Europe, there is no feature by which it is more likely to be arrested than the strange sweeping loop formed by the junction of the Alps and Apennines, and enclosing the great basin of Lombardy. This return of the mountain chain upon itself causes a vast difference in the character of the distribution of its debris on its opposite sides. The rock fragments and sediment which the torrents on the north side of the Alps bear into the plains are distributed over a vast extent of country, and, though here and there lodged in beds of enormous thickness, soon permit the firm substrata to appear from underneath them. But all the torrents which descend from the southern side of the high Alps and from the northern slope of the Apennines meet concentrically in the recess or mountain bay which the two ridges enclose. Every fragment which thunder breaks out of their battlements and every grain of dust which the summer rain washes from their pastures is at last laid at rest in the blue sweep of the Lombardic plain, and that plain must have risen within its rocky barriers as a cup fills with wine, but for two contrary influences, which continually depress or disperse from its surface the accumulation of the ruins of ages. I will not tax the reader's faith in modern science by insisting on this singular depression of the surface of Lombardy, which appear for many centuries to have taken place steadily and continually. The main fact with which we have to do is the gradual transport, by the Po and its great collateral rivers, of vast masses of the finer sediment to the sea. The character of the Lombardic plains is most strikingly expressed by the ancient walls of its cities, composed for the most part of large rounded alpine pebbles, alternating with narrow courses of brick, and was curiously illustrated in 1848 by the ramparts of these same pebbles thrown up four or five feet high round every field to check the Austrian cavalry in the battle under the walls of Verona. The finer dust among which these pebbles are dispersed is taken up by the rivers, fed into continual strength by the alpine snow, so that, however pure their waters may be when they issue from the lakes at the foot of the great chain, they become of the color and opacity of clay before they reach the Adriatic. The sediment which they bear is at once thrown down as they enter the sea, forming a vast belt of low land along the eastern coast of Italy. The powerful stream of the Po, of course, builds forward the fastest. On each side of it, north and south, there is a tract of marsh, fed by more feeble streams, and less liable to rapid change than the delta of the central river. In one of these tracts is built Ravenna, and in the other Venice. What circumstances directed the peculiar arrangement of this great belt of sediment in the earliest times, it is not here the place to inquire. It is enough for us to know that from the mouths of the Adige to those of the Piave, there stretches, at a variable distance of from three to five miles from the actual shore, a bank of sand, divided into long islands by narrow channels of sea. The space between this bank and the true shore consists of the sedimentary deposits from these and other rivers, a great plain of calcareous mud, covered, in the neighborhood of Venice, by the sea at high water, to the depth, in most places, of a foot or a foot and a half, and nearly everywhere exposed at low tide, but divided by an intricate network of narrow and winding channels from which the sea never retires. In some places, according to the run of the currents, the land has risen into marshy islets, consolidated, some by art and some by time, into ground firm enough to be built upon, 
or fruitful enough to be cultivated. In others, on the contrary, it has not reached the sea level, so that, at the average low water, shallow lakelets glitter among its irregularly exposed fields of seaweed. In the midst of the largest of these, increased in importance by the confluence of several large river channels towards one of the openings in the sea bank, the city of Venice itself is built, on a crowded cluster of islands. The various plots of higher ground which appear to the north and south of this central cluster have, at different periods, been also thickly inhabited, and now bear, according to their size, the remains of cities, villages, or isolated convents and churches, scattered among spaces of open ground, partly waste and encumbered by ruins, partly under cultivation for the supply of the metropolis. The average rise and fall of the tide are about three feet, varying considerably with the seasons, but this fall on so flat a shore is enough to cause continual movement in the waters and in the main canals to produce a reflux which frequently runs like a mill stream. At high water, no land is visible for many miles to the north or south of Venice, except in the form of small islands, crowned with towers or gleaming with villages. There is a channel, some three miles wide, between the city and the mainland, and some mile and a half wide between it and the sandy breakwater called the Lido, which divides the lagoon from the Adriatic, but which is so low as hardly to disturb the impression of the city's having been built in the midst of the ocean, although the secret of its true position is partly, yet not painfully, betrayed by the clusters of piles set to mark the deep water channels, which undulate far away in spotty chains like the studded backs of huge sea snakes, and by the quick glittering of the crisped and crowded waves that flicker and dance before the strong winds upon the unlifted level of the shallow sea. But the scene is widely different at low tide. A fall of eighteen or twenty inches is enough to show ground over the greater part of the lagoon, and at the complete ebb the city is seen standing in the midst of a dark plain of seaweed, of gloomy green, except only where the larger branches of the Brenta and its associated streams converge toward the port of the Lido. Through this salt and somber plain, the gondola and the fishing boat advance by tortuous channels, seldom more than four or five feet deep, and often so choked with slime that the heavier keels furrow the bottom till their crossing tracks are seen through the clear sea water like the ruts upon a wintry road, and the oar leaves blue gashes upon the ground at every stroke, or is entangled among the thick weed that fringes the banks with the weight of its sullen waves, leaning to and fro upon the uncertain sway of the exhausted tide. The scene is often profoundly oppressive, even at this day, when every plot of higher ground bears some fragment of fair building. But, in order to know what it was once, let the traveller follow in his boat at evening the windings of some unfrequented channel far into the midst of the melancholy plain. Let him remove, in his imagination, the brightness of the great city that still extends itself in the distance, and the walls and towers from the islands that are near and so wait until the bright investiture and sweet warmth of the sunset are withdrawn from the waters, and the black desert of their shore lies in its nakedness beneath the night, pathless, comfortless, infirm, lost in dark languor and fearful silence, except where the salt runlets plash into the tideless pools, or the seabirds flit from their margins with a questioning cry and he will be enabled to enter in some sort into the horror of heart with which this solitude was anciently chosen by men for his habitation. They little thought, who first drove the stakes into the sand and strewed the ocean reeds for their rest, that their children were to be the princes of that ocean, and their palaces its pride. And yet, in the great natural laws that rule that sorrowful wilderness, 
let it be remembered what strange preparation had been made for the things which no human imagination could have foretold, and how the whole existence and fortune of the Venetian nation were anticipated or compelled by the setting of those bars and doors to the rivers and the sea. Had deeper currents divided their islands, hostile navies would again and again have reduced the rising city into servitude. Had stronger surges beaten their shores, all the richness and refinement of the Venetian architecture must have been exchanged for the walls and bulwarks of an ordinary seaport. Had there been no tide, as in other parts of the Mediterranean, the narrow canals of the city would have become noisome, and the marsh in which it was built pestiferous. Had the tide been only a foot or eighteen inches higher in its rise, the water access to the doors of the palaces would have been impossible. Even as it is, there is sometimes a little difficulty at the ebb in landing without setting foot upon the lower and slippery steps, and the highest tides sometimes enter the courtyards and overflow the entrance halls. Eighteen inches more of difference between the level of the flood and ebb would have rendered the doorsteps of every palace at low water a treacherous mess of weeds and limpets, and the entire system of water carriage for the higher classes, in their easy and daily intercourse, must have been done away with. The streets of the city would have been widened, its network of canals filled up, and all the peculiar character of the place and the people destroyed. The reader may perhaps have felt some pain in the contrast between this faithful view of the sight of the Venetian throne and the romantic conception of it, which we ordinarily form. But this pain, if he have felt it, ought to be more than counterbalanced by the value of the instance thus afforded to us at once of the inscrutableness and the wisdom of the ways of God. If, two thousand years ago, we had been permitted to watch the slow settling of the slime of those turbid rivers into the polluted sea, and the gaining upon its deep and fresh waters of the lifeless, impassable, unvoyageable plain, how little could we have understood the purpose with which those islands were shaped out of the void, and the torpid waters enclosed with their desolate walls of sand? How little could we have known, any more than of what now seems to us most distressful, dark, and objectless, the glorious aim which was then in the mind of him, in whose hands are all the corners of the earth. How little imagine that in the laws which were stretching forth the gloomy margins of those fruitless banks, and feeding the bitter grass among their shallows, there was indeed a preparation, and the only preparation possible for the founding of a city, which was to be set like a golden clasp on the girdle of the earth, to write her history on the white scrolls of the sea surges, and to word it in their thunder, and to gather and give forth, in world-wide pulsation, the glory of the west and of the east, from the burning heart of her fortitude and splendor. End of section 10「Section 11 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. This is a Library Fox recording. All Library Fox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit libraryfox.org. Recording by Rainbows and Sunshine. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosetta Johnson, and John Rudd. Clovis founds the Kingdom of the Franks. It becomes Christian. A.D. 486-511 by Francois P.G. Guizot. Part 1 Clovis, the sturdy Frank, wrought marvelous changes in Gaul. His marriage to Christian princess Clotilde was followed by the conversion of himself and gradually that of his people. With a well-disciplined army, he pulled down and swept away the last pillars of Roman power out of Gaul. Guizot gives a graphic account of the transition of the Franks during 250 years, 
from being isolated wandering tribes, each constantly warring against the other, to a well-ordered Christian kingdom, which led to the establishment of the French monarchy. The climax of this period of transition came in the reign of Clovis, with whom commences the real history of France. Under his strong hand, the various tribes were gradually brought under his sole rule. When Clovis, at the age of 15, succeeded his father, Childeric, as king of the Salian tribe, his people were mainly pagans. The Salian domain was very limited, the treasury empty, and there was no store of either grain or wine. But these difficulties were overcome by him. He subjugated the neighboring tribes and made Christianity the state religion. The new faith was accorded great privileges and means of influence, in many cases favorable to humanity and showing respect to the rights of individuals. So great an advance in civilization is an early milestone on the path of progress. About A.D. 241 or 242, the 6th Roman Legion, commanded by Aurelian, at that time military tribune, and 30 years later emperor, had just finished a campaign on the Rhine, undertaken for the purpose of driving the Germans from Gaul, and was preparing for Eastern service to make war on the Persians. The soldiers sang, we have slain a thousand Franks and a thousand Sarmatians. We want a thousand, thousand, thousand Persians. That was, apparently, a popular burthen at the time. For on the days of military festivals at Rome and in Gaul, the children sang as they danced. We have cut off the heads of a thousand, 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 thousand. One man hath cut off the heads of a thousand, 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 thousand. May he live a thousand, thousand years, he who hath slayed a thousand, thousand. Nobody hath so much of wine as he hath of blood poured out. Aurelian, the hero of these ditties, was indeed much given to the pouring out of blood. For at the approach of a fresh war, he wrote to the Senate, I marvel, conscript fathers, that ye have so much misgiving about opening the Sibylline books, as if ye were deliberating in an assembly of Christians, and not in the temple of all the gods. Let inquiry be made of the sacred books, and let celebration take place of the ceremonies that ought to be fulfilled. Far from refusing, I offer, with zeal, to satisfy all expenditure required with captives of every nationality, victims of royal rank. It is no shame to conquer with the aid of the gods. It is thus that our ancestors began and ended many a war. Human sacrifices, then, were not yet foreign to a pagan festival, and probably the blood of more than one Frankish captive on that occasion flowed in the temple of all the gods. It is the first time the name of Franks appeared in history, and it indicated no particular singular people, but a confederation of Germanic peoplets, settled or roving on the right bank of the Rhine, from the main to the ocean. The number and the name of the tribes united in this confederation are uncertain. A chart of the Roman Empire, prepared apparently at the end of the 4th century, in the reign of the Emperor Honorius, which chart, called Tabula Putingeri, was found among the ancient MSS. Collected by Conrad Putinger, a learned German philosopher in the 15th century, bears over a large territory on the right bank of the Rhine. The word Francia and the following enumeration. The Chaucians, the Amsorians, the Cheriscans and the Chamavians, who are also called Franks, and to these tribes diverse corniculars added several others, the Actuarians, the Brutherians, the Ketians, and the Sicumbrians. Whatever may have been the specific names of these peoplets, they were all of German race, called themselves Franks, 
that is Freeman, and made sometimes separately, sometimes collectively, continued incursions into Gaul, especially Belgica and the northern portions of Linus, at one time plundering and ravaging, at another occupying forcibly or demanding of the Roman emperor's lands, whereon to settle. From the middle of the 3rd to the beginning of the 5th century, the history of the Western Empire presents an almost uninterrupted series of these invasions on the part of the Franks, together with a different relationship established between them and the imperial government. At one time, whole tribes settled on Roman soil, submitted to the emperors, entered their service, and fought for them even against their own German compatriots. At another, Isolated individuals, such and such warriors of German race, put themselves at the command of the emperors, and became of importance. At the middle of the 3rd century, the emperor Valerian, on committing a command to Aurelian, wrote, Thou will have with thee Hartmann, Hadegas, Hildemann, and Carioviscus. Some Frankish tribes allied themselves more or less fleetingly with the imperial government, at the same time that they preserved their independence. Others pursued, throughout the empire, their life of incursions and adventure. From AD 260 to 268, under the reign of Gallienus, a band of Franks threw itself upon Gaul, scoured it from northeast to southeast thundering and devastating on its way. Then it passed from Aquitania into Spain, took and burned Tarragona, gained possession of certain vessels, sailed away and disappeared in Africa, after having wandered about for 12 years at its own will and pleasure. There was no lack of valiant emperors, precarious and ephemeral as the power may have been, to defend the empire, and especially Gaul, against those enemies themselves ephemeral, but forever recurring. Decius, Valerian, Gallienus, Claudius Gatticus, Aurelian, and Probus gallantly withstood those repeated attacks of German hordes. Sometimes they flattered themselves they had gained a definitive victory, and then the old Roman pride exhibited itself in their patriotic confidence. About AD 278, the Emperor Probus, after gaining several victories in Gaul over the Franks, wrote to the Senate, I render thanks to the immortal gods, conscript fathers, for that they have confirmed their judgment as regards me. Germany is subdued throughout its whole extent. Nine kings of different nations have come and cast themselves at my feet, or rather at yours, as subfines with their foreheads in the dust. Already all those barbarians are tilling for you, sowing for you, and fighting for you, against the most distant nations. Order ye, therefore, according to your custom, prayers of thanksgiving, for we have slain four thousand of the enemy. We have had offered to us sixteen thousand men ready armed, and we have wrested from the enemy the seventy most important towns. The Gauls, in fact, are completely delivered. The crowns offered to me by all cities of Gaul, I have submitted, conscript fathers, to your grace. Dedicate ye them with your own hands to Jupiter, all bountiful, all powerful, and to the other immortal gods and goddesses. All the booty is retaken, and further, we have made fresh captures, more considerable than our first losses. The fields of Gaul are tilled by the oxen of the barbarians, and German teams bend their necks in slavery to our husbandmen. Diverse nations raise cattle for our consumption, and horses to remount our cavalry. Our stores are full of the corn of the barbarians. In one word, we have left to the vanquished naught but the soil. All their other possessions are ours. We had at first thought it necessary, conscript fathers, to appoint a new governor of Germany, but we have put off this measure to the time when our ambition shall be more completely satisfied, which will be, as it seems to us, 
when it shall have pleased divine providence to increase and multiply the forces of our armies. Probus had good reason to wish that divine providence might be pleased to increase the forces of the Roman armies, for even after his victories, exaggerated as they probably were, they did not suffice for their task, and it was not long before the vanquished recommenced war. He had dispersed over the territory of the empire the majority of the prisoners he had taken, a band of Franks who had been transported and established as a military colony on the European shore of the Black Sea, could not make up their minds to remain there. They obtained possession of some vessels, traversed the Propontis, the Hellespont, and the Archipelago, ravaged the coasts of Greece, Asia Minor, and Africa, plundered Syracus, scoured the whole of the Mediterranean, entered the ocean by the Straits of Gibraltar, and, making their way up again along the coast of Gaul, arrived at last at the mouth of the Rhine, where they once more found themselves at home among the vines which Probus, in his victorious progress, had been the first to have planted, and with probably their old taste for adventure and plunder. After the commencement of the 5th century, from AD 406 to 409, it was no longer by incursions limited to certain points, and sometimes repelled with success, that the Germans harassed the Roman provinces. A veritable deluge of diverse nations forced one upon another from Asia into Europe by wars and migration in mass, inundated the empire and gave the decisive signal for its fall. Saint Jerome did not exaggerate when he wrote to Agrucia, Nations countless in numbers and exceeding fears, have occupied all the Gauls. Quadians, Vandals, Sarmatians, Alans, Gepidians, Herulians, Saxons, Burgundians, Alamanians, Pannonians, and even Assyrians have laid waste all that there is between the Alps and the Pyrenees, the ocean and the Rhine, sad destiny of the Commonwealth, Mayans, once a noble city, had been taken and destroyed. Thousands of men were slaughtered in the church. Worms had fallen after a long siege. Then inhabitants of Reims, a powerful city, and those of Amiens, Arras, Teruan, at the extremity of Gaul, Tournai, Spires, and Strasbourg, have been carried away to Germany. All hath been ravaged in Aquitania. Novum Populania, Linus and Narbonnesus, the towns, save a few, are dispeopled. The swords pursued them abroad and famine at home. I cannot speak without tears of Tolus, if she had not been reduced to equal ruin. It is to the merits of her holy bishop, Exuperus, that she oweth it. Then took place throughout the Roman Empire, in the east as well as in the west, in Asia and Africa, as well as in Europe, the last grand struggle between the Roman armies and barbaric nations. Armies is the proper term, for, to tell the truth, there was no longer a Roman nation, and very seldom a Roman emperor with some little capacity for government or war. The long continuance of despotism and slavery had enervated equally the ruling power and the people. Everything depended on the soldiers and their generals. It was in Gaul that the struggle was most obstinate and most promptly brought to a decisive issue. And the confusion there was as great as the obstinacy. Barbaric people had served in the ranks and barbaric leaders held command of the Roman armies. Stilicho was a god. Arbogastus and Melibods were Franks. Ricimer was a Suvian. The Roman generals Bonifacius, Aedius, Aegidius, Siagrius, at one time fought the barbarians, at another negotiated with such and such of them either to entice them to take service against other barbarians or to promote the objects of personal ambition. For the Roman generals, also under the titles of patrician, consul, or proconsul, aspired to and attained a sort of political independence and contributed to the dismemberment of the empire 
in the very act of defending it. No later than AD 412, two German nations, the Visigoths and the Burgundians, took their stand definitively in Gaul and founded their two new kingdoms, the Visigoths under their king Athalp and Wallia, in Aquitania and Narbonesis, the Burgundians under their kings Gundicher and Gundioch in Lyonis. From the southern point of Alsatia right into Provence, along the two banks of the Seine and the left bank of the Rhone, and also in Switzerland. In 451, the arrival in Gaul of the Huns and their king Attila, already famous, both king and nation for their wild habits, their fierce valor, and their success against the Eastern Empire, gravely complicated the situation. The common interest of resistance against the most barbarous of barbarians and the renown and energy of Aetius united, for the moment, the old and new masters of Gaul, Romans, Gauls, Visigoths, Burgundians, Franks, Alans, Saxons, and Britons formed the army led by Aetius against that of Attila, who also had in ranks Goths, Burgundians, Gepidians, Alans, and beyond Rhine Franks, gathered together and enlisted on his road. It was a chaos and a conflict of barbarians, of every name and race, disputing one with another. Pelmel, the remnants of the Roman Empire, torn asunder and in dissolution. Attila had already arrived before Orleans and was laying siege to it. The bishop Saint Aenianus sustained a while the courage of the besieged by promising them aid from Aedius and his allies. The aid was slow to come, and the bishop sent to Aedius a message. If thou be not here this very day, my son, it will be too late. Still Aedius came not. The people of Orleans determined to surrender. The gates flew open, the Huns entered. The plundering began without much disorder. Wagons were stationed to receive the booty as it was taken from the houses, and the captives arranged in groups were divided by lot between the victorious chieftains. Suddenly, a shout re-echoed through the streets. It was Aedius, Theodoric, and Torismund, his son, who were coming with the eagles of the Roman legions and with the banner of the Visigoths. A fight took place between them and the Huns, at first on the banks of the Loire, and then in the streets of the city. The people of Orleans joined their liberators, and the danger was great for the Huns, and Attila ordered a retreat. It was the 14th of June, 451, and that day was for a long while celebrated in the Church of Orleans as a date of a signal deliverance. The Huns retired toward Champagne, which they had already crossed at their coming into Gaul. And when they were before Troyes, the Bishop St. Lupus repaired to Attila's camp and besought him to spare a defenseless city, which had neither walls nor garrison. So be it, answered Attila, but thou shalt come with me and see the Rhine. I promise then to send thee back again. With mingled prudence and superstition, the barbarian meant to keep the holy man as a hostage. The Huns arrived at the plains hard by Chalon's Sermon. Aedius and all his allies had followed them, and Attila, perceiving that a battle was inevitable, halted in a position for delivering it. The Gothic historian Jornandes said that he consulted his priest, who answered that the Huns would be beaten, but that the general of the enemy would fall in the fight. In this prophecy, Attila saw predicted the death of Aedius, his most formidable enemy, and the struggle commenced. There is no precise information about the date, but it was, says Jernandes, a battle which for atrocity, multitude, horror, and stubbornness has not the like in the records of antiquity. Historians vary in their exaggeration of the numbers engaged and killed. According to some, 300,000, according to others, 162,000 were left on the field of battle. Theodoric, king of the Visigoths, was killed. Some chroniclers, named Merovius as king of the Franks, settled in Belgica near Tongres, 
who formed part of the army of Aetius. They even attribute to him a brilliant attack made on the eve of the battle upon the Gepidians, allies of the Huns. When 90,000 men fell according to some, and only 15,000 according to others, the numbers are purely imaginary, and even the fact is doubtful. However, the Battle of Chalons drove the Huns out of Gaul, and was the last victory in Gaul, gained still in the name of the Roman Empire but in reality for the advantage of the German nations, which had already conquered it. 24 years afterward, the very name of the Roman Empire disappeared with Augustulus, the last of the emperors of the West. 30 years after the Battle of Chalons, the Franks settled in Gaul were not united as one nation. Several tribes with this name, independent one of another, were planted between the Rhine and the Somme. There were some in the environs of Cologne, Calais, Cambrai, even beyond the Seine and as far as Le Mans, on the confines of the Britons. This is one of the reasons of the confusion that prevails in the ancient chronicles about their chieftains or kings of these tribes. Their names and dates and the extent and site of their possessions, Pharamond, Clodion, Meruvius, and Childeric cannot be considered as kings of France and placed at the beginning of her history. If they are met with in connection with historical facts, fabulous legends or fanciful traditions are mingled with them. Priam appears as the predecessor of Pharamond, Clodion, who passes for having been the first to bear and transmit to the Frankish king the title of long-haired, is represented as the son, at one time of Pharamond, at another of another chieftain named Theodemer. Romantic adventures, spoiled by geographical mistakes, adorn the life of children. All that can be distinctly affirmed is that from AD 450 to 480, the two principal Frankish tribes were those of the Salian Franks and the Ripuarian Franks. Settled, the latter in the east of Vajika, on the banks of the Moselle and the Rhine, the former towards the west, between the Meuse, the ocean, and the Somme. Meruvius, whose name was perpetuated in his line, was one of the principal chieftains of the Salian Franks, and his son Childeric, who resided at Tornai, where his tomb was discovered in 1655, was the father of Clovis, who succeeded him in 481, and with whom really commenced the kingdom and history of France. Clovis was 15 or 16 years old when he became king of the Salian Franks of Ternai. Five years afterward, his ruling passion, ambition, exhibited itself together with that mixture of boldness and craft which was to characterize his whole life. He had two neighbors. One, hostile to the Franks, the Roman patrician Syagrius, who was left master at Soissons after the death of his father, Aegidius with whom Gregory of Tours calls King of the Romans. The other, a Salian Frankish chieftain, just as Clovis was, and related to him, Ragnacare, who was settled at Cambrai. Clovis induced Ragnacare to join him in a campaign against Syagrius. They fought, and Syagrius was driven to take refuge in southern Gaul with Alaric, King of the Physigoths. Clovis, not content with taking possession of the Soissons and anxious to prevent any troublesome return, demanded of Alaric to send Syagrius back to him, threatening war if the requests were refused. The Goth, less bellicose than the Frank, delivered up Syagrius to the envoys of Clovis, who immediately had him secretly put to death, settled himself at Soissons and from thence set on foot in the country between the Ain and the Loire, plundering and subjugating expeditions which speedily increased his domains and his wealth, and extended far and wide his fame as well as his ambition. The Franks who accompanied him were not long before they also felt the growth of his power. Like him, they were pagans, and the treasures of the Christian churches counted for a great deal in the booty they had to divide. On one of their expeditions, they had taken in the Church of Rings among other things, a vase of marvelous size and beauty. The bishops of Reims, St. Remy, 
was not quite a stranger to Clovis. Some years before, when he had heard that the son of Childeric had become king of the Franks of Tournai, he had written to congratulate him. We are informed, said he, that thou hast undertaken the conduct of affairs. It is no marvel that thou beginnest to be what thy fathers ever were. And while taking care to put himself on good terms with the young pagan chieftain, the bishop added to his felicitations some pious Christian counsel, without letting any attempt at conversion be mixed up with his moral exhortations. The bishop, informed of the removal of the vase, sent to Clovis a messenger begging the return, if not of all his church's ornaments, at any rate of that. Follow us as far as Soissons, said Clovis to the messenger. It is there the partition is to take place of what we have captured. When the lots shall have given me the vase, I will do what the bishop demands. When Soissons was reached and all the booty had been placed in the midst of the host, the king said, Valiant warriors, I pray you not to refuse me, over and above my share, this vase here. At these words of the king, those who were of sound mind among the assembly answered, Glorious king, everything we see here is thine, and we ourselves are submissive to thy commands. Do thou esteem it good to thee, for there is none that can resist thy power. When they had thus spoken, a certain frank, light-minded, jealous, and vain, cried out aloud as he struck the vase with his battle axe. Thou shalt have not of all these save what the lots shall truly give thee. At these words all were astounded, but the king bore the insult with sweet patience, and, accepting the vase, he gave it to the messenger, hiding his wound in his recesses of his heart. At the end of the year, he ordered all his hosts to assemble fully equipped at the march parade, to have their arms inspected. After having passed in review all the other warriors, he came to him who had struck the vase. None, said he, had brought hither arms so ill-kept as thine, nor lance, nor sword, nor battle-axe are in condition for service. And resting from him his axe, he flung it on the ground. The man stooped down a little to pick it up, and fought with the king, raising with both hands his own battle-axe, drove it into his skull, saying, Thus didst thou to the vase of Soissons, on the death of this fellow, he bade the rest be gone, and by this act made himself greatly feared. A bold and unexpected deed has always a great effect on men, with his Frankish warriors as well as with his Roman and Gothic foes. Clovis had at command the instincts of patience and brutality in turn. He could bear a mortification and take vengeance in due season. While prosecuting his course of plunder and war in eastern Belgica, on the banks of the Meuse, Clovis was inspired with a wish to get married. He had heard tell of a young girl, like himself of the Germanic royal line, Clotilde, niece of Gondobad, at that time king of the Burgundians. She was dubbed beautiful, wise, and well-informed, but her situation was melancholy and perilous. Ambition and fraternal hatred had devastated her family. Her father, Chilperic, and her two brothers had been put to death by her uncle, Gondabad, who had caused her mother, Agrippina, to be thrown into the road with a stone round her neck and drowned. Two sisters alone had survived the slaughter. The elder, Crona, had taken religious vows. The other, Clotilde, was living almost in exile at Geneva absorbed in works of piety and charity. The principal historian of this epoch, Gregory of Tours, an almost contemporary authority, for he was elected bishop 62 years after the death of Clovis, says simply, Clovis at once sent a deputation to Gondabad to ask Clotilde in marriage. Gondabad, not daring to refuse, put her into the hands of the envoys who took her promptly to the king. Clovis at sight of her was transported with joy and married her. But to the short account, other chroniclers, among them Fredegar, who wrote a commentary upon and a continuation of Gregory of Tours' work, added details which deserve reproduction, first as a picture of manners. 
Next, for the better understanding of history. As he was not allowed to see Clotilde, says Fredegaire, Clovis charged a certain Roman named Aurelian to use all his wit to come near her. Aurelian repaired alone to the spot, clothed in rags and with his wallet upon his back, like a mendicant. To ensure confidence in himself, he took with him the ring of Clovis. On his arrival at Geneva, Clotilde received him as a pilgrim charitably, and while she was washing his feet, Aurelian, bending toward her, said, under his breath, Lady, I have great matters to announce, to thee if thou deem to permit me secret revelation. She, consenting, replied, Say on, Clovis, king of the Franks, said he, had sent me to thee. If it be the will of God, he would find raise thee to his high rank by marriage, and that thou mayest be certified thereof. He sendeth thee this ring. She accepted the ring with great joy, and said to Aurelia, Take for recompense of thy pains these hundred souls in gold and this ring of mine. Return promptly to thy lord, if he would fain unite me to him by marriage. Let him send without delay messengers to demand me of my uncle Gondabad, and let the messengers who shall come take me away in haste, so soon as they shall have obtained permission. If they haste not, I fear lest a certain sage. One Aridius may return from Constantinople, and if he arrive beforehand, all this matter will by his counsel come to naught. Aurelian returned in the same disguise under which he had come. On approaching the territory of Orleans, and at no great distance from his house, he had taken as traveling companion a certain poor mendicant, by whom he, having fallen asleep from sheer fatigue, and thinking himself safe, was robbed of his wallet and the hundred souls in gold that it contained. On awakening, Aurelian was sorely vexed, ran swiftly home, and sent his servants in all direction in search of the mendicant who had stolen his wallet. He was found and brought to Aurelian, who, after drubbing him soundly for three days, let him go his way. He afterward told Clovis all that had passed and what Clotilda suggested. Clovis, pleased with his success and with Clotilda's notion, at once sent a deputation to Gondabad and to demand his niece in marriage. Gondabad, not daring to refuse, and flattered at the idea of making a friend of Clovis, promised to give her to him. Then, the deputation having offered the denier and the sow, according to the custom of the Franks, espoused Clotilde in the name of Clovis, and demanded that she be given up to them to be married. Without any delay, the council was assembled at Chalons, and preparations made for the nuptials. The Franks, Having arrived with all speed, received her from the hands of Gondobod, put her into a covered carriage, and escorted her to Clovis, together with much treasure. She, however, having already learned that Aridius was on his way back, said to the Frankish lords, If ye would take me into the presence of your lord, let me descend from this carriage, mount me on horseback, and get you hence as fast as you may. For never in this carriage shall I reach the presence of your lord. Aridius, in fact, returned very speedily from Marseilles, and Gondobod, on seeing him, said to him, Thou knowest that we have made friends with the Franks, and that I have given my niece to Clovis to wife. This, answered Aridius, is no bond of friendship, but the beginning of a perpetual strife. Thou shouldst have remembered, my lord, that thou didst slay Clotilde's father, thy brother Choperic, that thou didst drown her mother, and that thou didst cut off her brother's heads and cast their bodies into a well. If Clotilde become powerful, she will avenge the wrongs of her relatives. Send thou forthwith a troop in chase, and have her brought back to thee. It will be easier for thee to bear the wrath of one person than to be perpetually as dry, thyself and thine with all the Franks. And Gondabad did send forthwith a troop in chase to fetch back Clotilde, with the carriage and all the treasure. But she, on approaching Villers, where Clovis was waiting for her, in the territory of Troyes, and before passing the Burgundian frontier, 
urged them who escorted her to disperse right and left over a space of 12 leagues in the country, when she was departing to plunder and burn. And that having been done with the permission of Clovis, she cried aloud, I thank thee, God omnipotent, for that I see the commencement of vengeance for my parents and my brethren. End of section 11. Recording by Rainbows and Sunshine. Section 12 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. By Rossiter Johnson, Charles F. Horn, and John Rudd. Section 12. Clovis founds the Kingdom of the Franks. It becomes Christian, A.D. 486-511, by Francois P. G. Guizot, Part 2. The majority of the learned have regarded this account of Fredegaire as a romantic fable, and have declined to give it a place in history. M. Fauriel, one of the most learned associates of the Academy of Inscriptions, has given much the same opinion, but he nevertheless adds, Whatever may be their authorship, the fables in question are historic, in the sense that they relate to real facts of which they are a poetical expression, a romantic development, conceived with the idea of popularizing the Frankish kings among the Gallo-Roman subjects. It cannot, however, be admitted that a desire to popularize the Frankish kings is a sufficient and truth-like explanation of these tales of the Gallo-Roman chroniclers, or that they are no more than a poetical expression, a romantic development, of the real facts briefly noted by Gregory of Tours. The tales have a graver origin and contain more truth than would be presumed from some of the anecdotes and sayings mixed up with them. In the condition of minds and parties in Gaul at the end of the 5th century, the marriage of Clovis and Clotilde was, for the public of the period, for the barbarians and for the Gallo-Romans, a great matter. Clovis and the Franks were still pagans, Gondebaud and the Burgundians were Christians, but Arians. Clotilde was a Catholic Christian. To which of the two, Catholics or Arians, would Clovis ally himself? To whom Arian, pagan or Catholic, would Clotilde be married? Assuredly, the bishops, priests, and all the Gallo-Roman clergy, for the most part Catholics, desired to see Clovis, that young and audacious Frankish chieftain, take to wife a Catholic rather than an Arian or a pagan, and hoped to convert the pagan Clovis to Christianity much more easily than an Arian to Orthodoxy. The question between Catholic Orthodoxy and Arianism was, at that time, a vital question for Christianity in its entirety, and St. Anathesius was not wrong in attributing to it supreme importance. It may be presumed that the Catholic clergy, the Bishop of Rheim, or the Bishop of Langres, was no stranger to the repeated praises which turned the thoughts of the Frankish king toward the Burgundian princess and the idea of their marriage once set afloat, the Catholics, priesthood or laity, labored undoubtedly to push it forward, while the Burgundian Arians exerted themselves to prevent it. Thus there took place between opposing influences, religious and national, a most animated struggle. No astonishment can be felt, then, at the obstacles the marriage encountered, at the complications mingled with it, and at the indirect means employed on both sides to cause its success or failure. The account of Fredegaire is but a picture of this struggle and its incidents, a little amplified or altered by imagination or the credulity of the period. But the essential features of the picture, the disguise of Aurelian, the hurry of Clotilde, the prudent recollection of Aridius, 
Gondibaud's alternations of fear and violence, and Clotilde's vindictive passion when she is once out of danger. There is nothing in all this out of keeping with the manners of the time or the position of the actors. Let it be added that Aurelian and Aridius are real personages who are met with elsewhere in history, and whose parts as played on the occasion of Clotilde's marriage are in harmony with the other traces that remain of their lives. The consequences of the marriage justified before long the importance which had on all sides been attached to it. Clotilde had a son. She was anxious to have him baptized, and urged her husband to consent. The gods you worship, said she, are not, and can do not for themselves or others. They are of wood, or stone, or metal. Clovis resisted, saying, It is by the command of our gods that all things are created and brought forth. It is plain that your god hath no power. There is no proof even that he is of the race of the gods. But Clotilde prevailed, and she had her son baptized solemnly, hoping that the striking nature of the ceremony might win to the faith the father whom her words and prayers had been powerless to touch. The child soon died, and Clovis bitterly reproached the queen, saying, Had the child been dedicated to my gods, he would be alive. He was baptized in the name of your god, and he could not live. Clotilde defended her god and prayed. She had a second son, who was also baptized, and fell sick. It cannot be otherwise with him than with his brother, said Clovis. Baptized in the name of your Christ, he is going to die. But the child was cured and lived, and Clovis was pacified and less incredulous of Christ. An event then came to pass, which affected him still more than the sickness or cure of his children. In 496, the Alemanians, a Germanic confederation like the Franks, who also had been for some time past assailing the Roman Empire on the banks of the Rhine, or the frontiers of Switzerland, crossed the river and invaded the settlements of the Franks on the left bank. Clovis went to the aid of his confederation and attacked the Alemanians at Tolbiac, near Cologne. He had with him Aurelian, who had been his messenger to Clotilde, whom he had made Duke of Melon, and who commanded the forces of Sens. The battle was going ill, the Franks were wavering, and Clovis was anxious. Before setting out he had, according to Fredegaer, promised his wife that if he were victorious he would turn Christian. Other chroniclers say that Aurelian, seeing the battle in danger of being lost, said to Clovis, My lord king, believe only on the lord of heaven whom the queen, my mistress, preacheth. Clovis cried out with emotion, Christ Jesus, thou whom my queen Clotilde calleth the son of the living God, I have invoked my own gods, and they have withdrawn from me. I believe that they have no power, since they aid not those who call upon them. Thee, very God and Lord, I invoke. If thou give me victory over these foes, if I find in thee the power that the people proclaim of thee, I will believe on thee, and will be baptized in thy name. The tide of battle turned. The Franks recovered confidence and courage, and the Alemanians, beaten and seeing their king slain, surrendered themselves to Clovis, saying, Cease, of thy grace, to cause any more of our people to perish, for we are thine. On the return of Clovis, Clotilde, fearing he should forget his victory and his promise, secretly sent, says Gregory of Tours, to saint Rami, bishop of Rheims, and prayed him to penetrate the king's heart with the words of salvation. Saint Rami was a fervent Christian and able bishop, and, I will listen to thee, most holy father, said Clovis, willingly, but there is a difficulty. The people that follow me will not give up their gods, but I am about to assemble them, and will speak to them according to thy word. 
the king found the people more docile or better prepared than he had represented to the bishop. Even before he opened his mouth, the greater part of those present cried out, We abjure the mortal gods. We are ready to follow the immortal god whom Rami preacheth. About three thousand Frankish warriors, however, persisted in their intention of remaining pagans, and deserting Clovis, betook themselves to Ragnacaire, the Frankish king of Cambrai, who was destined ere long to pay dearly for this acquisition. So soon as saint Rami was informed of this good disposition on the part of king and people, he fixed Christmas Day of this year, 496, for the ceremony of the baptism of these grand neophytes. The description of it is borrowed from the historian of the Church of Rheims, Frodaud by name, born at the close of the ninth century. He gathered together the essential points of it from The Life of Saint Rami, written shortly before that period by the saint's celebrated successor at Rheims, Archbishop Hinsmar. The bishop, says he, went in search of the king at early morn in his bedchamber, in order that, taking him at the moment of freedom from secular cares, he might more freely communicate to him the mysteries of the Holy Word. The king's chamber people receive him with great respect, and the king himself runs forward to meet him. Thereupon they pass together into an oratory dedicated to St. Peter, chief of the apostles, and adjoining the king's apartment. When the bishop, the king, and the queen had taken their places on the seats prepared for them, and admission had been given to some clerics, and also some friends and household servants of the king, the venerable bishop began his instructions on the subject of salvation. Meanwhile, preparations are being made along the road from the palace to the baptistry. Curtains and valuable stuffs are hung up, the houses on either side of the street are dressed out. The baptistry is sprinkled with balm and all manner of perfume. The procession moves from the palace. The clergy lead the way with the holy gospels, the cross, and standards, singing hymns and spiritual songs. Then comes the bishop, leading the king by the hand. After him, the queen. Lastly, the people. On the road, it is said that the king asked the bishop if that were the kingdom promised him. No, answered the prelate, but it is the entrance to the road that leads to it. At the moment when the king bent his head over the fountain of life, Lower thy head with humility, sic Cambrian, cried the eloquent bishop. Adore what thou hast burned, burn what thou hast adored. The king's two sisters, Albofled and Lantichild, likewise received baptism, and so at the same time did three thousand of the Frankish army, besides a large number of women and children. When it was known that Clovis had been baptized by Saint Rami, and with what striking circumstance, great was the satisfaction among the Catholics. The chief Burgundian prelate, Avitus, bishop of Vienne, wrote to the Frankish king, Your faith is our victory. In choosing for you and yours, you have pronounced for all. Divine providence hath given you as arbiter to our age. Greece can boast of having a sovereign of our persuasion, but she is no longer alone in possession of this precious gift. The rest of the world doth share her light. Pope Anastasius hastened to express his joy to Clovis. The Church, our common mother, he wrote, rejoiceth to have borne unto God so great a king. Continue, glorious and illustrious son, to cheer the heart of this tender mother. Be a column of iron to support her, and she in her turn will give thee victory over all thine enemies. Clovis was not a man to omit turning his Catholic popularity to the account of his ambition. At the very time when he was receiving these testimonies of good will from the heads of the church, he learned that Gondibaud, 
disquieted, no doubt, at the conversion of his powerful neighbor, had just made a vain attempt at a conference held at Lyon to reconcile in his kingdom the Catholics and the Arians. Clovis considered the moment favorable to his projects of aggrandizement at the expense of the Burgundian king. He fomented the dissensions which already prevailed between Gondebaud and his brother Gaudegesil, assured to himself the latter's complicity, and suddenly entered Burgundy with his army. Gondebaud, betrayed and beaten at the first encounter at Dijon, fled to the south of his kingdom, and went and shut himself up in Avignon. Clovis pursued and besieged him there. Gondebaud, in great alarm, asked counsel of his Roman confidant Aridius, who had but lately foretold to him what the marriage of his niece Clotilde would bring upon him. On every side, said the king, I am encompassed by perils, and I know not what to do. Lo, here be these barbarians come upon us to slay us and destroy the land. To escape death, answered Aridius, thou must appease the ferocity of this man. Now, if it please thee, I will feign to fly from thee and go over to him. So soon as I shall be with him, I will do so that he ruin neither thee nor the land. Only have thou care to perform whatsoever I shall ask of thee, until the Lord in his goodness deign to make thy cause triumph. All that thou shalt bid will I do, said Gondebaud. So Aridius left Gondebaud and went his way to Clovis and said, most pious king, I am thy humble servant. I give up this wretched Gondebaud, and come unto thy mightiness. If thy goodness deign to cast a glance upon me, thou and thy descendants will find in me a servant of integrity and fidelity. Clovis received him very kindly, and kept him by him, for Aridius was agreeable in conversation, wise in counsel, just in judgment, and faithful in whatever was committed to his care. As the siege continued, Aridius said to Clovis, O king, if the glory of thy greatness would suffer thee to listen to the words of my feebleness, though thou needest not counsel, I would submit them to thee in all fidelity, and they might be of use to thee, whether for thyself or for the towns, by the which thou dost propose to pass. Wherefore keepest thou here thine army, whilst thine enemy doth hide himself in a well-fortified place? Thou ravagest the fields, thou pillagest the corn, thou cuttest down the vines, thou fellest the olive trees, thou destroyest all the produce of the land, and yet thou succeedest not in destroying thine adversary. Rather send thou unto him deputies, and lay on him a tribute to be paid to thee every year. Thus the land will be preserved, and thou wilt be lord for ever over him who owes thee tribute. If he refuse, thou shalt then do what pleaseth thee. Clovis found the counsel good, ordered his army to return home, sent deputies to Gondebaud, and called upon him to undertake the payment every year of a fixed tribute. Gondebaud paid for the time, and promised to pay punctually for the future and peace appeared made between the two barbarians. Pleased with his campaign against the Burgundians, Clovis kept on good terms with Gondebaud, who was to be henceforth a simple tributary, and transferred to the Visigoths of Aquitania and their king Alaric II his views of conquest. He had there the same pretexts for attack and the same means of success. Alaric and his Visigoths were Arians, and between them and the bishops of southern Gaul, nearly all Orthodox Catholics, there were permanent ill-will and distrust. Alaric attempted to conciliate their good will. In 506 a council met at Agdi. The thirty-four bishops of Aquitania attended in person or by delegate. The king protested that he had no design of persecuting the Catholics. 
the bishops, at the opening of the council, offered prayers for the king, but Alaric did not forget that immediately after the conversion of Clovis, Volusian, bishop of Tours, had conspired in favor of the Frankish king, and the bishops of Aquitania regarded Volusian as a martyr, for he had been deposed without trial from his see and taken as a prisoner first to Toulouse and afterward into Spain, where in a short time he had been put to death. In vain did the glorious chief of the race of Goths, Theodoric the Great, King of Italy, father-in-law of Alaric, and brother-in-law of Clovis, exert himself to prevent any outbreak between the two kings. In 498, Alaric, no doubt at his father-in-law's solicitation, wrote to Clovis, If my brother consent thereto, I would, following my desires and by the grace of God, have an interview with him. The interview took place at a small island in the Loire, called the Ile d'Or, or de Saint-Jean, near Amboise. The two kings, says Gregory of Tours, conversed, ate, and drank together, and separated with mutual promises of friendship. The positions and passions of each soon made the promises of no effect. In 505 Clovis was seriously ill. The bishops of Aquitania testified warm interest in him and one of them, Quintian, bishop of Rode, being on this account persecuted by the Visigoths, had to seek refuge at Clermont in Auvergne. Clovis no longer concealed his designs. In 507 he assembled his principal chieftains, and, It displeaseth me greatly, said he, that these Arians should possess a portion of the Gauls, March we forth with the help of God, drive we them from that land, for it is very goodly, and bring we it under our own power. The Franks applauded their king, and the army set out on the march in the direction of Poitiers, where Alaric happened at that time to be. As a portion of the troops was crossing the territory of Tours, says Gregory, who was shortly afterward its bishop, Clovis forbade, out of respect for St. Martin, anything to be taken save grass and water. One of the army, however, having found some hay belonging to a poor man, said, This is grass, we do not break the king's commands by taking it. And in spite of the poor man's resistance, he robbed him of his hay. Clovis, informed of the fact, slew the soldier on the spot with one sweep of his sword, saying, What will become of our hopes of victory if we offend St. Martin? Alaric had prepared for this struggle, and the two armies met in the plain of Vouillet, on the banks of the little river Clain, a few leagues from Poitiers. The battle was very severe. The Goths, says Gregory of Tours, fought with missiles, the Franks sword in hand. Clovis met, and with his own hand slew Alaric in the fray. At the moment of striking his blow, two Goths fell suddenly upon Clovis, and attacked him with their pikes on either side. But he escaped death, thanks to his curiosity and the agility of his horse. Beaten and kingless, the Goths retreated in great disorder, and Clovis, pursuing his march, arrived without opposition at Bordeaux, where he settled down with his Franks for the winter. When the war season returned, he marched on Toulouse, the capital of the Visigoths, which he likewise occupied without resistance, and where he seized a portion of the treasure of the Visigothic kings, he quitted it to lay siege to Carcassonne, which had been made by the Romans into the stronghold of Septimania. There his course of conquest was destined to end. After the battle of Vouillet, he had sent his eldest son, Theodoric, in command of a division, with orders to cross central Gaul from west to east, to go and join the Burgundians of Gondebaud, who had promised his assistance and in conjunction with them to attack the Visigoths on the banks of the Rhone and in Narbonensis. 
The young Frank boldly executed his father's orders, but the intervention of Theodoric the Great, King of Italy, prevented the success of the operation. He sent an army into Gaul to the aid of his son-in-law Alaric, and the united Franks and Burgundians failed in their attacks upon the Visigoths of the eastern provinces. Clovis had no idea of compromising by his obstinacy the conquests already accomplished. He therefore raised the siege of Carcassonne, returned first to Toulouse and then to Bordeaux, took Angoulême, the only town of importance he did not possess in Aquitania, and feeling reasonably sure that the Visigoths, who, even with the aid that had come from Italy, had great difficulty in defending what remained to them of southern Gaul, would not come and dispute with him what he had already conquered. He halted at Tours and stayed there some time to enjoy on the very spot the fruits of his victory and to establish his power in his new possessions. It appears that even the Britons of Armorica tendered to him at that time, through the interposition of Melanius, Bishop of Wren, if not their actual submission, at any rate their subordination and homage. Clovis, at the same time, had his self-respect flattered in a manner to which barbaric conquerors always attach great importance. Anastasius, Emperor of the East, with whom he had already had some communication, sent to him at Tours a solemn embassy, bringing him the titles and insignia of patrician and consul. Clovis, says Gregory of Tours, put on the tunic of purple, and the clamis, and the diadem. Then mounting his horse, he scattered with his own hand, and with much bounty, gold and silver among the people, on the road which lies between the gate of the court, belonging to the Basilica of St. Martin, and the church of the city. From that day he was called Consul and Augustus. On leaving the city of Tours, he repaired to Paris, where he fixed the seat of his government. Paris was certainly the political center of his dominions, the intermediate point between the early settlements of his race and himself in Gaul and his new Gallic conquests. But he lacked some of the possessions nearest to him, and most naturally, in his own opinion, his to the east, north, and southwest of Paris were settled some independent Frankish tribes, governed by chieftains with the name of kings. So soon as he had settled at Paris, it was the one fixed idea of Clovis to reduce them all to subjection. He had conquered the Burgundians and the Visigoths. It remained for him to conquer and unite together all the Franks. The barbarian showed himself in his true colors during this new enterprise, with his violence, his craft, his cruelty, and his perfidy. He began with the most powerful of the tribes, the Riporian Franks. He sent secretly to Cloderic, son of Sigebert, their king, saying, Thy father hath become old, and his wound maketh him to limp a one foot. If he should die, his kingdom will come to thee of right, together with our friendship. Cloderic had his father assassinated while asleep in his tent, and sent messengers to Clovis, saying, My father is dead, and I have in my power his kingdom and his treasures. Send thou unto me certain of thy people, and I will gladly give into their hands whatsoever among these treasures shall seem like to please thee. The envoys of Clovis came, and as they were examining in detail the treasures of Sigibert, Cloderic said to them, This is the coffer wherein my father was wont to pile up his gold pieces. Plunge, said they, thy hand right to the bottom, that none escape thee. Cloderic bent forward, and one of the envoys lifted his battle axe and cleft his skull. Clovis went to Cologne and convoked the Franks of the canton. Learn, said he, that which hath happened. As I was sailing on the river Scheldt, Cloderic, son of my relative, did vex his father, saying I was minded to slay him, 
and as Sigebert was flying across the forest of Bouchon, his son himself sent bandits, who fell upon him and slew him. Cloderick also is dead, smitten I know not by whom, as he was opening his father's treasures. I am altogether unconcerned in it all, and I could not shed the blood of my relatives, for it is a crime. But since it hath so happened, I give unto you counsel, which ye shall follow, if it seem to you good. Turn ye toward me, and live under my protection. And they who were present hoisted him on a huge buckler, and hailed him king. After Sigebert and the Riporian Franks came the Franks of Teruan and Shararic, their king. He had refused, twenty years before, to march with Clovis against the Roman Siagrius. Clovis, who had not forgotten it, attacked him, took him and his son prisoners, and had them both shorn, ordering that Shararic should be ordained priest and his son deacon. Shararic was much grieved, then said his son to him, Here be branches which were cut from a green tree, and are not yet wholly dried up. Soon they will sprout forth again. May it please God that he who hath wrought all this shall die as quickly. Clovis considered these words as a menace, had both father and son beheaded, and took possession of their dominions. Ragnacaire, king of the Franks of Cambrai, was the third to be attacked. He had served Clovis against Siagrius, but Clovis took no account of that. Ragnacaire, being beaten, was preparing for flight when he was seized by his own soldiers who tied his hands behind his back and took him to Clovis along with his brother Riquier. Wherefore hast thou dishonored our race, said Clovis, by letting thyself wear bonds? Twere better to have died, and cleft his skull with one stroke of his battle-axe. Then turning to Riquier, Hadst thou succored thy brother, said he, he had assuredly not been bound, and felled him likewise at his feet. Rignomer, king of the Franks of Le Mans, met the same fate, but not at the hands, only by the order of Clovis. So Clovis remained sole king of the Franks, for all the independent chieftains had disappeared. It is said that one day, after all these murders, Clovis, surrounded by his trusted servants, cried, Woe is me, who am left as a traveler among strangers, and who have no longer relatives to lend me support in the day of adversity. Thus do the most shameless take pleasure in exhibiting sham sorrow after crimes they cannot disavow. It cannot be known whether Clovis ever felt in his soul any scruple or regret for his many acts of ferocity and perfidy, or if he looked as sufficient expiation upon the favor he had bestowed on the churches and their bishops, upon the gifts he lavished on them, and upon the absolutions he demanded of them. In times of mingled barbarism and faith, there are strange cases of credulity in the way of bargains made with divine justice. We read in the life of St. Eleutherus, Bishop of Tournay, the native land of Clovis, that at one of those periods when the conscience of the Frankish king must have been most heavily laden, he presented himself one day at the church. My lord king, said the bishop, I know wherefore thou art come to me. I have nothing special to say unto thee, rejoined Clovis. Say not so, O king, replied the bishop, thou hast sinned, and darest not avow it. The king was moved, and ended by confessing that he had deeply sinned, and had need of large pardon. St. Eleutherus betook himself to prayer. The king came back the next day, and the bishop gave him a paper on which was written by a divine hand, he said, The pardon granted to royal offenses which might not be revealed. Clovis accepted this absolution, and loaded the church of Tournay with his gifts. In 511, the very year of his death, 
His last act in life was the convocation at Orléans of a council, which was attended by thirty bishops from the different parts of his kingdom, and at which were adopted thirty-one canons that, while granting to the Church great privileges and means of influence, in many cases favorable to humanity and respect for the rights of individuals, bound the Church closely to the State, and gave to royalty, even in ecclesiastical matters, great power. The bishops, on breaking up, sent these canons to Clovis, praying him to give them the sanction of his adhesion, which he did. A few months afterward, on the 27th of November, 511, Clovis died at Paris, and was buried in the church of St. Peter and St. Paul, nowadays St. Genevieve, built by his wife, Queen Clotilde, who survived him. It was but right to make the reader intimately acquainted with that great barbarian who, with all his vices and all his crimes, brought about, or rather began, two great matters which have already endured through fourteen centuries and still endure, for he founded the French monarchy and Christian France. Such men and such facts have a right to be closely studied and set in a clear light by history. Nothing similar will be seen for two centuries under the descendants of Clovis, the Merovingians. Among them will be encountered none but those personages whom death reduces to insignificance, whatever may have been their rank in the world, and of whom Virgil thus speaks to Dante, Waste we no words on them, one glance, and pass thou on. End of section 12section 13 of the great events by famous historians volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the great events by famous historians volume 4 edited by charles f horn rossiter johnson and john rudd publication of the justinian code A.D. 529 to 534, by Edward Gibbon, Part 1. The richest legacy ever left by one civilization to another was the Justinian Code. This compilation of the entire body of the Roman civil law, Corpus Iuris Civilis, as evolved during the thousand years after the December legislation of the Twelve Tables, comprises perhaps the most valuable historical data preserved from ancient times. It presents a vivid and authentic picture of the domestic life of the Romans and the rules which governed their relations to each other. This phase of history is considered by modern historians as of far greater importance than the chronicles of battles and court intrigues. The importance of the Justinian Code, however, is not that of mere history. Its influence as a living force is what compels the admiration and gratitude of mankind. It forms the basis of the systems of law in all the civilized nations of the world, with the exception of those of the English-speaking peoples. And even in these, the principles of the civil law, as the Roman law is called in contradistinction to the common and statute law of these nations, form the most important part of the regulations concerning personal property. For this monumental work, the world is indebted to Justinian I, Flavius Anicius Justinianus, the most famous of the emperors of the Eastern Empire since Constantine. He was born a Slavonian peasant. Uprauda, his original name, was Latinized into Justinian when he became an officer in the Imperial Guard. He was adopted, educated and trained by Justin I, whom he succeeded as emperor. His long reign, 527 to 565, was disturbed by the sanguinary factions of the circus, the greens and the blues, so named from the colors of the competing charioteers in the games, the suppression of the schools at philosophy at Athens, and by various wars. Nevertheless, it was marked by magnificent works, the administrative organization of the empire and the great buildings at Constantinople. The Church of Santa Sofia, 
the first great Christian church, although used as a Mohammedan mosque since 1459, still stands at Constantinople, with its plain exterior but impressive interior, a monument of Justinian's reign. His two great masters of war, foreigners in origin like himself, were Belisarius the Thracian and Narses the Armenian. Africa was wrested from the Vandals, Italy from the successors of Theodoric, and much of Spain from the Western Goths. Under Justinian, the Byzantine or Eastern Empire resumed much of the majesty and power of ancient Rome. But the crowning glory of his career was the Code. One of the greatest historians says of his reign. Its most instructive lesson has been drawn from the influence which its legislation has exercised on foreign nations. The unerring instinct of mankind has fixed on this period as one of the greatest eras in man's annals. The Code was a digest of the whole mass of Roman law literature, compiled and annotated at the command of Justinian, under the supervision of the great lawyer Tribonian, who with his helpers reduced the chaotic mass to a logical system containing the essence of Roman law. The first part of the Codex Constitutionem, prepared in less than a year, was published in April 529. The second part, the Digest or Pandects, appeared in December 533. To ensure conformity, both were revised and issued in November 534. The Institutiones, an elementary textbook founded on the Institutiones of Gaius, who lived AD 110 to 180, being added, and the whole as a complete body of law given to the law schools at Constantinople, Rome, Alexandria, Beritus, and Caesarea for use in their graduate course. Later, the novellae constitutione, or novels, most of them in Greek, comprising statutes of Justinian arranged chronologically, completed the code. Forgotten or ignored during the lawless days of the Dark Ages, an entire copy of this famous code was discovered when Amalfi was taken by the Pisans in 1137. Its publication immediately attracted the attention of the learned world. Gratian, a monk of Bologna, compiled a digest of the canon law on the model of that work, and soon afterward incorporating with his writings the collections of prior authors, gave his decretum to the public in 1151. From that time, the two codes, the civil and canon laws, were deemed the principal repositories of legal knowledge, and the study of each was considered necessary to throw light on the other. Justinian's example in the codification of laws was followed by almost every European nation after the 18th century. The Code Napoleon, 1803-04, regulating all that pertains to the civil rights of citizens and of property, being the most brilliant parallel to the Justinian Code. The reader familiar with the life of Napoleon will recall that all of his historians quote his frequent allusion to the Code Napoleon as the one great work which would be a living monument of his career, when the glory of all his other achievements would be dimmed by time or forgotten. Gibbon's examination of the Justinian Code is justly regarded as one of the most important features of the historian's great work, and in several of the leading universities of Europe has long been used as a textwork on civil law. When Justinian ascended the throne, the reformation of the Roman jurisprudence was an arduous but indispensable task. In the space of ten centuries, the infinite variety of laws and legal opinions had filled many thousand volumes, which no fortune could purchase and no capacity could digest. Books could not easily be found, and the judges, poor in the midst of riches, were reduced to the exercise of their illiterate discretion. The subjects of the Greek provinces were ignorant of the language that disposed of their lives and properties, and the barbarous dialect of the Latins was imperfectly studied in the academies of Berytus and Constantinople. As an Illyrian soldier, that idiom was familiar to the infancy of Justinian. His youth had been instructed by the lessons of jurisprudence, 
and his imperial choice selected the most learned civilians of the East to labor with their sovereign in the work of reformation. The theory of professors was assisted by the practice of advocates and the experience of magistrates, and the whole undertaking was animated by the spirit of Tribonian. This extraordinary man, the object of so much praise and censure, was a native of Siri in Pamphylia, and his genius, like that of Bacon, embraced as his own all the business and knowledge of the age. Tribonian composed, both in prose and verse, on a strange diversity of curious and abstruse subjects, a double panegyric of Justinian and the life of the philosopher Theodotus, the nature of happiness and the duties of government, Homer's catalogue and the four and twenty sorts of meter, the astronomical canon of Ptolemy, the changes of the months, the houses of the planets, and the harmonic system of the world. To the literature of Greece he added the use of the Latin tongue, the Roman civilians were deposited in his library and in his mind, and he most assiduously cultivated those arts which opened the road of wealth and preferment. From the bar of the Praetorian prefects he raised himself to the honors of quaestor, of consul, and of master of the offices. The council of Justinian listened to his eloquence and wisdom, and envy was mitigated by the gentleness and affability of his manners. The reproaches of impiety and avarice have stained the virtues or the reputation of Tribonian. In a bigoted and persecuting court, the principal minister was accused of a secret aversion to the Christian faith, and was supposed to entertain the sentiments of an atheist and a pagan, which have been imputed, inconsistently enough, to the last philosophers of Greece. His avarice was more clearly proved and more sensibly felt. If he were swayed by gifts in the administration of justice, the example of Bacon will again occur. Nor can the merit of Tribonian atone for his baseness if he degraded the sanctity of his profession. And if laws were every day enacted, modified or repealed for the base consideration of his private emolument. In the sedition of Constantinople, his removal was granted to the clamors, perhaps to the just indignation, of the people. But the quester was speedily restored, and till the hour of his death he possessed above twenty years the favor and confidence of the emperor. His passive and dutiful submission has been honored with the praise of Justinian himself, whose vanity was incapable of discerning how often that submission degenerated into the grossest adulation. Tribonian adored the virtues of his gracious master. The earth was unworthy of such a prince and he affected a pious fear that Justinian, like Elijah or Romulus, would be snatched into the air and translated alive to the mansions of celestial glory. If Caesar had achieved the reformation of the Roman law, his creative genius, enlightened by reflection and study, would have given to the world a pure and original system of jurisprudence. Whatever flattery might suggest, the Emperor of the East was afraid to establish his private judgment as the standard of equity. In the possession of legislative power, he borrowed the aid of time and opinion, and his laborious compilations are guarded by the sages and legislators of past times. Instead of a statue cast in a simple mold by the hand of an artist, the works of Justinian represent a tessellated pavement of antique and costly, but too often of incoherent fragments. In the first year of his reign, he directed the faithful Tribonian and nine learned associates to revise the ordinances of his predecessors, as they were contained since the time of Adrian, in the Gregorian, Hermogenian and Theodosian codes, to purge the errors and contradictions, to retrench whatever was obsolete and superfluous, and to select the wise and salutary laws best adapted to the practice of the tribunals and the use of his subjects. The work was accomplished in fourteen months, and the twelve books or tables which the new Decemvirs produced might be designed to imitate the labors of their Roman predecessors. The new code of Justinian was honored with his name and confirmed by his royal signature. 
authentic transcripts were multiplied by the pens of notaries and scribes. They were transmitted to the magistrates of the European, the Asiatic, and afterwards the African provinces. And the law of the empire was proclaimed on solemn festivals at the doors of churches. A more arduous operation was still behind, to extract the spirit of jurisprudence from the decisions and conjectures, the questions and disputes of the Roman civilians. Seventeen lawyers, with Tribonian at their head, were appointed by the emperor to exercise an absolute jurisdiction over the works of their predecessors. If they had obeyed his command in ten years, Justinian would have been satisfied with their diligence and the rapid composition of the digest or pandex in three years will deserve praise or censure according to the merit of the execution. From the library of Tribonian they chose forty, the most eminent civilians of former times. Two thousand treatises were comprised in an abridgment of fifty books, and it has been carefully reduced in this abstract to the moderate number of one hundred and fifty thousand. The edition of this great work was delayed a month after that of the Institutes, and it seemed reasonable that the elements should precede the digest of the Roman law. As soon as the Emperor had approved their labors, he ratified by his legislative power the speculations of these private citizens. Their commentaries on the Twelve Tables, the Perpetual Edict, the Laws of the People, and the Decrees of the Senate succeeded to the authority of the text and the text was abandoned as a useless, though venerable, relic of antiquity. The Code, the Pandacts, and the Institutes were declared to be the legitimate system of civil jurisprudence. They alone were admitted in the tribunals, and they alone were taught in the academies of Rome, Constantinople, and Berytus. Justinian addressed to the Senate and provinces his eternal oracles, and his pride, under the mask of piety, ascribed the consummation of this great design to the support and inspiration of the deity. Since the emperor declined the fame and envy of original composition, we can only require at his hands method, choice and fidelity, the humble though indispensable virtues of a compiler. Among the various combinations of ideas, it is difficult to assign any reasonable preference. But as the order of Justinian is different in his three works, it is possible that all may be wrong, and it is certain that two cannot be right. In the selection of ancient laws he seems to have viewed his predecessors without jealousy and with equal regard. The Sirius could not ascend above the reign of Hadrian, and the narrow distinction of paganism and Christianity introduced by the superstition of Theodosius had been abolished by the consent of mankind. But the jurisprudence of the Pandex is circumscribed within a period of a hundred years, from the perpetual edict to the death of Severus Alexander. The civilians who lived under the first Caesars are seldom permitted to speak, and only three names can be attributed to the age of the Republic. The favorite of Justinian, it has been fiercely urged, was fearful of encountering the light of freedom and the gravity of Roman sages. Tribonian condemned to oblivion the genuine and native wisdom of Cato, the Scaevolas, and Sulpicius, while he invoked spirits more congenial to his own, the Syrians, Greeks, and Africans who flocked to the imperial court to study Latin as a foreign tongue and jurisprudence as a lucrative profession. But the ministers of Justinian were instructed to labor not for the curiosity of antiquarians, but for the immediate benefit of his subjects. It was their duty to select the useful and practical parts of the Roman law, and the writings of the old republicans, however curious or excellent, were no longer suited to the new system of manners, religion, and government. Perhaps if the preceptors and friends of Cicero were still alive, our candor would acknowledge that, except in purity of language, their intrinsic merit was excelled by the school of Pepinian and Alpian. The science of the laws is the slow growth of time and experience, and the advantage both of method and materials is naturally assumed by the most recent authors.
The civilians of the reign of the Antonines had studied the works of their predecessors. Their philosophic spirit had mitigated the rigor of antiquity, simplified the forms of proceedings, and emerged from the jealousy and prejudice of the rival sects. The choice of the authorities that composed the Pandects depended on the judgment of Tribonian, but the power of his sovereign could not absolve him from the sacred obligations of truth and fidelity. As the legislator of the empire, Justinian might repeal the acts of the Antonines or condemn as seditious the free principles which were maintained by the last of the Roman lawyers. But the existence of past facts is placed beyond the reach of despotism, and the emperor was guilty of fraud and forgery when he corrupted the integrity of their text, inscribed with their venerable names the words and ideas of his servile reign, and suppressed by the hand of power the pure and authentic copies of their sentiments. The changes and interpolations of Tribonian and his colleagues are excused by the pretense of uniformity but their cares have been insufficient, and the antinomies or contradictions of the code and band acts still exercise the patience and subtlety of modern civilians. A rumor devoid of evidence has been propagated by the enemies of Justinian that the jurisprudence of ancient Rome was reduced to ashes by the author of the band acts, from the vain persuasion that it was now either false or superfluous. Without usurping an office so invidious, the emperor might safely commit to ignorance and time the accomplishment of this destructive wish. Before the invention of printing and paper, the labor and the materials of writing could be purchased only by the rich, and it may reasonably be computed that the price of books was a hundredfold their present value. Copies were slowly multiplied and cautiously renewed, the hopes of profit tempted the sacrilegious scribes to erase the characters of antiquity, and Sophocles or Tacitus were obliged to resign the parchment to missiles, homilies, and the golden legend. If such was the fate of the most beautiful compositions of genius, what stability could be expected for the dull and barren works of an obsolete science? The books of jurisprudence were interesting to few and entertaining to none. Their value was connected with present use, and they sunk forever as soon as that use was superseded by the innovations of fashion, superior merit, or public authority. In the age of peace and learning between Cicero and the last of the Antonines, many losses had been already sustained, and some luminaries of the school or forum were known only to the curious by tradition and report. 360 years of disorder and decay accelerated the progress of oblivion. And it may fairly be presumed that of the writings which Justinian is accused of neglecting, many were no longer to be found in the libraries of the East. The copies of Papinian or Alpian, which the reformer had proscribed, were deemed unworthy of future notice. The Twelve Tables and Praetorian Edicts insensibly vanished and the monuments of ancient Rome were neglected or destroyed by the envy and ignorance of the Greeks. Even the Pandects themselves have escaped with difficulty and danger from the common shipwreck, and criticism has pronounced that all the editions and manuscripts of the West are derived from one original. It was transcribed at Constantinople in the beginning of the 7th century, and successfully transported by the accidents of war and commerce to Amalfi, Pisa and Florence, and is now deposited as a sacred relic in the ancient palace of the Republic. It is the first care of a reformer to prevent any future reformation. To maintain the text of the Pandects, the Institutes and the Code, the use of ciphers and abbreviations was rigorously proscribed. And as Justinian recollected, that the perpetual edict had been buried under the weight of commentators, he denounced the punishment of forgery against the rash civilians who should presume to interpret or pervert the will of their sovereign.
the scholars of Acusius, of Bartolus, of Cuyacius, should blush for their accumulated guilt unless they dare to dispute his right of binding the authority of his successors and the native freedom of the mind. But the emperor was unable to fix his own inconstancy. And while he boasted of renewing the exchange of diamide, of transmuting brass into gold, discovered the necessity of purifying his gold from the mixture of baser alloy. Six years had not elapsed from the publication of the code before he condemned the imperfect attempt by a new and more accurate edition of the same work, which he enriched with 200 of his own laws and 50 decisions on the darkest and most intricate points of jurisprudence. Every year, or according to Procopius, every day of his long reign was marked by some legal innovation. Many of his acts were rescinded by himself. Many were rejected by his successors. Many have been obliterated by time. But the number of 16 edicts and 168 novels has been admitted into the authentic body of the civil jurisprudence. In the opinion of a philosopher superior to the prejudices of his profession, these incessant and for the most part trifling alterations can only be explained by the venal spirit of a prince who sold without shame his judgments and his laws. Monarchs seldom condescend to become the preceptors of their subjects, and some praise is due to Justinian, by whose command an ample system was reduced to a short and elementary treatise. Among the various institutes of the Roman law, those of Caius were the most popular in the East and West, and their use may be considered as an evidence of their merit. They were selected by the imperial delegates Tribonian, Theophilus, and Dorotheus, and the freedom and purity of the Antonines were encrusted with the coarser materials of a degenerate age. The same volume which introduced the youth of Rome, Constantinople, and Berytus to the gradual study of the Code and Pandacts is still precious to the historian, the philosopher, and the magistrate. The Institutes of Justinian are divided into four books. They proceed, with no contemptible method, from one, persons, to two, things, and from things to three, actions, and the Article 4 of private wrongs is terminated by the principles of criminal law. End of section 13Section 14 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Publication of the Justinian Code, A.D. 529 to 534 by Edward Gibbon, Part 2. 1. The distinction of ranks and persons is the firmest basis of a mixed and limited government. The perfect equality of men is the point in which the extremes of democracy and despotism are confounded, since the majesty of the prince or people would be offended if any heads were exalted above the level of their fellow slaves or fellow citizens. In the decline of the Roman Empire, the proud distinctions of the Republic were gradually abolished, and the reason or instinct of Justinian completed the simple form of an absolute monarchy. The Emperor could not eradicate the popular reverence which always waits on the possession of hereditary wealth or the memory of famous ancestors. He delighted to honor with titles and emoluments his generals, magistrates, and senators and his precarious indulgence communicated some rays of their glory to the persons of their wives and children. But in the eye of the law, all Roman citizens were equal, and all subjects of the empire were citizens of Rome. That inestimable character was degraded to an obsolete and empty name. The voice of a Roman could no longer enact his laws or create the annual ministers of his power. His constitutional rights might have checked the arbitrary will of a master, 
and the bold adventurer from Germany or Arabia was admitted with equal favor to the civil and military command which the citizen alone had been once entitled to assume over the conquests of his fathers. The first Caesars had scrupulously guarded the distinction of ingenuous and servile birth, which was decided by the condition of the mother. And the candor of the laws was satisfied if her freedom could be ascertained during a single moment between the conception and the delivery. The slaves who were liberated by a generous master immediately entered into the middle class of libertines or freedmen, but they could never be enfranchised from the duties of obedience and gratitude. Whatever were the fruits of their industry, their patron and his family inherited the third part or even the whole of their fortune if they died without children and without a testament. Justinian respected the rights of patrons, but his indulgence removed the badge of disgrace from the two inferior orders of freedmen. Whoever ceased to be a slave obtained without reserve or delay the station of a citizen. And at length the dignity of an ingenious birth, which nature had refused, was created or supposed by the omnipotence of the emperor. Whatever restraints of age or forms or numbers had been formerly introduced to check the abuse of manumissions and the too rapid increase of vile and indigent Romans, he finally abolished, and the spirit of his laws promoted the extinction of domestic servitude. Yet the eastern provinces were filled in the time of Justinian with multitudes of slaves either born or purchased for the use of their masters, and the price from ten to seventy pieces of gold was determined by their age, their strength, and their education. But the hardships of this dependent state were continually diminished by the influence of government and religion, and the pride of a subject was no longer elated by his absolute dominion over the life and happiness of his bondsman. The law of nature instructs most animals to cherish and educate their infant progeny. The law of reason inculcates to the human species the return of filial piety. But the exclusive, absolute and perpetual dominion of the father over his children is peculiar to the Roman jurisprudence and seems to be coeval with the foundation of the city. The paternal power was instituted or confirmed by Romulus himself and after the practice of three centuries, it was inscribed on the fourth table of the Decembers. In the Forum, the Senate, or the Camp, the adult son of a Roman citizen enjoyed the public and private rights of a person. In his father's house he was a mere thing, confounded by the laws with the movables, the cattle and the slaves, whom the capricious master might alienate or destroy without being responsible to any earthly tribunal. The hand which bestowed the daily sustenance might resume the voluntary gift, and whatever was acquired by the labor or fortune of the son was immediately lost in the property of the father. His stolen goods, his oxen or his children, might be recovered by the same action of theft, and if either had been guilty of a trespass, it was in his own option to compensate the damage or resign to the injured party the obnoxious animal. At the call of indigence or avarice, the master of a family could dispose of his children or his slaves. But the condition of the slave was far more advantageous, since he regained by the first manumission his alienated freedom. The son was again restored to his unnatural father. He might be condemned to servitude a second and a third time, and it was not till the third sale and deliverance that he was enfranchised from the domestic power which had been so repeatedly abused. According to his discretion, a father might chastise the real or imaginary faults of his children by stripes, by imprisonment, by exile, by sending them to the country to work in chains among the meanest of his servants. The majesty of a parent was armed with the power of life and death, and the examples of such bloody executions, which were sometimes praised and never punished, may be traced in the annals of Rome beyond the times of Pompey and Augustus. Neither age, nor rank, 
nor the consular office, nor the honors of a triumph, could exempt the most illustrious citizen from the bonds of filial subjection. His own descendants were included in the family of their common ancestor, and the claims of adoption were not less sacred or less rigorous than those of nature. Without fear, though not without danger of abuse, the Roman legislators had reposed an unbounded confidence in the sentiments of paternal love, and the oppression was tempered by the assurance that each generation must succeed in its turn to the awful dignity of parent and master. The first limitation of paternal power is ascribed to the justice and humanity of Numa, and the maid who with his father's consent had espoused a free man was protected from the disgrace of becoming the wife of a slave. In the first ages, when the city was pressed and often famished by her Latin and Tuscan neighbors, the sale of children might be a frequent practice. But as a Roman could not legally purchase the liberty of his fellow citizen, the market must gradually fail, and the trade would be destroyed by the conquests of the Republic. An imperfect right of property was at length communicated to sons, and the threefold distinction of profectitious, adventitious, and professional was ascertained by the jurisprudence of the Code and Pandects. Of all that proceeded from the father, he imparted only the use, and reserved the absolute dominion. Yet if his goods were sold, the filial portion was accepted by a favorable interpretation from the demands of the creditors. In whatever accrued by marriage, gift, or collateral succession, the property was secured to the son. But the father, unless he had been specially excluded, enjoyed the usufruct during his life. As a just and prudent reward of military virtue, the spoils of the enemy were acquired, possessed, and bequeathed by the soldier alone. And the fair analogy was extended to the emoluments of any liberal profession, the salary of public service, and the sacred liberality of the emperor or empress. The life of a citizen was less exposed than his fortune to the abuse of paternal power. Yet his life might be adverse to the interest or passions of an unworthy father. The same crimes that flowed from the corruption were more sensibly felt by the humanity of the Augustan age, and the cruel Erixo, who whipped his son till he expired, was saved by the emperor from the just fury of the multitude. The Roman father, from the license of servile dominion, was reduced to the gravity and moderation of a judge. The presence and opinion of Augustus confirmed the sentence of exile pronounced against an intentional parricide by the domestic tribunal of Arius. Adrian transported to an island the jealous parent who, like a robber, had seized the opportunity of hunting to assassinate a youth, the incestuous lover of his stepmother. A private jurisdiction is repugnant to the spirit of monarchy. The parent was again reduced from a judge to an accuser, and the magistrates were enjoined by Severus Alexander to hear his complaints and execute his sentence. He could no longer take the life of a son without incurring the guilt and punishment of murder, and the pains of parricide, from which he had been accepted by the Pompeian law, were finally inflicted by the justice of Constantine. The same protection was due to every period of existence, and reason must applaud the humanity of Paulus for imputing the crime of murder to the father who strangles or starves or abandons his newborn infant, or exposes him in a public place to find mercy which he himself had denied. But the exposition of children was the prevailing and stubborn vice of antiquity. It was sometimes prescribed, often permitted, almost always practiced with impunity by the nations who never entertained the Roman ideas of paternal power. And the dramatic poets who appeal to the human heart represent with indifference a popular custom which was palliated by the motives of economy and compassion. If the father could subdue his own feelings, he might escape, though not the censure, at least the chastisement of the laws and the Roman Empire was stained with the blood of infants 
till such murders were included by Valentinian and his colleagues in the letter and spirit of the Cornelian Law. The lessons of jurisprudence and Christianity had been insufficient to eradicate this inhuman practice till their gentle influence was fortified by the terrors of capital punishment. Experience has proved that savage are the tyrants of the female sex and that the condition of women is usually softened by the refinements of social life. In the hope of a robust progeny, Lycurgus had delayed the season of marriage. It was fixed by Numa at the tender age of twelve years, and the Roman husband might educate to his will a pure and obedient virgin. According to the custom of antiquity, he bought his bride of her parents, and she fulfilled the coemption by purchasing with three pieces of copper a just introduction to his house and household deities. A sacrifice of fruits was offered by the pontiffs in the presence of ten witnesses. The contracting parties were seated on the same sheepskin, they tasted a salt cake of far or rice, and this confariation which denoted the ancient food of Italy, served as an emblem of their mystic union of mind and body. But this union on the side of the woman was rigorous and unequal, and she renounced the name and worship of her father's house to embrace a new servitude, decorated only by the title of adoption. A fiction of the law, neither rational nor elegant, bestowed on the mother of a family her proper appellation, the strange characters of sister to her own children and of daughter to her husband or master who was invested with the plenitude of paternal power. By his judgment or caprice, her behavior was approved or censured or chastised. He exercised the jurisdiction of life and death, and it was allowed that in the cases of adultery or drunkenness the sentence might be properly inflicted. She acquired and inherited for the sole profit of her lord, and so clearly was woman defined not as a person but as a thing, that if the original title was deficient, she might be claimed like other movables by the use and possession of an entire year. The inclination of the Roman husband discharged or withheld the conjugal debt so scrupulously exacted by the Athenian and Jewish laws, but as polygamy was unknown, he could never admit to his bed a fairer or more favored partner. After the Punic triumphs, the matrons of Rome aspired to the common benefits of a free and opulent republic. Their wishes were gratified by the indulgence of fathers and lovers, and their ambition was unsuccessfully resisted by the gravity of Cato the censor. They declined the solemnities of the old nuptials, defeated the annual prescription by an absence of three days, and without losing their name or independence, subscribed the liberal and definite terms of a marriage contract. Of their private fortunes they communicated the use and secured the property. The estates of a wife could neither be alienated nor mortgaged by a prodigal husband. Their mutual gifts were prohibited by the jealousy of the laws and the misconduct of either party might afford under another name a future subject for an action of theft. To this loose and voluntary compact, religious and civil rights were no longer essential, and between persons of similar rank, the apparent community of life was allowed as sufficient evidence of their nuptials. The dignity of marriage was restored by the Christians, who derived all spiritual grace from the prayers of the faithful and the benediction of the priest or bishop. The origin, validity and duties of the holy institution were regulated by the tradition of the synagogue, the precepts of the gospel and the canons of general and provincial synods. And the conscience of the Christians was awed by the decrees and censures of their ecclesiastical rulers. Yet the magistrates of Justinian were not subject to the authority of the Church. The Emperor consulted the unbelieving civilians of antiquity, and the choice of matrimonial laws in the Code and Pandects is directed by the earthly motives of justice, policy, and the natural freedom of both sexes. 
Besides the agreement of the parties, the essence of every rational contract, the Roman marriage required the previous approbation of the parents. A father might be forced by some recent laws to supply the wants of a mature daughter, but even his insanity was not generally allowed to supersede the necessity of his consent. The causes of the dissolution of matrimony have varied among the Romans, but the most solemn sacrament, the confariation itself, might always be done away by rites of a contrary tendency. In the first ages the father of a family might sell his children, and his wife was reckoned in the number of his children. The domestic judge might pronounce the death of the offender, or his mercy might expel her from his bed and house. But the slavery of the wretched female was hopeless and perpetual, unless he asserted for his own convenience the manly prerogative of divorce. The warmest applause has been lavished on the virtue of the Romans who abstained from the exercise of this tempting privilege above 500 years. But the same fact evinces the unequal terms of a connection in which the slave was unable to renounce her tyrant and the tyrant was unwilling to relinquish his slave. When Roman matrons became the equal and voluntary companions of their lords, a new jurisprudence was introduced that marriage, like other partnerships, might be dissolved by the abdication of one of the associates. In three centuries of prosperity and corruption, this principle was enlarged to frequent practice and pernicious abuse. Passion, interest or caprice suggested daily motives for the dissolution of marriage. A word, a sign, a message, a letter, the mandate of a freedman declared the separation. The most tender of human connections was degraded to a transient society of profit or pleasure. According to the various conditions of life, both sexes alternately felt the disgrace and injury. An inconstant spouse transferred her wealth to a new family, abandoning a numerous, perhaps a spurious, progeny to the paternal authority and care of her late husband. A beautiful virgin might be dismissed to the world old, indigent and friendless. But the reluctance of the Romans, when they were pressed to marriage by Augustus, sufficiently marks that the prevailing institutions were least favorable to the males. A specious theory is confuted by this free and perfect experiment, which demonstrates that the liberty of divorce does not contribute to happiness and virtue. The facility of separation would destroy all mutual confidence and inflame every trifling dispute. The minute difference between a husband and a stranger, which might so easily be removed, might still more easily be forgotten. And the matron, who in five years can submit to the embraces of eight husbands, must cease to reverence the chastity of her own person. Insufficient remedies followed with distant and tardy steps the rapid progress of the evil. The ancient worship of the Romans afforded a peculiar goddess to hear and reconcile the complaints of a married life. But her epithet of Viri Placa, the appeaser of husbands, too clearly indicates on which side submission and repentance were always expected. Every act of a citizen was subject to judgment of the censors. The first who used the privilege of divorce assigned at their command the motives of his conduct, and a senator was expelled for dismissing his virgin spouse without the knowledge or advice of his friends. Whenever an action was instituted for the recovery of a marriage portion, the praetor, as the guardian of equity, examined the cause and the characters and gently inclined the scale in favor of the guiltless and injured party. Augustus, who united the powers of both magistrates, adopted their different modes of repressing or chastising the license of divorce. The presence of seven Roman witnesses was required for the validity of the solemn and deliberate act. If any adequate provocation had been given by the husband, instead of the delay of two years, he was compelled to refund immediately or in the space of six months. But if he could arraign the manners of his wife, her guilt or levity was expiated by the loss of the sixth or eighth part of her marriage portion.
The Christian princes were the first who specified the just causes of a private divorce. Their institutions, from Constantine to Justinian, appear to fluctuate between the custom of the empire and the wishes of the church, and the author of the novels too frequently reforms the jurisprudence of the Code and Pandects. In the most rigorous laws, a wife was condemned to support a gamester, a drunkard, or a libertine, unless he were guilty of homicide, poison, or sacrilege, in which cases the marriage, as it should seem, might have been dissolved by the hand of the executioner. But the sacred right of the husband was invariably maintained to deliver his name and family from the disgrace of adultery. The list of mortal sins, either male or female, was curtailed and enlarged by successive regulations, and the obstacles of incurable impotence, long absence and monastic profession were allowed to rescind the matrimonial obligation. Whoever transgressed the permission of the law was subject to various and heavy penalties. The woman was stripped of her wealth and ornaments without accepting the botkin of her hair. If the man introduced a new bride into his bed, her fortune might be lawfully seized by the vengeance of his exiled wife. Forfeiture was sometimes commuted to a fine. The fine was sometimes aggravated by transportation to an island or imprisonment in a monastery. The injured party was released from the bonds of marriage, but the offender, during life or a term of years, was disabled from the repetition of nuptials. The successor of Justinian yielded to the prayers of his unhappy subjects and restored the liberty of divorce by mutual consent. The civilians were unanimous, the theologians were divided, and the ambiguous word which contains the precept of Christ is flexible to any interpretation that the wisdom of a legislator can demand. The freedom of love and marriage was restrained among the Romans by natural and civil impediments. An instinct, almost innate and universal, appears to prohibit the incestuous commerce of parents and children in the infinite series of ascending and descending generations. Concerning the oblique and collateral branches, nature is indifferent reason mute, and custom various and arbitrary. In Egypt, the marriage of brothers and sisters was admitted without scruple or exception. A Spartan might espouse the daughter of his father, an Athenian that of his mother, and the nuptials of an uncle with his niece were applauded at Athens as a happy union of the dearest relations. The profane lawgivers of Rome were never tempted by interest or superstition to multiply the forbidden degrees, but they inflexibly condemned the marriage of sisters and brothers, hesitated whether first cousins should be touched by the same interdict, revered the parental character of aunts and uncles, and treated affinity and adoption as a just imitation of the ties of blood. According to the proud maxims of the Republic, a legal marriage could only be contracted by free citizens. An honorable, at least an ingenious birth, was required for the spouse of a senator. But the blood of kings could never mingle in legitimate nuptials with the blood of a Roman. And the name of stranger degraded Cleopatra and Berenice to lift the concubines of Mark Anthony and Titus. This appellation, indeed so injurious to the majesty, cannot without indulgence be applied to the manners of these oriental queens. A concubine, in the strict sense of the civilian, was a woman of servile or plebeian extraction, the sole and faithful companion of a Roman citizen, who continued in a state of celibacy. Her modest station, below the honors of a wife, above the infamy of a prostitute, was acknowledged and approved by the laws. From the age of Augustus to the 10th century, the use of the secondary marriage prevailed both in the West and East and the humble virtues of a concubine were often preferred to the pomp and insolence of a noble matron. In this connection, the two Antonines, the best of princes and of men, enjoyed the comforts of domestic love. The example was imitated by many citizens impatient of celibacy, but regardful of their families. If at any time they desired to legitimate their natural children, the conversion was instantly performed by the celebration of their nuptials 
with a partner whose fruitfulness and fidelity they had already tried. By this epithet of natural, the offspring of the concubine were distinguished from the spurious brood of adultery, prostitution and incest, to whom Justinian reluctantly grants the necessary elements of life. And these natural children alone were capable of succeeding to a sixth part of the inheritance of their reputed father. According to the rigor of law, bastards were entitled to the name and condition of their mother, from whom they might derive the character of a slave, a stranger or a citizen. The outcasts of every family were adopted without reproach as the children of the state. The relation of guardian and ward, or in Roman words, of tutor and pupil, which covers so many titles of the institutes and pandects, is of a very simple and uniform nature. The person and property of an orphan must always be trusted to the custody of some discreet friend. If the deceased father had not signified his choice, the agnates or paternal kindred of the nearest degree were compelled to act as the natural guardians. The Athenians were apprehensive of exposing the infant to the power of those most interested in his death, but an axiom of Roman jurisprudence has pronounced that the charge of tutelage should constantly attend the emolument of succession. If the choice of the father and the line of consanguinity afforded no efficient guardian, the failure was supplied by the nomination of the praetor of the city or the president of the province. But the person whom they named to this public office might be legally excused by insanity or blindness, by ignorance or inability, by previous enmity or adverse interest, by the number of children or guardianships with which he was already burdened, and by the immunities which were granted to the useful labors of magistrates, lawyers, physicians and professors. Till the infant could speak and think, he was represented by the tutor whose authority was finally determined by the age of puberty. Without his consent, no act of the pupil could bind himself to his own prejudice, though it might oblige others for his personal benefit. It is needless to observe that the tutor often gave security and always rendered an account, and that the want of diligence or integrity exposed him to a civil and almost criminal action for the violation of his sacred trust. The age of puberty had been rashly fixed by the civilians at fourteen, but as the faculties of the mind ripened more slowly than those of the body, a curator was interposed to guard the fortunes of a Roman youth from his own inexperience and headstrong passions. Such a trustee had been first instituted by the praetor to save a family from the blind havoc of a prodigal or madman, and the minor was compelled by the laws to solicit the same protection, to give validity to his acts till he accomplished the full period of twenty-five years. Women were condemned to the perpetual tutelage of parents, husbands or guardians. A sex created to please and obey was never supposed to have attained the age of reason and experience. Such at least was the stern and haughty spirit of the law which had been insensibly mollified before the time of Justinian. End of section 14。section 15 of the great events by famous historians, volume 4。this is a librivox recording. all librivox recordings are in the public domain. for more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4 Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd Publication of the Justinian Code, A.D. 529-534 to By Edward Gibbon, Part 3 2. The original right of property can only be justified by the accident or merit of prior occupancy and on this foundation it is wisely established by the philosophy of the civilians. The savage who hollows a tree, inserts a sharp stone into a wooden handle, or applies a string to an elastic branch, becomes in a state of nature the just proprietor of the canoe, the bow, or the hatchet. The materials were common to all. 
the new form, the produce of his time and simple industry, belong solely to himself. His hungry brethren cannot, without a sense of their own injustice, extort from the hunter the game of the forest overtaken or slain by his personal strength and dexterity. If his provident care preserves and multiplies the tame animals whose nature is tractable to the arts of education, he acquires a perpetual title to the use and service of their numerous progeny, which derives its existence from him alone. If he encloses and cultivates a field for their sustenance and his own, a barren waste is converted into a fertile soil. The seed, the manure, the labor create a new value and the rewards of harvest are painfully earned by the fatigues of the revolving year. In the successive states of society, the hunter, the shepherd, the husbandman may defend their possessions by two reasons which forcibly appeal to the feelings of the human mind. That whatever they enjoy is the fruit of their own industry, and that every man who envies their felicity may purchase similar acquisitions by the exercise of similar diligence. Such in truth may be the freedom and plenty of a small colony cast on a fruitful island. But the colony multiplies, while the space still continues the same. The common rights, the equal inheritance of mankind, are engrossed by the bold and crafty. Each field and forest is circumscribed by the landmarks of a jealous master. And it is the peculiar praise of the Roman jurisprudence that it asserts the claim of the first occupant to the wild animals of the earth, the air and the waters. In the progress from primitive equity to final injustice, the steps are silent, the shades are almost imperceptible, and the absolute monopoly is guarded by positive laws and artificial reason. The active, insatiable principle of self-love can alone supply the arts of life and the wages of industry. But as soon as civil government and exclusive property have been introduced, they become necessary to the existence of the human race. Except in the singular institutions of Sparta, the wisest legislators have disapproved an agrarian law as a false and dangerous innovation. Among the Romans, the enormous disproportion of wealth surmounted the ideal restraints of a doubtful tradition and an obsolete statute. A tradition that the poorest follower of Romulus had been endowed with the perpetual inheritance of two yugera. A statute which confined the richest citizen to the measure of 500 yugera, or 312 acres of land. The original territory of Rome consisted only of some miles of wood and meadow along the banks of the Tiber, and domestic exchange could add nothing to the national stock. But the goods of an alien or enemy were lawfully exposed to the first hostile occupier. The city was enriched by the profitable trade of war and the blood of her sons was the only price that was paid for the Volsian sheep, the slaves of Britain, and the gems and gold of Asiatic kingdoms. In the language of ancient jurisprudence, which was corrupted and forgotten before the age of Justinian, these spoils were distinguished by the name of Mancaps, or Mancipium, taken with the hand, and whenever they were sold or emancipated, the purchaser required some assurance that they had been the property of an enemy and not of a fellow citizen. A citizen could only forfeit his rights by apparent dereliction, and such dereliction of a valuable interest could not easily be presumed. Yet, according to the Twelve Tables, a prescription of one year for movables and of two years for immovables abolished the claim of the ancient master if the actual possessor had acquired them by a fair transaction from the person whom he believed to be the lawful proprietor. Such conscientious injustice, without any mixture of fraud or force, could seldom injure the members of a small republic. But the various periods of three, of ten, or of twenty years, determined by Justinian, are more suitable to the latitude of a great empire. It is only in the term of prescription that the distinction of real and personal fortune has been remarked by the civilians, and their general idea of property is that of simple, uniform and absolute dominion. 
the subordinate exceptions of use, of usufruct, of servitudes, imposed for the benefit of a neighbor on lands and houses, are abundantly explained by the professors of jurisprudence. The claims of property, as far as they are altered by the mixture, the division or the transformation of substances, are investigated with metaphysical subtlety by the same civilians. The personal title of the first proprietor must be determined by his death, but the possession, without any appearance of change, is peaceably continued in his children, the associates of his toil and the partners of his wealth. The natural inheritance has been protected by the legislators of every climate and age, and the father is encouraged to persevere in slow and distant improvements by the tender hope that a long posterity will enjoy the fruits of his labor. The principle of hereditary succession is universal, but the order has been variously established by convenience or caprice, by the spirit of national institutions, or by some partial example which was originally decided by fraud or violence. The jurisprudence of the Romans appears to have deviated from the equality of nature much less than the Jewish, the Athenian, or the English institutions. On the death of a citizen, all his descendants, unless they were already freed from his paternal power, were called to the inheritance of his possessions. The insolent prerogative of primogeniture was unknown. The two sexes were placed on a just level. All the sons and daughters were entitled to an equal portion of the patrimonial estate. And if any of the sons had been intercepted by a premature death, his person was represented and his share was divided by his surviving children. On the failure of the direct line, the right of succession must diverge to the collateral branches. The degrees of kindred are numbered by the civilians, ascending from the last possessor to a common parent, and descending from the common parent to their next heir. My father stands in the first degree, my brother in the second, his children in the third, and the remainder of the series may be conceived by fancy or pictured in a genealogical table. In this computation a distinction was made essential to the laws and even the constitution of Rome. The agnats, or persons connected by a line of males, were called as they stood in the nearest degree to an equal partition. But a female was incapable of transmitting any legal claims, and the cognats of every rank, without accepting the dear relation of a mother and son, were disinherited by the twelve tables as strangers and aliens. Among the Romans, a gens, or lineage, was united by a common name and domestic rights. The various cognomens or surnames of Scipio or Marcellus distinguished from each other the subordinate branches or families of the Cornelian or Claudian race. The default of the agnates of the same surname was supplied by the larger denomination of Gentiles, and the vigilance of the laws maintained in the same name the perpetual descent of religion and property. A similar principle dictated the Voconian law, which abolished the right of female inheritance. As long as virgins were given or sold in marriage, the adoption of the wife extinguished the hopes of the daughter. But the equal succession of independent matrons supported their pride and luxury, and might transport into a foreign house the riches of their fathers. While the maxims of Cato were revered, they tended to perpetuate in each family a just and virtuous mediocrity, till female blandishments insensibly triumphed and every salutary restraint was lost in the dissolute greatness of the Republic. The rigor of the decamvirs was tempered by the equity of the praetors. Their edicts restored and emancipated posthumous children to the rights of nature, and upon the failure of the agnats they preferred the blood of the cognats to the name of the Gentiles, whose title and character were insensibly covered with oblivion. The reciprocal inheritance of mothers and sons was established in the Tertullian and Orphician decrees by the humanity of the Senate. A new and more impartial order was introduced by the novels of Justinian, who affected to revive the jurisprudence of the Twelve Tables. The lines of masculine and female kindred were confounded.
the descending, ascending and collateral series were accurately defined. To each degree, according to the proximity of blood and affection, succeeded the vacant possessions of a Roman citizen. The order of succession is regulated by nature, or at least by the general and permanent reason of the lawgiver. But this order is frequently violated by the arbitrary and partial wills, which prolong the dominion of the testator beyond the grave. In the simple state of society, this last use or abuse of the right of property is seldom indulged. It was introduced at Athens by the laws of Solon, and the private testaments of a father of a family are authorized by the Twelve Tables. Before the time of the Decambiers, a Roman citizen exposed his wishes and motives to the assembly of the Thirty Curiae, or parishes, and the general law of inheritance was suspended by an occasional act of the legislature. After the permission of the Decambiers, each private lawgiver promulgated his verbal or written testament in the presence of five citizens, who represented the five classes of the Roman people. A sixth witness attested their concurrence. A seventh weighed the copper money, which was paid by an imaginary purchaser, and the estate was emancipated by a fictitious sale and immediate release. This singular ceremony, which excited the wonder of the Greeks, was still practiced in the age of Severus, but the praetor had already approved a more simple testament, for which they required the seals and signatures of seven witnesses, free from all legal exception and purposely summoned for the execution of that important act. A domestic monarch, who reigned over the lives and fortunes of his children, might distribute their respective shares according to the degrees of their merit or his affection. His arbitrary displeasure chastised an unworthy son by the loss of his inheritance and the mortifying preference of a stranger. But the experience of unnatural parents recommended some limitations of their testamentary powers. A son, or by the laws of Justinian, even a daughter, could no longer be disinherited by their silence. They were compelled to name the criminal and to specify the offense. And the justice of the emperor enumerated the sole causes that could justify such a violation of the first principles of nature and society. Unless a legitimate portion of fourth part had been reserved for the children, they were entitled to institute an action or complaint of inefficious testament, to suppose that their father's understanding was impaired by sickness or age, and respectfully to appeal from his rigorous sentence to the deliberate wisdom of the magistrate. In the Roman jurisprudence, an essential distinction was admitted between the inheritance and legacies. The heirs who succeeded to the entire unity or to any of the twelve fractions of the substance of the testator represented his civil and religious character, asserted his rights, fulfilled his obligations, and discharged the gifts of friendship or liberality, which his last will had bequeathed under the name of legacies. But as the imprudence or prodigality of a dying man might exhaust the inheritance and leave only risk and labor to his successor, he was empowered to retain the Falcidian portion, to deduct before the payment of the legacies a clear fourth for his own emolument. A reasonable time was allowed to examine the proportion between the debts and the estate, to decide whether he should accept or refuse the testament. And if he used the benefit of an inventory, the demands of the creditors could not exceed the valuation of the effects. The last will of a citizen might be altered during his life or rescinded after his death. The persons whom he named might die before him, or reject the inheritance, or be exposed to some legal disqualification. In the contemplation of these events, he was permitted to substitute second and third heirs, to replace each other according to the order of the testament, and the incapacity of a madman or an infant to bequeath his property might be supplied by a similar substitution. But the power of the testator expired with the acceptance of the testament. Each Roman of mature age and discretion acquired the absolute dominion of his inheritance, and the simplicity of the civil law 
was never clouded by the long and intricate entails which can find the happiness and freedom of unborn generations. Conquest and the formalities of law established the use of codicils. If a Roman was surprised by death in a remote province of the empire, he addressed a short epistle to his legitimate or testamentary heir, who fulfilled with honor or neglected with impunity this last request, which the judges before the age of Augustus were not authorized to enforce. A codicil might be expressed in any mode or in any language, but the subscription of five witnesses must declare that it was the genuine composition of the author. His intention, however laudable, was sometimes illegal. The invention of fidei commissa, or trusts, arose from the struggle between natural justice and positive jurisprudence. A stranger of Greece or Africa might be the friend or benefactor of a childless Roman, but none except a fellow citizen could act as his heir. The Volconian law, which abolished female succession, restrained the legacy or inheritance of a woman to the sum of 100,000 sesterces, and an only daughter was condemned almost as an alien in her father's house. The zeal of friendship and parental affection suggested a liberal artifice. A qualified citizen was named in the testament, with a prayer or injunction that he would restore the inheritance to the person for whom it was truly intended. Various was the conduct of the trustees in this painful situation. They had sworn to observe the laws of their country, but honor prompted them to violate their oath, and if they preferred their interest under the mask of patriotism, they forfeited the esteem of every virtuous mind. The declaration of Augustus relieved their doubts, gave a legal sanction to confidential testaments and codicils, and gently unraveled the forms and restraints of the republican jurisprudence. But as the new practice of trusts degenerated into some abuse, the trustee was enabled by the Tribellian and Pegasian decrees to reserve one-fourth of the estate or to transfer on the head of the real heir all the debts and actions of the succession. The interpretation of testaments was strict and literal, but the language of trusts and codicils was delivered from the minute and technical accuracy of the civilians. 3. The general duties of mankind are imposed by their public and private relations, but their specific obligations to each other can only be the effect of 1. a promise, 2. a benefit, or 3. an injury. And when these obligations are ratified by law, the interested party may compel the performance by a judicial action. On this principle, the civilians of every country have erected a similar jurisprudence, the fair conclusion of universal reason and justice. Category 1. The goddess of faith, of human and social faith, was worshipped not only in her temples, but in the lives of the Romans. And if that nation was deficient in the more amiable qualities of benevolence and generosity, they astonished the Greeks by their sincere and simple performance of the most burdensome engagements. Yet among the same people, according to the rigid maxims of the patricians and the decamvirs, a naked pact, a promise, or even an oath did not create any civil obligation unless it was confirmed by the legal form of a stipulation. Whatever might be the etymology of the Latin word, it conveyed the idea of a firm and irrevocable contract, which was always expressed in the mode of a question and answer. Do you promise to pay me 100 pieces of gold? was the solemn interrogation of Seius. I do promise, was the reply of Sempronius. The friends of Sempronius, who answered for his ability and inclination, might be separately sued at the option of Seius and the benefit of partition or order of reciprocal actions insensibly deviated from the strict theory of stipulation. The most cautious and deliberate consent was justly required to sustain the validity of a gratuitous promise, and the citizen who might have obtained a legal security incurred the suspicion of fraud and paid the forfeit of his neglect. But the ingenuity of the civilians 
successfully labored to convert simple engagements into the form of solemn stipulations. The praetors, as the guardians of social faith, admitted every rational evidence of a voluntary and deliberate act, which in their tribunal produced an equitable obligation, and for which they gave an action and a remedy. Category 2. The obligations of the second class, as they were contracted by the delivery of a thing, are marked by the civilians with the epithet of real. A grateful return is due to the author of the benefit, and whoever is entrusted with the property of another has bound himself to the sacred duty of restitution. In the case of a friendly loan, the merit of generosity is on the side of the lender only, in a deposit on the side of the receiver, but in a pledge and the rest of the selfish commerce of ordinary life the benefit is compensated by an equivalent, and the obligation to restore is variously modified by the nature of the transaction. The Latin language very happily expresses the fundamental difference between the commodatum and the mutuum, which our poverty is reduced to confound under the vague and common appellation of a loan. In the former, the borrower was obliged to restore the same individual thing with which he had been accommodated for the temporary supply of his wants. In the latter, it was destined for his use and consumption, and he discharged this mutual engagement by substituting the same specific value according to a just estimation of number, of weight, and of measure. In the contract of sale, the absolute dominion is transferred to the purchaser, and he repays the benefit with an adequate sum of gold or silver the price and universal standard of all earthly possessions. The obligation of another contract, that of location, is of a more complicated kind. Lands or houses, labor or talents, may be hired for a definite term. At the expiration of the time, the thing itself must be restored to the owner, with the additional reward for the beneficial occupation and employment. In these lucrative contracts, to which may be added those of partnership and commissions, the civilians sometimes imagine the delivery of the objects and sometimes presume the consent of the parties. The substantial pledge has been refined into the invisible rights of a mortgage or hypotheca, and the agreement of sale for a certain price imputes from that moment the chances of gain or loss to the account of the purchaser. It may be fairly supposed that every man will obey the dictates of his interest, and if he accepts the benefit, he is obliged to sustain the expense of the transaction. In this boundless subject, the historian will observe the location of land and money, the rent of the one and the interest of the other, as they materially affect the prosperity of agriculture and commerce. The landlord was often obliged to advance the stock and instruments of husbandry, and to content himself with the partition of the fruits. If the feeble tenant was oppressed by accident, contagion, or hostile violence, he claimed a proportionate relief from the equity of the laws. Five years were the customary term, and no solid or costly improvements could be expected from a farmer who at each moment might be ejected by the sale of the estate. Usury, the inveterate grievance of the city, had been discouraged by the Twelve Tables and abolished by the clamors of the people. It was revived by their wants and idleness, tolerated by the discretion of the praetors, and finally determined by the Code of Justinian. Persons of illustrious rank were confined to the moderate profit of 4%. Six was pronounced to be the ordinary and legal standard of interest. Eight was allowed for the convenience of manufacturers and merchants. Twelve was granted to nautical insurance, which the wiser ancients had not attempted to define. But except in this perilous adventure, the practice of exorbitant usury was severely restrained. The most simple interest was condemned by the clergy of the East and West. But the sense of mutual benefit, which had triumphed over the laws of the Republic, had resisted with equal firmness the decrees of the Church and even the prejudices of mankind. Category 3 
nature and society impose the strict obligation of repairing an injury, and the sufferer by private injustice acquires a personal right and a legitimate action. If the property of another be entrusted to our care, the requisite degree of care may rise and fall according to the benefit which we derive from such temporary possession. We are seldom made responsible for inevitable accident, but the consequences of a voluntary fault must always be imputed to the author. A Roman pursued and recovered his stolen goods by a civil action of theft. They might pass through a succession of pure and innocent hands, but nothing less than a prescription of thirty years could extinguish his original claim. They were restored by the sentence of the praetor, and the injury was compensated by double or threefold or even quadruple damages, as the deed had been perpetrated by secret fraud or open rapine, as the robber had been surprised in effect or detected by a subsequent research. The Aquilian law defended the living property of a citizen, his slaves and cattle, from the stroke of malice or negligence. The highest price was allowed that could be ascribed to the domestic animal at any moment of the year preceding his death. A similar latitude of thirty days was granted on the destruction of any other valuable effects. A personal injury is blunted or sharpened by the manners of the times and the sensibility of the individual. The pain or the disgrace of a word or blow cannot easily be appreciated by a pecuniary equivalent. The rude jurisprudence of the Decemvirs had confounded all hasty insults, which did not amount to the fracture of a limb, by condemning the aggressor to the common penalty of twenty-five asses. But the same denomination of money was reduced in three centuries from a pound to the weight of half an ounce, and the insolence of a wealthy Roman indulged himself in the cheap amusement of breaking and satisfying the law of the Twelve Tables. Veracius ran through the streets striking on the face the inoffensive passengers, and his attendant purse-bearer immediately silenced their clamors by the legal tender of twenty-five pieces of copper, about the value of one shilling. The equity of the praetors examined and estimated the distinct merits of each particular complaint. In the adjudication of civil damages, the magistrate assumed the right to consider the various circumstances of time and place, of age and dignity, which may aggravate the shame and sufferings of the injured person. But if he admitted the idea of a fine, a punishment, an example, he invaded the province, though perhaps he supplied the defects of the criminal law. End of section 15Section 16 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 4. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Publication of the Justinian Code. A.D. 529 to 534, by Edward Gibbon, Part 4. 4. The execution of the Alban dictator, who was dismembered by eight horses, is represented by Livy as the first and the last instance of Roman cruelty in the punishment of the most atrocious crimes. But this act of justice, or revenge, was inflicted on a foreign enemy in the heat of victory and at the command of a single man. The Twelve Tables afford a more decisive proof of the national spirit, since they were framed by the wisest of the Senate and accepted by the free voices of the people. Yet these laws, like the statutes of Draco, are written in characters of blood. They approve the inhuman and unequal principle of retaliation, and the forfeit of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a limb for a limb, is rigorously exacted, unless the offender can redeem his pardon by a fine of three hundred pounds of copper. The decamviers 
distributed with much liberality the slighter chastisements of flagellation and servitude, and nine crimes of a very different complexion are adjudged worthy of death. Number 1. Any act of treason against the state or of correspondence with the public enemy. The mode of execution was painful and ignominious. The head of the degenerate Roman was shrouded in a veil, his hands were tied behind his back, and after he had been scourged by the lecture, he was suspended in the midst of the forum on a cross or inauspicious tree. Number 2. Nocturnal meetings in the city, whatever might be the pretense of pleasure or religion or the public good. Number 3. The murder of a citizen, for which the common feelings of mankind demand the blood of the murderer. Poison is still more odious than the sword or dagger, and we are surprised to discover in two flagitious events how early such subtle wickedness has infected the simplicity of the Republic and the chaste virtues of the Roman matrons. The parricide, who violated the duties of nature and gratitude, was cast into the river or the sea enclosed in a sack, and a cock, a viper, a dog, and a monkey were successively added as the most suitable companions. Italy produced no monkeys, but the want could never be felt till the middle of the 6th century first revealed the guilt of a parricide. Number 4. The Malice of an Incendiary After the previous ceremony of whipping, he himself was delivered to the flames. And in this example alone, our reason is tempted to applaud the justice of retaliation. Number 5. Judicial Perjury The corrupt or malicious witness was thrown headlong from the Tarpurian rock to expiate his falsehood, which was rendered still more fatal by the severity of the penal laws and the deficiency of written evidence. Number 6. The corruption of a judge who accepted bribes to pronounce an iniquitous sentence. Number 7. Libels and satires whose rude strains sometimes disturbed the peace of an illiterate city. The author was beaten with clubs, a worthy chastisement, but it is not certain that he was left to expire under the blows of the executioner. Number 8. The nocturnal mischief of damaging or destroying a neighbor's corn. The criminal was suspended as a grateful victim to Ceres, but the Sylvan deities were less implacable, and the extirpation of a more valuable tree was compensated by the more moderate fine of 25 pounds of copper. Number 9. Magical incantations, which had power in the opinion of the Latian shepherds to exhaust the strength of an enemy, to extinguish his life, and to remove from their seeds his deep-rooted plantations. The cruelty of the Twelve Tables against insolvent debtors still remains to be told, and I shall dare to prefer the literal sense of antiquity to the specious refinements of modern criticism. After the judicial proof or confession of the debt, thirty days of grace were allowed before a Roman was delivered into the power of his fellow citizen. In this private prison, twelve ounces of rice were his daily food. He might be bound with a chain of fifteen pounds weight, and his misery was thrice exposed in the marketplace to solicit the compassion of his friends and countrymen. At the expiration of sixty days, the debt was discharged by the loss of liberty or life. The insolvent debtor was either put to death or sold in foreign slavery beyond the Tiber. But if several creditors were alike obstinate and unrelenting, they might legally dismember his body and satiate their revenge by this horrid partition. The advocates of this savage law have insisted that it must strongly operate in deterring idleness and fraud from contracting debts which they were unable to discharge. But experience would dissipate this salutary terror by proving that no creditor could be found to exact this unprofitable penalty of life or limb. As the manners of Rome were insensibly polished, the criminal code of the Decemvirs was abolished by the humanity of accusers, witnesses and judges 
and impunity became the consequence of immoderate rigor. The Portion and Valerian laws prohibited the magistrates from inflicting on a free citizen any capital or even corporal punishment, and the obsolete statutes of blood were artfully, and perhaps truly, ascribed to the spirit not of patrician but of regal tyranny. In the absence of penal laws and the insufficiency of civil actions, the peace and justice of the city were imperfectly maintained by the private jurisdiction of the citizens. The malefactors who replenish our jails are the outcasts of society, and the crimes for which they suffer may be commonly ascribed to ignorance, poverty, and brutal appetite. For the perpetration of similar enormities, a vile plebeian might claim and abuse the sacred character of a member of the Republic. But on the proof or suspicion of guilt, the slave or the stranger was nailed to a cross, and this strict and summary justice might be exercised without restraint over the greatest part of the populace of Rome. Each family contained a domestic tribunal, which was not confined like that of the praetor to the cognizance of external actions. Virtuous principles and habits were inculcated by the discipline of education, and the Roman father was accountable to the state for the manners of his children, since he disposed, without appeal, of their life, their liberty, and their inheritance. In some pressing emergencies, the citizen was authorized to avenge his private or public wrongs. The consent of the Jewish, the Athenian, and the Roman laws approved the slaughter of the nocturnal thief, though in open daylight a robber could not be slain without some previous evidence of danger and complaint. Whoever surprised an adulterer in his nuptial bed might freely exercise his revenge. The most bloody and wanton outrage was excused by the provocation. Nor was it before the reign of Augustus that the husband was reduced to weigh the rank of the offender, or that the parent was condemned to sacrifice his daughter with her guilty seducer. After the expulsion of the kings, the ambitious Roman who should dare to assume their title or imitate their tyranny was devoted to the infernal gods. Each of his fellow citizens was armed with the sword of justice, and the act of Brutus, however repugnant to gratitude or prudence, had been already sanctified by the judgment of his country. The barbarous practice of wearing arms in the midst of peace and the bloody maxims of honor were unknown to the Romans, and during the two purest ages, from the establishment of equal freedom to the end of the Punic Wars, the city was never disturbed by sedition and rarely polluted with atrocious crimes. The failure of penal laws was more sensibly felt when every vice was inflamed by faction at home and dominion abroad. In the time of Cicero, each private citizen enjoyed the privilege of anarchy, each minister of the Republic was exalted to the temptations of regal power, and their virtues are entitled to the warmest praise as the spontaneous fruits of nature or philosophy. After a triennial indulgence of lust, rapine, and cruelty, Varys, the tyrants of Sicily, could only be sued for the pecuniary restitution of 300,000 pounds sterling. And such was the temper of the laws, the judges, and perhaps the accuser himself, that on refunding a thirteenth part of his plunder, Varys could retire to an easy and luxurious exile. The first imperfect attempt to restore the proportion of crimes and punishments was made by the dictator Scylla, who in the midst of his sanguinary triumph aspired to restrain the license rather than to oppress the liberty of the Romans. He gloried in the arbitrary proscription of 4,700 citizens. But in the character of a legislator, he respected the prejudices of the times, and instead of pronouncing a sentence of death against the robber or assassin, the general who betrayed an army or the magistrate who ruined a province, Scylla was content to aggravate the pecuniary damages by the penalty of exile, or in more constitutional language, by the interdiction of fire and water. 
the Carnelian and afterward the Pompeian and Julian laws introduced a new system of criminal jurisprudence, and the emperors from Augustus to Justinian disguised their increasing rigor under the names of the original authors. But the invention and frequent use of extraordinary pains proceeded from the desire to extend and conceal the progress of despotism. In the condemnation of illustrious Romans, the Senate was always prepared to confound, at the will of their masters, the judicial and legislative powers. It was the duty of the governors to maintain the peace of their province by the arbitrary and rigid administration of justice. The freedom of the city evaporated in the extent of empire, and the Spanish malefactor who claimed the privilege of a Roman was elevated by the command of Galba on a fairer and more lofty cross. Occasional rescripts issued from the throne to decide the questions which, by their novelty or importance, appeared to surpass the authority and discernment of a proconsul. Transportation and beheading were reserved for honorable persons. Meaner criminals were either hanged or burned or buried in the mines or exposed to the wild beasts of the amphitheater. Armed robbers were pursued and extirpated as the enemies of society, and driving away of horses or cattle was made a capital offense. But simple theft was uniformly considered as a mere civil and private injury. The degrees of guilt and the modes of punishment were too often determined by the discretion of the rulers and the subject was left in ignorance of the legal danger which he might incur by every action of his life. A sin, a vice, a crime are the objects of theology, ethics and jurisprudence. Whenever their judgments agree, they corroborate each other. But as often as they differ, a prudent legislator appreciates the guilt and punishment according to the measure of social injury. On this principle, the most daring attack on the life and property of a private citizen is judged less atrocious than the crime of treason or rebellion, which invades the majesty of the Republic. The obsequious civilians unanimously pronounced that the Republic is contained in the person of its chief, and the edge of the Julian law was sharpened by the incessant diligence of the emperors. The licentious commerce of the sexes may be tolerated as an impulse of nature, or forbidden as a source of disorder and corruption. But the fame, the fortunes, the family of the husband are seriously injured by the adultery of the wife. The wisdom of Augustus, after curbing the freedom of revenge, applied to this domestic offense the animate version of the laws, and the guilty parties, after the payment of heavy forfeitures and fines, were condemned to long or perpetual exile in two separate islands. Religion pronounces an equal censure against the infidelity of the husband, but as it is not accompanied by the same civil effects, the wife was never permitted to vindicate her wrong. And the distinction of simple or double adultery, so familiar and so important in the canon law, is unknown to the jurisprudence of the Code and the Pandects. I touch with reluctance and dispatch with impatience a more odious vice, of which modesty rejects the name, and nature abominates the idea. The primitive Romans were infected by the examples of the Etruscans and Greeks. In the mad abuse of prosperity and power, every pleasure that is innocent was deemed insipid, and the Scotinian law, which had been extorted by an act of violence, was insensibly abolished by the lapse of time and the multitude of criminals. By this law, the rape, perhaps the seduction, of an ingenuous youth was compensated as a personal injury by the poor damages of ten thousand sesterces, or fourscore pounds. The ravisher might be slain by the resistance or revenge of chastity. And I wish to believe that at Rome, as in Athens, the voluntary and effeminate deserter of his sex was degraded from the honor and the rights of a citizen. But the practice of vice was not discouraged by the severity of opinion. The indelible stain of manhood was confounded with the more venial transgressions of fornication and adultery, 
nor was the licentious lover exposed to the same dishonor which he impressed on the male or female partner of his guilt. From Catullus to Juvenal, the poets accuse and celebrate the degeneracy of the times, and the reformation of manners was feebly attempted by the reason and authority of the civilians, till the most virtuous of the Caesars proscribed the sin against nature as a crime against society. A new spirit of legislation, respectable even in its error, arose in the empire with the religion of Constantine. The laws of Moses were received as the divine original of justice, and the Christian princes adapted their penal statutes to the degrees of moral and religious turpitude. Adultery was first declared to be a capital offense. The frailty of the sexes was assimilated to poison or assassination, to sorcery or parricide. The same penalties were inflicted on the passive and active guilt of pederasty, and all criminals of free or servile condition were either drowned or beheaded, or cast alive into the avenging flames. The adulterers were spared by the common sympathy of mankind, but the lovers of their own sex were pursued by general and pious indignation. The impure manners of Greece still prevailed in the cities of Asia, and every vice was fomented by the celibacy of the monks and clergy. Justinian relaxed the punishment at least of female infidelity. The guilty spouse was only condemned to solitude and penance, and at the end of two years she might be recalled to the arms of a forgiving husband. But the same emperor declared himself the implacable enemy of unmanly lust, and the cruelty of his persecution can scarcely be excused by the purity of his motives. In defiance of every principle of justice, he stretched to past as well as future offenses the operations of his edicts with the previous allowance of a short respite for confession and pardon. A painful death was inflicted by the amputation of the sinful instrument, or the insertion of sharp reeds into the pores and tubes of the most exquisite sensibility, and Justinian defended the propriety of the execution, since the criminals would have lost their hands had they been convicted of sacrilege. In this state of disgrace and agony, two bishops, Isaiah of Rhodes and Alexander of Diospolis, were dragged through the streets of Constantinople, while their brethren were admonished by the voice of a crier to observe this awful lesson and not to pollute the sanctity of their character. Perhaps these prelates were innocent. A sentence of death and infamy was often founded on the slight and suspicious evidence of a child or a servant. The guilt of the green faction of the rich and of the enemies of Theodora was presumed by the judges, and pederasty became the crime of those to whom no crime could be imputed. A French philosopher has dared to remark that whatever is secret must be doubtful, and that our natural horror of vice may be abused as an engine of tyranny. But the favorable persuasion of the same writer that a legislator may confide in the taste and reason of mankind is impeached by the unwelcome discovery of the antiquity and extent of the disease. 5. The free citizens of Athens and Rome enjoyed in all criminal cases the invaluable privilege of being tried by their country. Number 1. The administration of justice is the most ancient office of a prince. It was exercised by the Roman kings and abused by Tarquin, who alone, without law or counsel, pronounced his arbitrary judgments. The first consuls succeeded to this regal prerogative, but the sacred right of appeal soon abolished the jurisdiction of the magistrates, and all public causes were decided by the supreme tribunal of the people. But a wild democracy, superior to the forms, too often disdains the essential principles of justice. The pride of despotism was envenomed by plebeian envy, and the heroes of Athens might sometimes applaud the happiness of the Persian, whose fate depended on the caprice of a single tyrant. 
Some salutary restraints imposed by the people on their own passions were at once the cause and effect of the gravity and temperance of the Romans. The right of accusation was confined to the magistrates. A vote of the 35 tribes could inflict a fine, but the cognizance of all capital crimes was reserved by a fundamental law to the assembly of the centuries, in which the weight of influence and property was sure to preponderate. Repeated proclamations and adjournments were interposed to allow time for prejudice and resentment to subside. The whole proceeding might be annulled by a seasonable omen or the opposition of a tribune, and such popular trials were commonly less formidable to innocence than they were favorable to guilt. But this union of the judicial and legislative powers left it doubtful whether the accused party was pardoned or acquitted, and in the defense of an illustrious client, the orators of Rome and Athens addressed their arguments to the policy and benevolence as well as to the justice of the sovereign. Number 2. The task of convening the citizens for the trial of each offender became more difficult as the citizens and the offenders continually multiplied, and the ready expedient was adopted of delegating the jurisdiction of the people to the ordinary magistrates or to extraordinary inquisitors. In the first ages these questions were rare and occasional. In the beginning of the 7th century of Rome they were made perpetual. Four praetors were annually empowered to sit in judgment on the state offenses of treason, extortion, peculation, and bribery. And Scylla added new praetors and new questions for those crimes which more directly injure the safety of individuals. By these inquisitors the trial was prepared and directed, but they could only pronounce the sentence of the majority of judges. To discharge this important though burdensome office, an annual list of ancient and respectable citizens was formed by the praetor. After many constitutional struggles, they were chosen in equal numbers from the Senate, the Equestrian Order, and the people. 450 were appointed for single questions, and the various roles or decuries of judges must have contained the names of some thousand Romans who represented the judicial authority of the state. In each particular cause, a sufficient number was drawn from the urn. Their integrity was guarded by an oath. The mode of ballot secured their independence. The suspicion of partiality was removed by the mutual challenges of the accuser and defendant, and the judges of Milo, by the retrenchment of fifteen on each side, were reduced to fifty-one voices or tablets of acquittal, of condemnation, or of favorable doubt. Number 3. In his civil jurisdiction, the praetor of the city was truly a judge and almost a legislator, but as soon as he had prescribed the action of law, he often referred to a delegate the determination of the fact. With the increase of legal proceedings, the tribunal of the Centumvirs in which he presided acquired more weight and reputation. But whether he acted alone or with the advice of his counsel, the most absolute powers might be trusted to a magistrate who was annually chosen by the votes of the people. The rules and precautions of freedom have required some explanation. The order of despotism is simple and inanimate. Before the age of Justinian, or perhaps of Diocletian, the decuries of Roman judges had sunk to an empty title. The humble advice of the assessors might be accepted or despised, and in each tribunal the civil and criminal jurisdiction was administered by a single magistrate, who was raised and disgraced by the will of the emperor. A Roman accused of any capital crime might prevent the sentence of the law by voluntary exile or death. Till his guilt had been legally proved, his innocence was presumed and his person was free. Till the votes of the last century had been counted and declared, he might peaceably secede to any of the allied cities of Italy or Greece or Asia. His fame and fortunes were preserved, 
at least to his children by this civil death. And he might still be happy in every rational and sensual enjoyment if a mind accustomed to the ambitious tumult of Rome could support the uniformity and silence of Rhodes or Athens. A bolder effort was required to escape from the tyranny of the Caesars, but this effort was rendered familiar by the maxims of the Stoics, the example of the bravest Romans, and the legal encouragements of suicide. The bodies of condemned criminals were exposed to public ignominy, and their children, a more serious evil, were reduced to poverty by the confiscation of their fortunes. But if the victims of Tiberius and Nero anticipated the decree of the prince or senate, their courage and dispatch were recompensed by the applause of the public, the decent honors of burial, and the validity of their testaments. The exquisite avarice and cruelty of Domitian appears to have deprived the unfortunate of this last consolation, and it was still denied even by the clemency of the Antonines. A voluntary death, which in the case of a capital offense intervened between the accusation and the sentence, was admitted as a confession of guilt, and the spoils of the deceased were seized by the inhuman claims of the treasury. Yet the civilians have always respected the natural right of a citizen to dispose of his life, and the posthumous disgrace invented by Tarquin to check the despair of his subjects was never revived or imitated by succeeding tyrants. The powers of this world have indeed lost their dominion over him who is resolved on death, and his arm can only be restrained by the religious apprehension of a future state. Suicides are enumerated by Virgil among the unfortunate rather than the guilty, and the poetical fables of the infernal shades could not seriously influence the faith or practice of mankind. But the precepts of the gospel or the church have at length imposed a pious servitude on the minds of Christians, and condemned them to expect, without a murmur, the last stroke of disease or the executioner. The penal statutes form a very small proportion of the 62 books of the Code and Pandects, and in all judicial proceedings the life or death of a citizen is determined with less caution or delay than the most ordinary question of covenant or inheritance. This singular distinction, though something may be allowed for the urgent necessity of defending the peace of society, is derived from the nature of criminal and civil jurisprudence. Our duties to the state are simple and uniform. The law by which he is condemned is ascribed not only on brass or marble, but on the conscience of the offender, and his guilt is commonly proved by the testimony of a single fact. But our relations to each other are various and infinite. Our obligations are created, annulled, and modified by injuries, benefits, and promises, and the interpretation of voluntary contracts and testaments which are often dictated by fraud or ignorance, affords a long and laborious exercise to the sagacity of the judge. The business of life is multiplied by the extent of commerce and dominion, and the residence of the parties in the distant provinces of an empire is productive of doubt, delay, and inevitable appeals from the local to the supreme magistrate. Justinian, the Greek emperor of Constantinople and the East, was the legal successor to the Latian shepherd who had planted a colony on the banks of the Tiber. In a period of 1300 years, the laws had reluctantly followed the changes of government and manners, and the laudable desire of conciliating ancient names with recent institutions destroyed the harmony and swelled the magnitude of the obscure and irregular system. The laws which excuse on any occasions the ignorance of their subjects confess their own imperfections. The civil jurisprudence, as it was abridged by Justinian, still continued a mysterious science and a profitable trade, and the innate perplexity of the study was involved in tenfold darkness by the private industry of the practitioners. The expense of the pursuit sometimes exceeded the value of the prize and the fairest rights were abandoned by the poverty or prudence of the claimants. Such costly justice might tend to abate the spirit of litigation, 
but the unequal pressure serves only to increase the influence of the rich and to aggravate the misery of the poor. By these dilatory and expensive proceedings, the wealthy pleader obtains a more certain advantage than he could hope from the accidental corruption of his judge. The experience of an abuse, from which our own age and country are not perfectly exempt, may sometimes provoke a generous indignation and extort the hasty wish of exchanging our elaborate jurisprudence for the simple and summary decrees of a Turkish Qadi. Our calmer reflection will suggest that such forms and delays are necessary to guard the person and property of the citizen, that the discretion of the judge is the first engine of tyranny, and that the laws of free people should foresee and determine every question that may probably arise in the exercise of power and the transactions of industry. But the government of Justinian united the evils of liberty and servitude, and the Romans were oppressed at the same time by the multiplicity of their laws and the arbitrary will of their master. End of section 16